Section 29 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.44 4. Attitude But in Paris, at six in the morning, when some patriot deputy, warned by a billet, awoke Lafayette, and they went to the Tuileries, imagination may paint but words cannot the surprise of lafayette or with what bewilderment helpless gouvion rolled glassy argus's eyes discerning now that his false chambermaid told true however it is to be recorded that paris thanks to an august national assembly did on this seeming doomsday surpass itself never according to historian eye-witnesses was there seen such an imposing attitude sections all in permanence our town hall too having first about ten o'clock fired three solemn alarm cannons above all our national assembly national assembly likewise permanent decides what is needful with unanimous consent for the cote droit sits dumb afraid of the lanterne decides with a calm promptitude which arises towards the sublime one must needs vote for the thing is self-evident that his majesty has been abducted or spirited away enlevé by some person or persons unknown in which case what will the constitution have us do let us return to first principles as we always say revenons au principe by first or by second principles much is promptly decided ministers are sent for instructed how to continue their functions lafayette is examined and gouvion who gives a most helpless account the best he can letters are found written one letter of immense magnitude all in his majesty's hand and evidently of his majesty's own composition addressed to the national assembly it details with earnestness with a childlike simplicity what woes his majesty has suffered woes great and small a necker seen applauded a majesty not then insurrection want of due cash in civil list general want of cash furniture and order anarchy everywhere deficit never yet in the smallest choked or comblé wherefore in brief his majesty has retired towards a place of liberty and leaving sanctions federation and what oaths there may be to shift for themselves does now refer to what thinks an august assembly to that declaration of the twenty third of june with its sul il fera he alone will make his people happy as if that were not buried deep enough under two irrevocable twelve months and the wreck and rubbish of a whole feudal world this strange autograph letter the national assembly decides on printing on transmitting to the eighty-three departments with exegetic commentary short but pithy commissioners also shall go forth on all sides the people be exhorted the armies be increased care taken that the commonweal suffer no damage and now with a sublime air of calmness nay of indifference we pass to the order of the day by such sublime calmness the terror of the people is calmed these gleaming pike forests which bristled fateful in the early sun disappear again the far-sounding street orators cease or spout milder we are to have a civil war let us have it then the king is gone but national assembly but france and we remain the people also takes a great attitude the people also is calm motionless as a couchant lion with but a few brulings some waggings of the tail to show what it will do casales for instance was beset by street groups and cries of lanterne but national patrols easily delivered him likewise all kings effigies and statues at least stucco ones get abolished even kings names the word roi fades suddenly out of all shop signs 
the royal bengal tiger itself on the boulevards becomes the national bengal one tigre national how great is a cam couchant people on the morrow men will say to one another we have no king yet we slept sound enough on the morrow fervent achille de chatelet and thomas paine the rebellious needleman shall have the walls of paris profusely plastered with their placard announcing that there must be a republic need we add that lafayette too though at first menaced by pikes has taken a great attitude or indeed the greatest of all scouts and aides de camp fly forth vague in quest and pursuit young romeuf towards valenciennes though with small hope romeuf thus paris sublimely calmed in its bereavement but from the messagerie royale in all mail-bags radiates forth far darting the electric news our hereditary representative is flown laugh black royalists yet be it in your sleeve only lest patriotism notice and waxing frantic lure the lanterne in paris alone is a sublime national assembly with its calmness truly other places must take it as they can with open mouth and eyes with panic cackling with wrath with conjecture how each one of those dull leathern diligences with its leathern bag and the king is fled furrows up smooth france as it goes through town and hamlet ruffles the smooth public mind into quivering agitation of death terror then lumbers on as if nothing had happened along all highways towards the utmost borders till all france is ruffled roughened up metaphorically speaking into one enormous desperate-minded red guggling turkey cock for example it is under cloud of night that the leathern monster reaches nantes deep sunk in sleep the word spoken rouses all patriot men general de Maurier, enveloped in roqueleur has to descend from his bedroom finds the street covered with four or five thousand citizens in their shirts here and there a faint farthing rushlight hastily kindled and so many swart-featured haggard faces with nightcaps pushed back and the more or less flowing drapery of nightshirt open-mouthed till the general say his word and overhead as always the great bear is turning so quiet round Boatis, steady indifferent as the leathern diligence itself take comfort ye men of nault Boatis and the steady bear are turning ancient atlantic still sends his brine long billowing up your loire stream brandy shall be hot in the stomach this is not the last of the days but one before the last the fools if they knew what was doing in these very instants also by candlelight in the far north-east perhaps we may say the most terrified man in paris or france is who thinks the reader sea green robespierre double paleness with the shadow of gibbets and halters overcasts the sea green features it is too clear to him that there is to be a st bartholomew of patriots that in four-and-twenty hours he will not be in life these horrid anticipations of the soul he is heard uttering at petillon's by a notable witness by madame roland namely her whom we saw last year radiant at the lyon federation these four months the roland have been in paris arranging with assembly committees the municipal affairs of lyon affairs all sunk in debt communing the while as was most natural with the best patriots to be found here with our brissot petillon buzot robespierre who were wont to come to us says the fair hostess four evenings in the week they running about busier than ever this day would fain have comforted the sea-green man spake of achille de chatelet's placard of a journal to be called the republican of preparing men's minds for a republic 
a republic said the sea green with one of his dry husky unsportful laughs what is that o oh, sea green incorruptible thou shalt see end of section twenty nine Section 30 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.45 The New Berlin But scouts all this while, and aides de camp, have flown forth faster than the leathern diligences. Young Rumov, as we said, was off early towards Valenciennes. Distracted villagers seize him as a traitor with a finger of his own in the plot, drag him back to the town hall, to the National Assembly, which speedily grants a new passport. Nay now, that same scarecrow of a herb merchant with his ass has bethought him of the grand new Berlin seen in the wood of Bondy, and delivered evidence of it. Romulf, furnished with new passport, is sent forth with double speed on a hopefuler track, by Bondy, Clay, and Chalon, towards Metz, to track the new Berlin, and gallops a franc étrier. Miserable new Berlin, why could not royalty go in some old Berlin, similar to that of other men? Flying for life, one does not stickle about his vehicle. Monsieur, in a commonplace travelling carriage, is off northwards, Madame, his princess, in another, with variation of route. They cross one another while changing horses without look of recognition, and reach Flanders, no man questioning them. Precisely in the same manner, beautiful Princess de Lamballe set off about the same hour, and will reach England safe. Would she had continued there? The beautiful, the good, but the unfortunate, reserved for a frightful end. All runs along, unmolested, speedy, except only the new Berlin. Huge leathern vehicle, huge argosy, let us say, or Acapulco ship, with its heavy stern boat of chaise and pair, with its three yellow pilot boats of mounted bodyguard couriers rocking aimless round it and ahead of it, to bewilder, not to guide. It lumbers along, lurchingly with stress, at a snail's pace, noted of all the world. The bodyguard couriers, in their yellow liveries, go prancing and clattering, loyal but stupid, unacquainted with all things. Stoppages occur, and breakages to be repaired at Etoge. King Louis, too, will dismount, will walk up hills and enjoy the blessed sunshine with eleven horses and double drink money and all furtherances of nature and art it will be found that royalty flying for life accomplishes sixty-nine miles in twenty-two incessant hours slow royalty and yet not a minute of these hours but is precious on minutes hang the destinies of royalty now Readers, therefore, can judge in what humour Duc de Choiseul might stand waiting in the village of Pont de Sommeville, some leagues beyond Chalon, hour after hour, now when the day bends visibly westward. Choiseul drove out of Paris in all privity ten hours before their Majesty's fixed time. His hussars, led by engineer Gogola, are here duly come to escort a treasure that is expected. But hour after hour is no Baroness de Korff's Berlin. Indeed, over all that north-east region, on the skirts of Champagne and of Lorraine, where the great road runs, the agitation is considerable. For all along, from this Pont de Sommeville, north-eastward as far as Montmédy, at post villages and towns, Escorts of hussars and dragoons do lounge, waiting. A train or chain of military escorts, at the Montmédy end of it, our brave Bouillet, an electric thunder chain, which the invisible Bouillet, like a Father Jove, holds in his hand, for wise purposes. 
Brave Bouillet has done what man could, has spread out his electric thunder chain of military escorts onwards to the threshold of Chalon. It waits but for the new Corf Berlin, to receive it, escort it, and, if need be, bear it off in whirlwind of military fire. They lie and lounge there, we say, these fierce troopers, from Montmédy and Stinney, through Clermont, saint Menehould, to utmost pont de Somerville, in all post villages. For the route shall avoid Verdun and great towns. They loiter impatient till the treasure arrive. Judge what a day this is for brave Bouillet, perhaps the first day of a new glorious life, surely the last day of the old. Also, and indeed still more, what a day, beautiful and terrible, for your young, full-blooded captains, your Don Duin, Comte de Dama, Duc de Choiseul, Engineer Cougla, and the like, entrusted with the secret. Alas, the day bends ever more westward, and no Corf Berlin comes to sight. It is four hours beyond the time, and still no Berlin. In all village streets, royalist captains go lounging, looking often Parisward, with face of unconcern, with heart full of black care. Rigorous quartermasters can hardly keep the private dragoons from cafes and dram shops. Dawn on our bewilderment, thou new Berlin, dawn on us, thou sun chariot of a new Berlin, with the destinies of France. It was of His Majesty's ordering, this military array of escorts, a thing solacing the royal imagination with a look of security and rescue, yet in reality creating only alarm, and where there was otherwise no danger, danger without end. For each patriot in these post villages asks naturally, this clatter of cavalry and marching and lounging of troops, what means it? To escort a treasure? Why escort when no patriot will steal from the nation? Or where is your treasure? There has been such marching and counter-marching, for it is another fatality that certain of these military escorts came out so early as yesterday, the 19th, not the 20th of the month, being the day first appointed, which Her Majesty, for some necessity or other, saw good to alter. And now consider the suspicious nature of patriotism, suspicious above all of Bouillet, the aristocrat, and how the sour doubting humour has had leave to accumulate and exacerbate for four and twenty hours. At Pont de Somerville, these forty foreign hussars of Gogola and Duc Choiseul are becoming an unspeakable mystery to all men. They lounged long enough already at Saint Menehould lounged and loitered till our national volunteers there, all risen into hot wrath of doubt, demanded three hundred fusils of their town hall, and got them. At which same moment, too, as it chanced, our captain Dondouin was just coming in from Clermont with his troop at the other end of the village, a fresh troop alarming enough, though happily they were only dragoons and French so that Gogola, with his hussars, had to ride, and even to do it fast, till here, at Pont de Saint-Belle, where Choiseau lay waiting, he found resting-place, resting-place as on burning marl, for the rumour of him flies abroad, and men run to and fro in fright and anger. Charlon sends forth exploratory pickets, coming from saint Menehould on that... What is it, you whiskered hussars, men of foreign, guttural speech? In the name of heaven, what is it that brings you? A treasure? The exploratory pickets shake their heads. The hungry peasants, however, know too well what treasure it is. Military seizure for rents, feudalities, which no bailiff could make us pay. This they know, and set to jingling their parish bell by way of toxin with rapid effect. Choiseul and Gogola, if the whole country is not to take fire, must needs be their Berlin, be their no Berlin, saddle and ride. They mount, 
and this parish toxin happily ceases they ride slowly eastward towards st menehould still hoping the sun chariot of her berlin may overtake them ah me no berlin and near now is that st menehould which expelled us in the morning with its three hundred national fusils which looks belike not too lovingly on captain d'antoine and his fresh dragoons though only french which in a word one dare not enter the second time under pain of explosion with rather heavy heart our hussar party strikes off to the left through byways through pathless hills and woods they avoiding st menehould and all places which have seen them heretofore will make direct for the distant village of varennes it is probable they will have a rough evening ride this first military post therefore in the long thunder chain has gone off with no effect or with worse and your chain threatens to entangle itself the great road however is got hushed again into a kind of quietude though one of the wakefulest indolent dragoons cannot by any quartermaster be kept altogether from the dram shop where patriots drink and will even treat eager enough for news captains in a state near distraction beat the dusky highway with a face of indifference and no sun chariot appears why lingers it incredible that with eleven horses and such yellow couriers and furtherances its rate should be under the weightiest dray rate some three miles an hour alas one knows not whether it ever even got out of paris and yet also one knows not whether this very moment it is not at the village end one's heart flutters on the verge of unutterabilities End of section 30section thirty one of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point four six old dragoon drouet in this manner however has the day bent downwards wearied mortals are creeping home from their field labour the village artisan eats with relish his supper of herbs or has strolled forth to the village street for a sweet mouthful of air and human news still summer eventide everywhere the great sun hangs flaming on the utmost northwest for it is his longest day this year the hilltops rejoicing will ere long be at their ruddiest and blush good night the thrush in green dells on long shadowed leafy spray pours gushing his glad serenade to the babble of brooks grown audibler silence is stealing over the earth your dusty mill of valmy as all other mills and drudgeries may furl its canvas and cease swashing and circling the swanked grinders in this treadmill of an earth have ground out another day and lounge there as we say in village groups movable or ranked on social stone seats their children, mischievous imps, sporting about their feet. A notable hum of sweet human gossip rises from this village of St. Menehould, as from all other villages. Gossip mostly sweet, unnotable, for the very dragoons are French and gallant. Nor as yet has the Paris and Verdun diligence, with its leathern bag, rumbled in to terrify the minds of men. One figure, nevertheless, we do note at the last door of the village, that figure in loose-flowing nightgown of Jean-Baptiste Drouet, master of the post here, an acrid, choleric man, rather dangerous-looking, still in the prime of life, though he has served, in his time, as a conde dragoon. This day, from an early hour, Drouet got his collar stirred, and has been kept fretting, Hussar Gogola in the morning saw good by way of thrift to bargain with his own innkeeper, not with Drouet, regular maître de poste, 
about some gig horse for the sending back of his gig, which thing Drouet perceiving came over in red ire, menacing the innkeeper, and would not be appeased. Wholly an unsatisfactory day. For Drouet is an acrid patriot too, was at the Paris feast of pikes, and what do these Bouillet soldiers mean? Hussars with their gig and a vengeance to it have hardly been thrust out when Dondouin and his fresh dragoons arrive from Clermont and stroll. For what purpose? Choleric Drouet steps out and steps in with long flowing nightgown, looking abroad with that sharpness of faculty which stirred collar gives to man. On the other hand, Mark Captain Dondouin on the street of that same village, sauntering with a face of indifference, a heart eaten of black care, for no Corf Berlin makes its appearance. The great sun flames broader towards setting, one's heart flutters on the verge of dread unutterabilities. By heaven, here is the yellow bodyguard courier, spurring fast in the ruddy evening light. Steady, old Dondouin, stand with inscrutable indifferent face, though the yellow blockhead spurs past the post-house, inquires to find it, and stirs the village, all delighted with his fine livery. Lumbering along with its mountains of bandboxes and chaise behind, the Corf Berlin rolls in, huge Acapulco ship with its cockboat having got thus far. The eyes of the villagers look enlightened, as such eyes do when a coach transit, which is an event, occurs for them. Strolling dragoons respectfully, so fine are the yellow liveries, bring hand to helmet and a lady in gypsy hat responds with a grace peculiar to her. Dombois stands with folded arms, and what look of indifference and disdainful garrison air a man can, while the heart is like leaping out of him. Curled disdainful mustachio, careless glance, which, however, surveys the village groups and does not like them. With his eye he bespeaks the yellow courier, be quick, be quick! Thick-headed, yellow, cannot understand the eye, comes up mumbling to ask in words, seen of the village. Nor is postmaster Drouet unobservant all this while, but steps out and steps in, with his long flowing nightgown, in the level sunlight, prying into several things. When a man's faculties at the right time are sharpened by collar, it may lead to much. That lady in slouched gypsy hat, though sitting back in the carriage, does she not resemble someone we have seen sometime, at the Feast of Pikes, or elsewhere? And this grosse tête in round hat and peruke, which, looking rearward, pokes itself out from time to time, methinks there are features in it. Quick, Sieur Guillaume, clerk of the Directoire, bring me a new assignat. Drouet scans the new assigna, compares the paper money picture with the gross head in round hat there, by day and night. You might say the one was an attempted engraving of the other. And this march of troops, this sauntering and whispering, I see it. Drouet, postmaster of this village, hot patriot, old dragoon of Condé, consider therefore what thou wilt do, and fast, for behold the new Berlin, expeditiously yoked, cracks whipcord and rolls away. Drouet dare not, on the spur of the instant, clutch the bridles in his own two hands. Dondouin, with broadsword, might hew you off. Our poor nationals, not one of them here, have three hundred fusils, but then no powder. Besides, one is not sure, only morally certain. Drouet, as an adroit old dragoon of Condé, does what is advisablest, privily bespeaks Clerc Guillon, old dragoon of Condé he too. Privily, while Clerc Guillon is saddling two of the fleetest horses, slips over to the town hall to whisper a word, then mounts with Clerc Guillon, and the two bound eastward in pursuit to see what can be done. They bound eastward in sharp trot, 
their moral certainty permeating the village from the town hall outwards in busy whispers alas captain dondois orders his dragoons to mount but they complaining of long fast demand bread and cheese first before which brief repast can be eaten the whole village is permeated not whispering now but blustering and shrieking national volunteers in hurried muster shriek for gunpowder dragoons halt between patriotism and rule of the service between bread and cheese and fixed bayonets dantoin hands secretly his pocket-book with its secret dispatches to the rigorous quartermaster the very ostlers have stable forks and flails the rigorous quartermaster half saddled cuts out his way with the sword's edge amid levelled bayonets amid patriot vociferations adjurations flail strokes and rides frantic few or even none following him the rest so sweetly constrained consenting to stay there and thus the new berlin rolls and druet and guillaume gallop after it and dantoin's troopers or trooper gallops after them and saint menehold with some leagues of the king's highway is in explosion and your military thunder chain has gone off in a self-destructive manner one may fear with the frightfulest issues end of section thirty one Section 32 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.47 The Night of Spurs. This comes of mysterious escorts and a new Berlin with eleven horses. He that has a secret should not only hide it, but hide that he has it to hide. Your first military escort has exploded self-destructive, and all military escorts and a suspicious country will now be up explosive, comparable not to victorious thunder. Comparable, say, rather, to the first stirring of an alpine avalanche, which, once stir it, as here at St. Menehold, will spread all around and on and on as far as Stenny, thundering with wild ruin, till patriot villagers, peasantry, military escorts, New Berlin and royalty are down, jumbling in the abyss. The thick shades of night are falling. Postilions crack the whip. The Royal Berlin is through Clermont, where Colonel Comte de Damas got a word whispered to it, is safe through towards Varennes, rushing at the rate of double drink money an unknown inconnu on horseback shrieks earnestly some hoarse whisper not audible into a rushing carriage window and vanishes left in the night august travellers palpitate nevertheless overwearied nature sinks every one of them into a kind of sleep alas and drouet and clerk guillaume spur taking side roads for shortness for safety scattering abroad that moral certainty of theirs which flies a bird of the air carrying it and your rigorous quartermaster spurs awakening hoarse trumpet tone as here at clermont calling out dragoons gone to bed brave colonel de damas has them mounted in part these clermont men young cornet remy dashes off with a few but the patriot magistracy is out here at clermont too national guards shrieking for ball cartridges and the village illuminates itself deft patriots springing out of bed alertly in shirt or shift striking a light sticking up each his farthing candle or penurious oil cruise till all glitters and glimmers so deft are they a camisado or shirt tumult everywhere storm bell set a ringing village drum beating furious general as here at clermont under illumination distracted patriots pleading and menacing brave young colonel de damas in that uproar of distracted patriotism speaks some fire sentences to what troopers he has comrades insulted at saint menehould 
king and country calling on the brave then gives the fire word draw swords whereupon alas the troopers only smite their sword handles driving them further home to me whoever is for the king cries dama in despair and gallops he with some poor loyal too of the subaltern sort into the bosom of the night night unexampled in the clermontay shortest of the year remarkablest of the century night deserving to be named of spurs corne remy and those few he dashed off with has missed his road his galloping for hours towards verdun then for hours across hedged country through roused hamlets towards varennes unlucky corne remy unluckier colonel dama with whom there rides desperate only some loyal too more ride not of that clermont escort of other escorts in other villages not even two may ride but only all curvet and prance impeded by storm bell and your village illuminating itself and Drouet rides and clerk guillaume and the country runs gogola and duke choiseul are plunging through morasses over cliffs over stock and stone in the shaggy woods of the clermontay by tracks or trackless with guides whose hours tumbling into pitfalls and lying swooned three-quarters of an hour the rest refusing to march without them what an evening ride from pont de somerville what a thirty hours since choiseul quitted paris with queen's valley leonard in the chaise by him black care sits behind the rider thus go they plunging rustle the owlet from his branchy nest champ the sweet-scented forest herb queen of the meadows spilling her spikenard and frighten the ear of night but hark towards twelve o'clock as one guesses for the very stars are gone out sound of the tocsin from varennes checking bridle the hussar officer listens some fire undoubtedly yet rides on with double breathlessness to verify yes gallant friends that do your utmost it is a certain sort of fire difficult to quench the corf berlin fairly ahead of all this riding avalanche reached the little paltry village of varennes about eleven o'clock hopeful in spite of that hoarse whispering unknown do not all towns now lie behind us verdun avoided on our right within wind of bouillet himself in a manner and the darkest of midsummer nights favouring us and so we halt on the hilltop at the south end of the village expecting our relay which young bouillet bouillet's own son with his escort of hussars was to have ready for in this village is no post distracting to think of neither horse nor hussar is here ah and stout horses a proper relay belonging to duke choiseul do stand at hay but in the upper village over the bridge and we know not of them hussars likewise do wait but drinking in the taverns for indeed it is six hours beyond the time young bouillet silly stripling thinking the matter over for this night has retired to bed and so our yellow couriers inexperienced must rove groping bungling through a village mostly asleep postilions will not for any money go on with the tired horses not at least without refreshment not they let the valley in round hat argue as he likes miserable for five and thirty minutes by the king's watch the berlin is at a dead stand round hat arguing with churn boots tired horses slobbering their meal and water yellow couriers groping bungling young bouillet asleep all the while in the upper village and choiseul's fine team standing there at hay no help for it not with a king's ransom the horses deliberately slobber round hat argues bouillet sleeps and mark now in the thick night do not two horsemen with jaded trot come clank clanking and start with half pause if one noticed them at sight of this dim mass of a berlin and its dull slobbering and arguing then prick off faster into the village 
It is Drouet, he and Clark Guillon. Still ahead, they too, of the whole riding hurly-burly, unshot, though some brag of having chased them. Perilous is Drouet's errand also, but he is an old dragoon, with his wits shaken thoroughly awake. The village of Varennes lies dark and slumberous, a most unlevel village, of inverse saddle-shape, as men write. It sleeps, the rushing of the river air, singing lullaby to it. Nevertheless, from the Golden Arms, Bradour Tavern, across that sloping market-place, there still comes shine of social light, comes voice of rude drovers or the like, who have not yet taken the stirrup cup. Boniface Le Blanc, in white apron, serving them, cheerful to behold. To this bras d'or, Drouet enters, alacrity looking through his eyes. He nudges Boniface in all privacy. Comrade, es-tu bon patriote? Art thou a good patriot? Si je suis, answers Boniface. In that case, eagerly whispers Drouet, what whisper is needful, heard of Boniface alone. And now see Boniface Le Blanc bustling as he never did for the jolliest toper. See Drouet and Guillaume, dexterous old dragoons, instantly down blocking the bridge with a furniture wagon they find there, with whatever wagons, tumbrils, barrels, barrows their hands can lay hold of, till no carriage can pass. Then swiftly, the bridge once blocked, see them take station hard by, under Varenne archway, joined by Le Blanc, Le Blanc's brother, and one or two alert patriots he has roused. Some half dozen in all, with national muskets, they stand close, waiting under the archway, till that same Corf Berlin rumble up. It rumbles up. Out la! Lanterns flash out from under coat skirts, bridles chuck in strong fists. Two national muskets level themselves fore and aft through the two coach doors. Mesdames, your passports. Alas, alas, Sieur Sauce, procureur of the township, Tallow Chandler also and grocer is there, with official grocer politeness. Drouet with fierce logic and ready wit. The respected travelling party, be it Baroness de Corfs or persons of still higher consequence, will perhaps please to rest itself in Monsieur Sauce's till the dawn strike up. O oh, Louis, O oh, hapless Marie Antoinette, fated to pass thy life with such men! Phlegmatic Louis, art thou but lazy semi-animate phlegm then to the centre of thee? King, Captain-General, Sovereign Frank, if thy heart ever formed, since it began beating under the name of heart, any resolution at all, be it now then, or never in this world. Violent nocturnal individuals, and if it were persons of high consequence, and if it were the king himself, has the king not the power which all beggars have of travelling unmolested on his own highway? Yes, it is the king, and tremble ye to know it. The king has said in this one small matter, and in France, or under God's throne, is no power that shall gainsay. Not the king shall ye stop here under this your miserable archway, but his dead body only, and answer it to heaven and earth. To me, bodyguards, postillions, en avant. One fancies in that case the pale paralysis of these two Leblanc musketeers, the drooping of Drouet's underjaw, and how procureur sauce had melted like tallow in furnace heat. Louis, faring on, in some few steps, awakening young Bouillet, awakening relays and hussars, triumphant entry, with cavalcading, high-brandishing escort and escorts into Montmédy, and the whole course of French history different. Alas, it was not in the poor phlegmatic man. Had it been in him, French history would never come under this Varennes archway to decide itself, he steps out, all step out. Procureur Sauce gives his grosser arms to the Queen and Sister Elizabeth, Majesty taking the two children by the hand, and thus they walk, 
coolly back over the marketplace to procure sauces mount into his small upper story where straightway his majesty demands refreshments demands refreshments as is written gets bread and cheese with a bottle of burgundy and remarks that it is the best burgundy he ever drank meanwhile the varenne notables and all men official and non-official are hastily drawing on their breeches getting their fighting gear mortals half-dressed tumble out barrels lay felled trees scouts dart off to all the four winds the tocsin begins clanging the village illuminates itself very singular how these little villages do manage so adroit are they when startled in midnight alarm of war like little adroit municipal rattlesnakes suddenly awakened for their storm-bell rattles and rings their eyes glisten luminous with tallow light as in rattlesnake ire and the village will sting old dragoon drouet is our engineer and generalissimo valiant as a rui diaz now or never ye patriots for the soldiery is coming massacre by austrians by aristocrats wars more than civil it all depends on you and the hour national guards rank themselves half-buttoned mortals we say still only in breeches in under petticoat tumble out barrels and lumber lay felled trees for barricades the village will sting rabid democracy it would seem is not confined to paris then ah no whatsoever courtiers might talk too clearly no this of dying for one's king is grown into a dying for one's self against the king if need be and so our riding and running avalanche and hurly-burly has reached the abyss corf berlin foremost and may pour itself thither and jumble endless for the next six hours need we ask if there was a clattering far and wide clattering and toxining and hot tumult over all the clermonte spreading through the three bishoprics dragoon and fazar troops galloping on roads and no roads national guards aiming and starting in the dead of night toxin after toxin transmitting the alarm in some forty minutes Kukula and Schwizel, with their wearied hussars reach varennes ah it is no fire then or a fire difficult to quench they leap the tree barricades in spite of national sergeant they enter the village Schwizel instructing his troopers how the matter really is who respond interjectionally in their guttural dialect der König die königin and seem staunch these now in their staunch humour will for one thing be set procureur sauce's house most beneficial had not douay stormfully ordered otherwise and even bellowed in his extremity cannoneers to your guns two old honeycombed field pieces empty of all but cobwebs the rattle whereof as the cannoneers with assured countenance trundled them up did nevertheless abate the hussar ardour and produce a respectfuller ranking further back jugs of wine handed over the ranks for the german throat too has sensibility will complete the business when engineer gugula some hour or two afterwards steps forth the response to him is a hiccuping vive la nation what boots it gogola choiseau now also count dama and all the varenne officiality are with the king and the king can give no order form no opinion but sits there as he has ever done like clay on potter's wheel perhaps the absurdest of all pitiable and pardonable clay figures that now circle under the moon he will go on next morning and take the national guard with him sauce permitting hapless queen with her two children laid there on the mean bed old mother sauce kneeling to heaven with tears and an audible prayer to bless them imperial marie antoinette near kneeling to the son sauce and wife sauce amid candle boxes and treacle barrels in vain there are three thousand national guards got in before long they will count ten thousand 
toxins spreading like fire on dry heath, or far faster. Young Bouillet, roused by this Varenne toxin, has taken horse and fled towards his father. Thitherward also rides, in an almost hysterically desperate manner, a certain Sieur Obrio, Choiseul's orderly, swimming dark rivers, our bridge being blocked, spurring as if the hell-hunt were at his heels. Through the village of Dun he gallops still on, scatters the alarm. At Dun, brave Captain Delon and his escort of a hundred saddle and ride. Delon, too, gets into Varennes, leaving his hundred outside at the tree barricade, offers to cut King Louis out if he will order it. But unfortunately, the work will prove hot, whereupon King Louis has no orders to give. And so the toxin clangs, and dragoons gallop, and can do nothing having galloped. National guards stream in like the gathering of ravens. Your exploding thunder chain, falling avalanche, or what else we liken it to, does play with a vengeance, up now as far as Steny and Bouillet himself. Brave Bouillet, son of the whirlwind, he saddles Royal Almond, speaks firewords, kindling heart and eyes, distributes twenty-five gold louis a company. Ride, Royal Almond, long famed, no Tuileries charge and Necker Orleans bust procession, a very king made captive, and world all to win. Such is the knight deserving to be named of Spurs. At six o'clock two things have happened. Lafayette's aide-de-camp, Romeuf, riding a franc étrier on that old herb merchant's route, quickened during the last stages, has got to Varennes, where the ten thousand now furiously demand, with fury of panic terror, that royalty shall forthwith return Parisward, that there be not infinite bloodshed. Also, on the other side, English Tom, Choiseul's Joquet, flying with that Choiseul relay, has met Bouillet on the heights of Dun, the adamantine brow flushed with dark thunder, thunderous rattle of Royal Almond at his heels. English Tom answers as he can the brief question, How is it at Varennes? then asks in turn what he, English Tom, with Monsieur de Choiseul's horses, is to do, and whither to ride. To the bottomless pool, answers a thunder voice, then, again speaking and spurring, orders Royal Almond to the gallop, and vanishes, swearing, en jurant. Tis the last of our brave Bouillet. Within sight of Varennes, he having drawn bridle, calls a council of officers, finds that it is in vain. King Louis has departed, consenting. Amid the clangour of universal storm-bell, amid the tramp of ten thousand armed men already arrived, and, say, of sixty thousand flocking thither. Brave Delon, even without orders, darted at the river Air with his hundred, swam one branch of it, could not the other, and stood there dripping and panting with inflated nostril, the ten thousand answering him with a shout of mockery, the new Berlin lumbering Parisward, its weary inevitable way. No help then in earth, nor in an age not of miracles in heaven. That night, quote, Marquis de Bouillet and twenty-one more of us rode over the frontiers. The Bernardine monks at Orval in Luxembourg gave us supper and lodging. End quote. With little of speech, Bouillet rides, with thoughts that do not brook speech northward towards uncertainty and the Sumerian night, towards West Indian isles. For with thin emigrant delirium, the son of the whirlwind cannot act. Towards England, towards premature stoical death, not towards France any more. Honour to the brave, who, be it in this quarrel or in that, is a substance and articulate speaking piece of human valour, not a fanfaronading hollow spectrum and squeaking and gibbering shadow. One of the few royalist chief actors, this Bouillet, of whom so much can be said. 
the brave Bouillet too, then, vanishes from the tissue of our story. Story and tissue, faint, ineffectual emblem of that grand, miraculous tissue and living tapestry named French Revolution, which did weave itself then in very fact on the loud-sounding loom of time. The old brave drop out from it with their strivings, and new acrid druets of new strivings and colour come in, as is the manner of that weaving. End of section 32、section 33 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.48 The Return. So then, our grand royalist plot of flight to Metz has executed itself. Long hovering in the background as a dread royal ultimatum, it has rushed forward in its terrors, verily to some purpose. How many royalist plots and projects, one after another, cunningly devised, that were to explode like powder mines and thunderclaps, not one solitary plot of which has issued otherwise. Powder mine of a séance royale on the 23rd of June, 1789, which exploded, as we then said, through the touch hole, which next, your war god Broglie, having reloaded it, brought a bastille about your ears. Then came fervent opera repast, with flourishing of sabres and O oh, Richard, O oh, my King, which, aided by hunger, produces insurrection of women and Pallas Athene in the shape of Demoiselle Terroigne. Valour profits not, neither has fortune smiled on fanfaronade. The Bouillet armament ends as the Broglie one has done. Man after man spends himself in this cause only to work it quicker ruin. It seems a cause doomed, forsaken of earth and heaven. On the 6th of October, gone a year, King Louis, escorted by Demoiselle Terroin and some 200,000, made a royal progress and entrance into Paris, such as man had never witnessed. We prophesied him two more such, and accordingly another of them, after this flight to Metz, is now coming to pass. Terroin will not escort here, neither does Mirabeau now sit in one of the accompanying carriages. Mirabeau lies dead in the pantheon of great men. Terroin lies living in dark Austrian prison, having gone to Liège professionally and been seized there. Bemurmured now by the hoarse flowing Danube, the light of her patriot supper parties gone quite out. So lies Terroin. She shall speak with the Kaiser face to face and return, and France lies how. Fleeting time shears down the great and the little, and in two years alters many things. But at all events, here we say is a second ignominious royal procession, though much altered, to be witnessed also by its hundreds and thousands. Patience, ye Paris patriots, the Royal Berlin is returning, not till Saturday, for the Royal Berlin travels by slow stages amid such loud-voiced confluent sea of National Guards, 60,000 as they count, amid such tumult of all people. Three National Assembly Commissioners, famed Barnave, famed Pétion, generally respectable La Tour Maubourg, having gone to meet it, of whom the two former ride in the Berlin itself beside Majesty day after day. La Tour, as a mere respectability, and man of whom all men speak well, can ride in the rear with Dame Tourzel and the Soubrette. So on Saturday evening, about seven o'clock, Paris by hundreds of thousands is again drawn up, not now dancing the trickler joy dance of hope, nor as yet dancing in fury dance of hate and revenge, but in silence with vague look of conjecture and curiosity mostly scientific. 
a saint antoine placard has given notice this morning that whosoever insults louis shall be caned whosoever applauds him shall be hanged behold then at last that wonderful new berlin encircled by blue national sea with fixed bayonets which flows slowly floating it on through the silent assembled hundreds of thousands three yellow couriers sit atop bound with ropes petion barnave their majesties with sister elizabeth and the children of france are within smile of embarrassment or cloud of dull sourness is on the broad phlegmatic face of his majesty who keeps declaring to the successive official persons what is evident eh bien me voila well here you have me and what is not evident i do assure you i did not mean to pass the frontiers and so forth speech is natural for that poor royal man which decency would veil silent is her majesty with a look of grief and scorn natural for that royal woman thus lumbers and creeps the ignominious royal procession through many streets amid a silent gazing people comparable mercier thinks to some procession de roi de bazoche or say procession of king crispin with his dukes of soutormania and royal blazonry of cordwainry except indeed that this is not comic ah no it is comico tragic with bound couriers and a doom hanging over it most fantastic yet most miserably real miserablest phlebile ludibrium of pickle herring tragedy it sweeps along there in most ungorgeous pall through many streets in the dusty summer evening gets itself at length wriggled out of sight vanishing in the tuileries palace towards its doom of slow torture peine forte et dure populace it is true seizes the three rope-bound yellow couriers will at least massacre them but our august assembly which is sitting at this great moment sends out deputation of rescue and the whole is got huddled up barnave all dusty is already there in the national hall making brief discreet address and report as indeed through the whole journey this barnave has been most discreet sympathetic and has gained the queen's trust whose noble instinct teaches her always who is to be trusted very different from heavy petillon who if compon speak truth ate his luncheon comfortably filled his wine glass in the royal berlin flung out his chicken bones past the nose of royalty itself and on the king's saying france cannot be a republic answered no it is not ripe yet barnave is henceforth a queen's adviser if advice could profit and her majesty astonishes dame compon by signifying almost a regard for barnave and that in a day of retribution and royal triumph barnave shall not be executed on monday night royalty went on saturday evening it returns so much within one short week has royalty accomplished for itself the pickle herring tragedy has vanished in the tuileries palace towards pain strong and hard watched fettered and humbled as royalty never was watched even in its sleeping apartments and inmost recesses for it has to sleep with door set ajar blue national argos watching his eye fixed on the queen's curtains nay on one occasion as the queen cannot sleep he offers to sit by her pillow and converse a little End of section thirty three Section thirty four of the French Revolution, Volume two by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter two point four nine Sharp Shot. In regard to all which, this most pressing question arises What is to be done with it? 
deposit resolutely answer robespierre and the thoroughgoing few for truly with a king who runs away and needs to be watched in his very bedroom that he may stay and govern you what other reasonable thing can be done had philippe d'orleans not been a caput mortuum but of him known as one defunct no man now dreams deposit not say that it is inviolable that it was spirited away was enlevé at any cost of sophistry and solecism re-establish it so answer with loud vehemence all manner of constitutional royalists as all your pure royalists do naturally likewise with low vehemence and rage compressed by fear still more passionately answer nay bernave and the two lamettes and what will follow them do likewise answer so answer with their whole might terror-struck at the unknown abysses on the verge of which driven thither by themselves mainly all now reels ready to plunge by mighty effort and combination this latter course of re-establish it is the course fixed on and it shall by the strong arm if not by the clearest logic be made good with the sacrifice of all their hard-earned popularity this notable triumvirate says to Longjean, set the throne up again which they had so toiled to overturn as one might set up an overturned pyramid on its vertex to stand so long as it is held unhappy france unhappy in king queen and constitution one knows not in which unhappiest was the meaning of our so glorious french revolution this and no other that when shams and delusions long soul-killing had become body-killing and got the length of bankruptcy and inanition a great people rose and with one voice said in the name of the highest shams shall be no more so many sorrows and bloody horrors endured and to be yet endured through dismal coming centuries were they not the heaviest price paid and payable for this same total destruction of shams from among men and now o bernave triumvirate is it in such double distilled delusion and sham even of a sham that an effort of this kind will rest acquiescent monsieur of the popular triumvirate never but after all what can poor popular triumvirates and fallible august senators do they can when the truth is all too horrible stick their heads ostrich-like into what sheltering fallacy is nearest and wait there a posteriori readers who saw the clermontet and three bishoprics gallop in the night of spurs diligences ruffling up all france into one terrific terrified cock of india and the town of nantes in its shirt may fancy what an affair to settle this was robespierre on the extreme left with perhaps petion and linold goupil for the very triumvirate has defecated are shrieking hoarse drowned in constitutional clamour but the debate and arguing of a whole nation the bellowings through all journals for and against the reverberant voice of danton the hyperion shafts of camille the porcupine quills of implacable marat conceive all this constitutionalists in a body as we often predicted do now recede from the mother society and become fuyant threatening her with inanition the rank and respectability being mostly gone petition after petition forwarded by post or born in deputation comes praying for judgment and déchéance which is our name for deposition praying at lowest for reference to the eighty-three departments of france hot marseillaise deputation comes declaring among other things our phocian ancestors flung a bar of iron into the bay at the first landing 
this bar will float again on the Mediterranean brine before we consent to be slaves. All this for four weeks or more, while the matter still hangs doubtful, emigration streaming with double violence over the frontiers, France seething in fierce agitation of this question and prize question, what is to be done with the fugitive hereditary representative? Finally, on Friday the 15th of July, 1791, the National Assembly decides, in what negatory manner we know. Whereupon the theatres all close, the born stones and portable chairs begin spouting, municipal placards flaming on the walls, and proclamations published by sound of trumpet invite to repose with small effect. And so on Sunday the 17th, there shall be a thing seen worthy of remembering, scroll of a petition drawn up by Brissot, Danton, by Cordelier, Jacobin, for the thing was infinitely shaken and manipulated, and many had a hand in it. Such scroll lies now visible on the wooden framework of the Fatherland's altar for signature. Unworking Paris, male and female, is crowding thither all day to sign or to see. Our fair Roland herself, the eye of history, can discern there in the morning, not without interest. In few weeks the fair patriot will quit Paris, yet perhaps only to return. But what with sorrow of bolt patriotism, what with closed theatres and proclamations still publishing themselves by sound of trumpet, the fervour of men's minds this day is great. Nay, over and above, there has fallen out an incident of the nature of farce, tragedy and riddle, enough to stimulate all creatures. Early in the day, a patriot, or some say it was a patriotess, and indeed truth is undiscoverable. While standing on the firm deal-board of Fatherland's altar, feels suddenly, with indescribable torpedo shock of amazement, his boot sole pricked through from below. He clutches up, suddenly, this electrified boot sole and foot, discerns next instant the point of a gimlet or brad awl playing up through the firm deal board and now hastily drawing itself back. Mystery, perhaps treason? The wooden framework is impetuously broken up, and behold, verily a mystery, never explicable fully to the end of the world. Two human individuals of mean aspect, one of them with a wooden leg, lie ensconced there, gimlet in hand. They must have come in overnight. They have a supply of provisions, no barrel of gunpowder that one can see. They affect to be asleep, look blank enough, and give the lamest account of themselves. Mere curiosity! They were boring up to get an eye-hole, to see, perhaps, with lubricity, whatsoever from that new point of vision could be seen. Little that was edifying, one would think. But indeed, what stupidest thing may not human dullness, pruriency, lubricity, chance and the devil, choosing two out of half a million idle human heads, tempt them to? Sure enough, the two human individuals with their gimlet are there, ill-starred pair of individuals. For the result of it all is that patriotism, fretting itself in this state of nervous excitability with hypotheses, suspicions and reports, keeps questioning these two distracted human individuals and again questioning them, claps them into the nearest guardhouse, clutches them out again, one hypothetic group snatching them from another, till finally, in such extreme state of nervous excitability, patriotism hangs them as spies of Sieur Mottier and the life and secret is choked out of them for evermore. For evermore, alas. Or is a day to be looked for when these two evidently mean individuals, who are human nevertheless, will become historical riddles, and like him of the Iron Mask, also a human individual, and evidently nothing more, have their dissertations? 
to us this only is certain that they had a gimlet provisions and a wooden leg and have died there on the long term as the unluckiest fools might die and so the signature goes on in a still more excited manner and chomette for antiquarians possess the very paper to this hour has signed himself in a flowing saucy hand slightly leaned and hebert detestable pere de chene as if an inked spider had dropped on the paper usher maillard also has signed and many crosses which cannot write and paris through its thousand avenues is welling to the champ de mars and from it in the utmost excitability of humour central fatherland's altar quite heaped with signing patriots and patriotesses the thirty benches and whole internal space crowded with onlookers with comers and goers one regurgitating whirlpool of men and women in their sunday clothes all which a constitutional sieur mortier sees and bailly looking into it with his long visage made still longer auguring no good perhaps deschance and deposition after all stop it ye constitutional patriots fire itself is quenchable yet only quenchable at first stop it truly but how stop it have not the first free people of the universe a right to petition happily if also unhappily here is one proof of riot these two human individuals hanged at the lanterne proof o treacherous sieur mortier were they not two human individuals sent thither by thee to be hanged to be a pretext for thy bloody drapeau rouge this question shall many a patriot one day ask and answer affirmatively strong in preternatural suspicion enough towards half-past seven in the evening the mere natural eye can behold this thing sieur mortier with municipals in scarf with blue national patriotism, rank after rank to the clang of drums wending resolutely to the champ de mars may your bay with elongated visage bearing as in sad duty bound the drapeau rouge howl of angry derision rises in treble and bass from a hundred thousand throats at the sight of martial law which nevertheless waving its red sanguinary flag advances there from the gros caillot entrance advances drumming and waving towards altar of fatherland amid still wilder howls with objurgation obtestation with flights of pebbles and mud saxa et faiscis with crackle of a pistol shot finally with volley fire of patriotism levelled muskets roll of volley on volley precisely after one year and three days our sublime federation field is wetted in this manner with french blood some twelve unfortunately shot reports bailly counting by units but patriotism counts by tens and even by hundreds not to be forgotten nor forgiven patriotism flies shrieking execrating camille ceases journalizing this day great danton with camille and fréron have taken wing for their life marat burrows deep in the earth and is silent once more patriotism has triumphed one other time but it is the last this was the royal flight to varennes thus was the throne overturned thereby but thus also was it victoriously set up again on its vertex and will stand while it can be held end of section 34「Section 35 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Book 2.5, Parliament First. Chapter 2.5.1, Grande Acceptation. 
In the last nights of September, when the autumnal equinox is past and grey September fades into brown October, why are the Champs-Élysées illuminated? Why is Paris dancing and flinging fireworks? They are gala nights, these last days of September. Paris may well dance, and the universe. The edifice of the Constitution is completed. Completed, nay, revised, to see that there was nothing insufficient in it. Solemnly preferred to His Majesty. Solemnly accepted by him to the sound of cannon salvos on the 14th of the month. And now by such illumination, jubilee, dancing and fireworking, do we joyously handle the new social edifice and first raise heat and reek there in the name of hope. The revision, especially with a throne standing on its vertex, has been a work of difficulty, of delicacy. In the way of propping and buttressing, so indispensable now, something could be done. And yet, as is feared, not enough. A resplendent Barnave triumvirate, our Rabot, Duport, Touré, and indeed all constitutional deputies, did strain every nerve. But the extreme left was so noisy, the people were so suspicious, clamorous to have the work ended. And then the loyal right side sat feeble petulant all the while, and, as it were, pouting and petting, unable to help had they even been willing. The two hundred and ninety had solemnly made scission before that, and departed, shaking the dust off their feet. To such transcendency of fret and desperate hope that worsening of the bad might the sooner end it and bring back the good, had our unfortunate loyal right side now come. However, one finds that this and the other little prop has been added, where possibility allowed. Civil list and privy purse were from of old well cared for. King's Constitutional Guard, 1,800 loyal men from the 83 departments, under a loyal Duc de Brissac. This, with trustworthy Swiss, besides, is of itself something. The old loyal bodyguards are indeed dissolved, in name as well as in fact, and gone mostly towards Koblenz. But now also these sans culottic violent Garde Francaise, or Centre Grenadiers, shall have their mitimus. They do ere long, in the journals, not without a hoarse pathos, publish their farewell, wishing all aristocrats the graves in Paris, which to us are denied. They depart, these first soldiers of the revolution. They hover very dimly in the distance, for about another year, till they can be remodelled, new named, and sent to fight the Austrians and then history beholds them no more. A most notable corps of men, which has its place in world history, though to us, so is history written, they remain mere rubrics of men, nameless, a shaggy grenadier mass, crossed with buff belts. And yet might we not ask, what Argonauts, what Leonidas Spartans had done such a work? Think of their destiny, since that May morning, some three years ago, when they, unparticipating, trundled off Despremenil to the Calypso Isles, since that July evening, some two years ago, when they, participating and sacreing with knit brows, poured a volley into Bizonval's Prince de Lombesque. History waves them her mute adieu. So that the sovereign power, these sansculotic watchdogs, more like wolves, being leashed and led away from his Tuileries, breathes freer. The sovereign power is guarded henceforth by a loyal 1800, whom contrivance, under various pretexts, may gradually swell to 6,000, who will hinder no journey to saint Cloud. The sad Varenne business has been soldered up, cemented, even in the blood of the Champ de Mars, these two months and more. And indeed ever since, as formerly, Majesty has had its privileges, its choice of residence, 
though for good reasons the royal mind prefers continuing in Paris. Poor royal mind, poor Paris. They have to go mumming, enveloped in speciosities, in falsehood which knows itself false, and to enact mutually your sorrowful farce tragedy, being bound to it, and on the whole to hope always in spite of hope. Nay, now that His Majesty has accepted the Constitution to the sound of cannon salvos, who would not hope? Our good king was misguided, but he meant well. Lafayette has moved for an amnesty, for universal forgiving and forgetting of revolutionary faults. And now surely the glorious revolution, cleared of its rubbish, is complete. Strange enough, and touching in several ways, the old cry of Vive le Roi once more rises round King Louis, the hereditary representative. Their majesties went to the opera, gave money to the poor. The queen herself, now, when the constitution is accepted, hears voice of cheering. Bygone shall be bygone. The new era shall begin. To and fro amid these lamp galaxies of the Elysian fields, the royal carriage slowly wends and rolls, everywhere with vivats, from a multitude striving to be glad. Louis looks out, mainly on the variegated lamps and gay human groups, with satisfaction enough for the hour. In Her Majesty's face, under that kind, graceful smile, a deep sadness is legible. Brilliances of valour and of wit stroll here observant, a dame de style leaning most probably on the arm of her Narbonne. She meets deputies who have built this constitution, who saunter here with vague communings, not without thoughts whether it will stand. But as yet melodious fiddle-strings twang and warble everywhere with the rhythm of light fantastic feet. Long lamp galaxies fling their coloured radiance, and brass-lunged hawkers elbow and ball, grande acceptation, constitution monarchique. It behoves the son of Adam to hope. Have not Lafayette, Barnave, and all constitutionalists set their shoulders handsomely to the inverted pyramid of a throne? Fuyant, including almost the whole constitutional respectability of France, perorate nightly from their tribune, correspond through all post offices, denouncing unquiet Jacobinism, trusting well that its time is nigh done. Much is uncertain, questionable, but if the hereditary representative be wise and lucky, may one not, with a sanguine Gallic temper, hope that he will get in motion better or worse, that what is wanting to him will gradually be gained and added? For the rest, as we must repeat, in this building of the constitutional fabric, especially in this revision of it, nothing that one could think of to give it new strength, especially to steady it, to give it permanence and even eternity, has been forgotten. Biennial Parliament, to be called Legislative, Assemblée Législative, with 745 members, chosen in a judicious manner by the active citizens alone, and even by electing of electors still more active, this, with privileges of Parliament, shall meet, self-authorised if need be, and self-dissolved, shall grant money supplies and talk, watch over the administration and authorities, discharge forever the functions of a constitutional great council, collective wisdom, and national palaver, as the heavens will enable. Our first biennial parliament, which indeed has been a choosing since early in August, is now as good as chosen. Nay, it has mostly got to Paris. It arrived gradually, not without pathetic greeting to its venerable parent, the now moribund constituent, and sat there in the galleries, reverently listening, ready to begin, the instant the ground were clear. Then, as to changes in the Constitution itself, this impossible for any legislative or common biennial parliament, 
and possible solely for some resuscitated constituent or national convention, is evidently one of the most ticklish points. The august moribund assembly debated it for four entire days. Some thought a change, or at least reviewal and new approval, might be admissible in thirty years. Some even went lower down to twenty, nay, to fifteen. The august assembly had once decided for thirty years, but it revoked that on better thoughts, and did not fix any date of time, but merely some vague outline of a posture of circumstances, and on the whole left the matter hanging. Doubtless a national convention can be assembled even within the thirty years, yet one may hope not. But that legislatives, by annual parliaments of the common kind, with their limited faculty, and perhaps quiet successive additions thereto, may suffice for generations, or indeed while computed time runs. Furthermore, be it noted that no member of this constituent has been or could be elected to the new legislative. So noble-minded were these lawmakers, cry some, and Solon-like would banish themselves. So splenetic, cry more, each grudging the other, none daring to be outdone in self-denial by the other. So unwise in either case, answer all practical men. But consider this other self-denying ordinance, that none of us can be king's minister, or accept the smallest court appointment, for the space of four, or at lowest, and on long debate and revision, for the space of two years. So moves the incorruptible sea-green Robespierre, with cheap magnanimity he, and none dare be outdone by him. It was such a law, not so superfluous then, that sent Mirabeau to the gardens of Saint-Cloud, under cloak of darkness, to that colloquy of the gods, and thwarted many things. Happily and unhappily, there is no Mirabeau now to thwart. Welcomer, meanwhile, welcome surely to all right hearts, is Lafayette's chivalrous amnesty. Welcome, too, is that hard-wrung union of Avignon, which has cost us, first and last, thirty sessions of debate, and so much else. May it at length prove lucky. Rousseau's statue is decreed, virtuous Jean-Jacques, evangelist of the Contrat Social, not Drouy of Varennes, nor worthy Latay, master of the old world-famous tennis court in Versailles, is forgotten. But each has his honourable mention, and due reward in money. Whereupon, things being all so neatly winded up, and the deputations and messages, and royal and other ceremonials having rustled by, and the king having now affectionately perorated about peace and tranquillization, and members having answered, Oui, oui, with effusion, even with tears. President Touré, he of the law reforms, rises, and with a strong voice utters these memorable last words. The National Constituent Assembly declares that it has finished its mission, and that its sittings are all ended. Incorruptible Robespierre, virtuous Pétion, are borne home on the shoulders of the people, with vivats heaven high. The rest glide quietly to their respective places of abode. It is the last afternoon of September, 1791. On the morrow morning, the new legislative will begin. So, amid glitter of illuminated streets and Champs-Élysées, and crackle of fireworks and glad dire, has the first National Assembly vanished, dissolving, as they well say, into blank time, and is no more. National Assembly is gone, its work remaining, as all bodies of men go, and as man himself goes. It had its beginning, and must likewise have its end. A phantasm reality born of time, as the rest of us are, flitting ever backwards now on the tide of time, to be long remembered of men. Very strange assemblages, sanhedrims, amphictyonics, 
trades unions, ecumenic councils, parliaments and congresses have met together on this planet and dispersed again. But a stranger assemblage than this august constituent, or with a stranger mission, perhaps never met there. Seen from the distance, this also will be a miracle. Twelve hundred human individuals, with the gospel of Jean-Jacques Rousseau in their pocket, congregating in the name of twenty-five millions, with full assurance of faith, to make the constitution. Such sight, the acme and main product of the eighteenth century, our world can witness once only. For time is rich in wonders, in monstrosities most rich, and is observed never to repeat himself, or any of his gospels. Surely, least of all, this gospel according to Jean-Jacques. Once it was right and indispensable, since such had become the belief of men, but once also is enough. They have made the constitution, these twelve hundred Jean-Jacques evangelists, not without result. Near twenty-nine months they sat, with various fortune, in various capacity, always, we may say, in that capacity of Carborn Caroccio, and miraculous standard of the revolt of men, as a thing high and lifted up, whereon whosoever looked might hope healing. They have seen much, cannons levelled on them, then suddenly by interposition of the powers the cannons drawn back, and a war-god broglie vanishing, in thunder not his own, amid the dust and down-rushing of a Bastille and old feudal France. They have suffered somewhat, royal session, with rain and oath of the tennis court, knights of Pentecost, insurrections of women. Also have they not done somewhat, made the constitution, and managed all things the while, passed in these twenty-nine months twenty-five hundred decrees, which on the average is some three for each day, including Sundays. Brevity, one finds, is possible at times. Had not Moreau de Saint-Marie to give three thousand orders before rising from his seat? There was valour, or value, in these men, and a kind of faith, were it only faith in this, that cobwebs are not cloth, that a constitution could be made. Cobwebs and chimeras ought verily to disappear, for a reality there is. Let formulas, soul-killing, and now grown body-killing, insupportable, be gone, in the name of heaven and earth. Time, as we say, brought forth these twelve hundred. Eternity was before them, eternity behind. They worked, as we all do, in the confluence of two eternities, what work was given them. Say not that it was nothing they did. Consciously they did somewhat, unconsciously how much. They had their giants and their dwarfs, they accomplished their good and their evil. They are gone and return no more. Shall they not go with our blessing in these circumstances, with our mild farewell? By post, by diligence, on saddle or sole, they are gone, towards the four winds. Not a few over the marches to rank at Coblentz. Thither wended Marie, among others, but in the end towards Rome, to be clothed there in red cardinal plush, in falsehood as in garment. Pet son, her last born, of the scarlet woman. Talleyrand Perigord, excommunicated constitutional bishop, will make his way to London to be ambassador, spite of the self-denying law. Brisk young Marquis Chauvelin, acting as ambassador's cloak. In London, too, one finds Pétion, the virtuous, harangued and haranguing, pledging the wine cup with constitutional reform clubs, in solemn tavern dinner. Incorruptible Robespierre retires for a little to native Arras. Seven short weeks of quiet, the last appointed him in this world. Public accuser in the Paris department, acknowledged high priest of the Jacobin, the glass of incorruptible thin patriotism, 
for his narrow emphasis is loved of all the narrow. This man seems to be rising, some whither. He sells his small heritage at Arras. Accompanied by a brother and a sister, he returns, scheming out with resolute timidity a small sure destiny for himself and them, to his old lodging at the cabinet-makers in the Rue Saint-Honoré. O oh, resolute, tremulous, incorruptible sea-green man, towards what a destiny! Lafayette, for his part, will lay down the command. He retires, Cincinnatus-like, to his hearth and farm, but soon leaves them again. Our National Guard, however, shall henceforth have no one commandant, but all colonels shall command in succession, month about. Other deputies we have met, or Dame de Stal has met, sauntering in a thoughtful manner, perhaps uncertain what to do. Some, as Bernave, the Lamettes, and their Duport, will continue here in Paris, watching the new biennial legislative, Parliament the First, teaching it to walk, if so might be, and the court to lead it. Thus these, sauntering in a thoughtful manner, travelling by post or diligence, whither fate beckons. Giant Mirabeau slumbers in the pantheon of great men. And France? And Europe? The brass-lunged hawkers sing, Grande acceptation, monarchic constitution, through these gay crowds. The morrow, grandson of yesterday, must be what it can, as today its father is. Our new biennial legislative begins to constitute itself on the 1st of October, 1791. End of section 35section thirty six of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point five two the book of the law if the august constituent assembly itself fixing the regards of the universe could at the present distance of time and place gain comparatively small attention from us how much less can this poor legislative? It has its right side and its left, the less patriotic and the more, for aristocrats exist not here and now. It spouts and speaks, listens to reports, reads bills and laws, works in its vocation for a season, but the history of France, one finds, is seldom or never there. Unhappy legislative, what can history do with it, if not drop a tear over it, almost in silence? First of the two-year parliaments of France, which, if paper constitution and oft-repeated national oath could avail aught, were to follow in softly strong, indissoluble sequence, while time ran. It had to vanish dolefully within one year, and there came no second like it. Alas! your biennial parliaments, in endless, indissoluble sequence, they and all that constitutional fabric, built with such explosive federation oaths, and its topstone brought out with dancing and variegated radiance, went to pieces, like frail crockery, in the crash of things, and already in eleven short months, were in that limbo near the moon, with the ghosts of other chimeras, there, except for rare specific purposes, let them rest in melancholy peace. On the whole, how unknown is a man to himself, or a public body of men to itself. Aesop's fly sat on the chariot wheel, exclaiming, What a dust I do raise! Great governors, clad in purple, with fasces and insignia, are governed by their valets, by the spouting of their women and children or, in constitutional countries, by the paragraphs of their able editors. Say not, I am this or that, I am doing this or that, for thou knowest it not, thou knowest only the name it as yet goes by. 
a purple nebuchadnezzar rejoices to feel himself now verily emperor of this great babylon which he has builded and is a nondescript biped quadruped on the eve of a seven years course of grazing these seven hundred and forty-five elected individuals doubt not but they are the first biennial parliament come to govern france by parliamentary eloquence and they are what and they have come to do what things foolish and not wise it is much lamented by many that this first biennial had no members of the old constituent in it with their experience of parties and parliamentary tactics that such was their foolish self-denying law most surely old members of the constituent had been welcome to us here but on the other hand what old or what new members of any constituent under the sun could have effectually profited there are first biennial parliaments so postured as to be in a sense beyond wisdom where wisdom and folly differ only in degree and wreckage and dissolution are the appointed issue for both old constituents your barnaves lamets and the like for whom a special gallery has been set apart where they may sit in honour and listen are in the habit of sneering at these new legislators but let not us the poor seven hundred and forty-five sent together by the active citizens of france are what they could be do what is fated them that they are of patriot temper we can well understand aristocrat noblesse had fled over the marches or sat brooding silent in their unburnt chateaux small prospect had they in primary electoral assemblies what with flights to varennes what with days of poniards with plot after plot the people are left to themselves the people must needs choose defenders of the people such as can be had choosing as they also will ever do if not the ablest man yet the man ablest to be chosen fervour of character decided patriot constitutional feeling these are qualities but free utterance mastership in tongue fence this is the quality of qualities accordingly one finds with little astonishment in this first biennial that as many as four hundred members are of the advocate or attorney species men who can speak if there be aught to speak nay here are men also who can think and even act candour will say of this ill-fated first french parliament that it wanted not its modicum of talent its modicum of honesty that it neither in the one respect nor in the other sank below the average of parliaments but rose above the average let average parliaments whom the world does not guillotine and cast forth to long infamy be thankful not to themselves but to their stars france as we say has once more done what it could fervid men have come together from wide separation for strange issues fiery max isna is come from the utmost south-east fiery claude fauché te deum fauché bishop of calvados from the utmost north-west no mirabeau now sits here who had swallowed formulas our only mirabeau now is danton working as yet out of doors whom some call mirabeau of the sans culotte nevertheless we have our gifts especially of speech and logic an eloquent vergnon we have most mellifluous yet most impetuous of public speakers from the region named gironde of the garonne a man unfortunately of indolent habits who will sit playing with your children when he ought to be scheming and perorating sharp bustling guade considerate grave sans son kind sparkling mirthful young duco valaze doomed to a sad end all these likewise are of that gironde or bordeaux region men of fervid constitutional principles of quick talent irrefragable logic clear respectability who will have the reign of liberty establish itself but only by respectable methods 
round whom others of like temper will gather, known by and by as Girondin, to the sorrowing wonder of the world, of which sort note Condorcet, Marquis and philosopher, who has worked at much, at Paris Municipal Constitution, Differential Calculus, Newspaper, Chronique de Paris, Biography, Philosophy, and now sits here as two years senator, a notable Condorcet, with stoical Roman face and fiery heart, volcano hid under snow, styled likewise in irreverent language, mouton enragé, peaceablest of creatures bitten rabid. Or note lastly Jean-Pierre Brissot, whom destiny, long working noisily with him, has hurled hither, say, to have done with him. A biennial senator he too, nay, for the present, the king of such. Restless, scheming, scribbling Brissot, who took to himself the style de Varville, heralds know not in the least why, unless it were that the father of him did in an unexceptionable manner, perform cookery and vintnery in the village of Ouarville. A man of the windmill species that grinds always, turning towards all winds, not in the steadiest manner. In all these men there is talent, faculty to work, and they will do it, working and shaping, not without effect, though, alas, not in marble, only in quicksand. But the highest faculty of them all remains yet to be mentioned, or indeed has yet to unfold itself for mention. Captain Hippolyte Carnot, sent hither from the Pas de Calais, with his cold mathematical head and silent stubbornness of will. Iron Carnot, far planning, imperturbable, unconquerable, who in the hour of need shall not be found wanting. His hair is yet black, and it shall grow grey, under many kinds of fortune, bright and troublous, and with iron aspect this man shall face them all. Nor is Côté Droit, and band of king's friends, wanting. Vaublanc, Dumas, Jocourt, the honoured chevalier, who love liberty, yet with monarchy over it, and speak fearlessly according to that faith whom the thick-coming hurricanes will sweep away. With them, let a new military Théodore Lamette be named, were it only for his two brothers' sake, who look down on him approvingly there from the old constituents' gallery. Frothy professing pastorés, honey-mouthed conciliatory Lamourettes, and speechless, nameless individuals sit plentiful as moderates in the middle. Still less is a Côté Gauche wanting, extreme left, sitting on the topmost benches as if aloft on its speculatory height or mountain, which will become a practical, fulminatory height, and make the name of mountain famous, infamous, to all times and lands. Honour waits not on this mountain, nor as yet even loud dishonour. Gifts it boasts not, nor graces, of speaking or of thinking, solely this one gift of assured faith, of audacity, that will defy the earth and the heavens. Foremost here are the Cordelier Trio, Hot Merlin from Thionville, Hot Bazir, attorneys both, Chabot, disfrocked Capuchin, skilful in agio, Lawyer Lacroix, who wore once as subaltern the single epaulette, has loud lungs and a hungry heart. There, too, is Couton, little dreaming what he is, whom a sad chance has paralysed in the lower extremities. For, it seems, he sat once a whole night, not warm in his true love's bower, who indeed was by law another's, but sunken to the middle in a cold peat bog, being hunted out, quaking for his life in the cold quaking morass and goes now on crutches to the end. Campbell, likewise, in whom slumbers undeveloped such a finance talent for printing of Assignat, father of paper money, who, in the hour of menace, shall utter this stern sentence, War to the manor house, peace to the hut, guerre au château, paix au chaumière. Le Cointre, the intrepid draper of Versailles, 
is welcome here, known since the opera repast and insurrection of women. Turio, too, Elector Turio, who stood in the embrasures of the Bastille and saw Saint Antoine rising in mass, who has many other things to see. Last and grimmest of all, note old Rule, with his brown dusky face and long white hair, of Alsatian Lutheran breed, a man whom age and book learning have not taught, who, haranguing the old men of Reims, shall hold up the sacred ampulla heaven sent wherefrom clovis and all kings have been anointed as a mere worthless oil bottle and dash it to sherds on the pavement there who alas shall dash much to sherds and finally his own wild head by pistol shot and so end it such lava welters red hot in the bowels of this mountain unknown to the world and to itself a mere commonplace mountain hitherto distinguished from the plain chiefly by its superior barrenness its baldness of look at the utmost it may to the most observant perceptibly smoke for as yet all lies so solid peaceable and doubts not as was said that it will endure while time runs do not all love liberty and the constitution all heartily and yet with degrees some as chevalier jocourt and his right side may love liberty less than royalty were the trial made others as brissot and his left side may love it more than royalty nay again of these latter some may love liberty more than law itself others not more Parties will unfold themselves, no mortal as yet knows how. Forces work within these men and without. Dissidence grows opposition, ever widening, waxing into incompatibility and internecine feud. Till the strong is abolished by a stronger, himself in his turn by a strongest. Who can help it? Jocour and his monarchists, Fuyon, or moderates, Brissot and his Brissotin, Jacobin, or Girondin. These, with the Cordelier trio and all men, must work what is appointed them, and in the way appointed them. And to think what fate these poor seven hundred and forty-five are assembled most unwittingly to meet. Let no heart be so hard as not to pity them. Their soul's wish was to live and work as the first of the French parliaments and make the constitution march. Did they not, at their very instalment, go through the most affecting constitutional ceremony, almost with tears? The twelve eldest are sent solemnly to fetch the constitution itself, the printed book of the law. Archivist, Camo, an old constituent appointed archivist, he and the ancient twelve, amid blare of military pomp and clangour, enter bearing the divine book and president and all legislative senators laying their hand on the same successively take the oath with cheers and heart effusion universal three times three in this manner they begin their session unhappy mortals for that same day his majesty having received their deputation of welcome as seemed rather dryly the deputation cannot but feel slighted cannot but lament such slight and thereupon our cheering swearing first parliament sees itself on the morrow obliged to explode into fierce retaliatory sputter of anti-royal enactment as to how they for their part will receive majesty and how majesty shall not be called sire any more except they please and then on the following day to recall this enactment of theirs as too hasty and a mere sputter though not unprovoked an effervescent well-intentioned set of senators too combustible where continual sparks are flying their history is a series of sputters and quarrels true desire to do their function fatal impossibility to do it 
denunciations, reprimandings of king's ministers, of traitors, supposed and real, hot rage and fulmination against fulminating emigrants, terror of Austrian Kaiser, of Austrian committee, in the Tuileries itself, rage and haunting terror, haste and dim desperate bewilderment, haste we say and yet the constitution had provided against haste no bill can be passed till it have been printed till it have been thrice read with intervals of eight days unless the assembly shall beforehand decree that there is urgency which accordingly the assembly scrupulous of the constitution never omits to do considering this and also considering that and then the other the assembly decrees always qu'il y a urgence, and thereupon, the assembly having decreed that there is urgence, is free to decree what indispensable distracted thing seems best to it. Two thousand and odd decrees, as men reckon, within eleven months. The haste of the constituent seemed great, but this is treble quick, for the time itself is rushing treble quick and they have to keep pace with that. Unhappy 745, true patriotic, but so combustible. Being fired, they must needs fling fire. Senate of touchwood and rockets, in a world of smoke-storm, with sparks wind-driven, continually flying. Or think, on the other hand, looking forward some months, of that scene they call Baiser de la Morette. The dangers of the country are now grown imminent, immeasurable. National Assembly, hope of France, is divided against itself. In such extreme circumstances, honey-mouthed Abbe Lamourette, new Bishop of Lyon, rises, whose name, Lamourette, signifies the sweetheart or Delilah Doxy. He rises, and with pathetic honeyed eloquence, calls on all august senators to forget mutual griefs and grudges, to swear a new oath and unite as brothers, whereupon they all, with vivats, embrace and swear, left side confounding itself with right, barren mountain rushing down to fruitful plain, pastoret into the arms of Condorcet, injured to the breast of injurer, with tears, and all swearing that whosoever wishes, either Fouillon, two-chamber monarchy, or extreme Jacobin republic, or anything but the constitution, and that only, shall be anathema maranatha. Touching to behold, for literally on the morrow morning they must again quarrel, driven by fate, and their sublime reconcilement is called derisively baiser de la morette or Delilah Kiss. Like fated Eteocles, Polynices brothers, embracing, though in vain, weeping that they must not love, that they must hate only, and die by each other's hands, or say, like doomed familiar spirits, ordered by art magic under penalties to do a harder than twist ropes of sand, to make the constitution march if the constitution would but march. Alas, the constitution will not stir. It falls on its face. They tremblingly lift it on end again. March, thou gold constitution. The constitution will not march. He shall march by... Blank, said kind Uncle Toby, and even swore. The corporal answered mournfully, He will never march in this world. A constitution, as we often say, will march when it images, if not the old habits and beliefs of the constituted, then accurately their rights, or better indeed, their mights. For these two, well understood, are they not one and the same? The old habits of France are gone. Her new rights and mights are not yet ascertained, except in paper theorem nor can be, in any sort, till she have tried, till she have measured herself in fell death-grip, and were it in utmost preternatural spasms of madness, with principalities and powers, with the upper and the under, 
internal and external, with the earth and Tophet and the very heaven. Then will she know. Three things bode ill for the marching of this French constitution, the French people, the French king, thirdly, the French noblesse, and an assembled European world. End of section 36 Section 37 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.53, Avignon. But quitting generalities, what strange fact is this, in the far southwest, towards which the eyes of all men do now, in the end of October, bend themselves, a tragical combustion, long smoking and smouldering, unluminous, has now burst into flame there. Hot is that southern Provencal blood. Alas, collisions, as was once said, must occur in a career of freedom. Different directions will produce such. Nay, different velocities in the same direction will. To much that went on there, history, busied elsewhere, would not specially give heed to troubles of Uzes, troubles of Nîmes, Protestant and Catholic, Patriot and Aristocrat, to troubles of Marseille, Montpellier, Arles, to Aristocrat Camp of Jalis, that wondrous real imaginary entity, now fading pale dim, then always again glowing forth deep-hued, in the imagination mainly ominous magical, an aristocrat picture of war done naturally. All this was a tragical deadly combustion, with plot and riot, tumult by night and by day, but a dark combustion, not luminous, not noticed, which now, however, one cannot help noticing. Above all places, the unluminous combustion in Avignon and the Comte Venissant was fierce, Papal Avignon, with its castle rising sheer over the Rhone stream, beautifulest town, with its purple vines and gold orange groves. Why must foolish old rhyming René, the last sovereign of Provence, bequeath it to the Pope and gold tiara, not rather to Louis XI, with the leaden virgin in his hatband? For good and for evil, popes, anti-popes, with their pomp, have dwelt in that castle of Avignon, rising sheer over the Rhone stream. There Laura de Sade went to hear mass, her Petrarch twanging and singing by the fountain of Vaucluse hard by, surely in a most melancholy manner. This was in the old days. And now in these new days, such issues do come from a squirt of the pen by some foolish rhyming René. After centuries, this is what we have. Jourdan coupe tête, leading to siege and warfare an army from three to fifteen thousand strong, called the Brigands of Avignon, which title they themselves accept, with the addition of an epithet, the Brave Brigands of Avignon. It is even so. Jourdan, the headsman, fled hither from that Châtelet inquest, from that insurrection of women, and began dealing in madder, but the scene was rife in other than dye-stuffs, so Jourdan shut his madder shop, and has risen, for he was the man to do it. The tile-beard of Jourdan is shaven off, his fat visage has got coppered and studied with black carbuncles, the Silenus trunk is swollen with drink and high living. He wears blue national uniform with epaulets, an enormous sabre, two horse pistols crossed in his belt, and other two smaller sticking from his pockets, styles himself general, and is the tyrant of men. Consider this one fact, O oh reader, and what sort of facts must have preceded it, must accompany it. Such things come of old René, and of the question which has arisen, whether Avignon cannot now cease wholly to be papal and become French and free. For some twenty-five months the confusion has lasted, say three months of arguing, 
then seven of raging, then finally some fifteen months now of fighting, and even of hanging. For already in February 1790, the papal aristocrats had set up four gibbets for a sign. But the people rose in June, in retributive frenzy, and, forcing the public hangman to act, hanged four aristocrats, on each papal gibbet a papal hayman. Then were Avignon emigrations, papal aristocrats emigrating over the Rhone River, demission of papal consul, flight, victory, re-entrance of papal legate, truce, and new onslaught, and the various turns of war. Petitions there were to National Assembly, Congresses of Townships, three score and odd townships voting for French reunion and the blessings of liberty, while some twelve of the smaller, manipulated by aristocrats, gave vote the other way, with shrieks and discord, township against township, town against town. Carpentras, long jealous of Avignon, is now turned out in open war with it, and Jordan Coupetet, your first general being killed in mutiny, closes his dye shop, and does there visibly, with siege artillery, above all with bluster and tumult, with the brave brigands of Avignon, beleaguer the rival town, for two months in the face of the world. Feats were done, doubt it not, far famed in parish history, but to universal history unknown. Gibbets we see rise on the one side and on the other, and wretched carcasses swinging there, a dozen in the row. Wretched mayor of Vaison, buried before dead. The fruitful seed fields lie unreaped, the vineyards trampled down. There is red cruelty, madness of universal collar and gall, havoc and anarchy everywhere a combustion most fierce, but unlucent, not to be noticed here. Finally, as we saw on the 14th of September last, the National Constituent Assembly, having sent commissioners and heard them, having heard petitions, held debates, month after month, ever since August 1789, and on the whole spent 30 sittings on this matter, did solemnly decree that Avignon, and the Comtat were incorporated with France, and His Holiness the Pope should have what indemnity was reasonable. And so hereby all is amnestied and finished. Alas, when madness of choler has gone through the blood of men, and gibbets have swung on this side and on that, what will a parchment decree and Lafayette amnesty do? Oblivious Lethe flows not above ground. Papal aristocrats and patriot brigands are still an eye-sorrow to each other, suspected, suspicious, in what they do and forbear. The august constituent assembly is gone but a fortnight when, on Sunday, the 16th morning of October 1791, the unquenched combustion suddenly becomes luminous, for anti-constitutional placards are up and the statue of the Virgin is said to have shed tears and grown red. Wherefore, on that morning, Patriot Lescouillet, one of our six leading patriots, having taken counsel with his brethren and General Jourdan, determines on going to church, in company with a friend or two, not to hear Mass, which he values little, but to meet all the papalists there in a body, nay, to meet that same weeping virgin, for it is the Cordelier Church, and give them a word of admonition. Adventurous errand, which has the fatalist issue. What Lescouillet's word of admonition might be, no history records. But the answer to it was a shrieking howl from the aristocrat papal worshippers, many of them women. A thousand-voiced shriek and menace, which, as Lescouillet did not fly, became a thousand-handed hustle and jostle, a thousand-footed kick, with tumblings and tramplings, with the pricking of seamstresses, stilettos, scissors, and female-pointed instruments. Horrible to behold, the ancient dead, and Petrarchan Laura, 
sleeping round it there, high altar and burning tapers looking down on it, the virgin quite tearless and of the natural stone colour. Lescuyer's friend or two rush off, like Job's messengers, for Jourdan and the national force. But heavy Jourdan will seize the town gates first, does not run treble fast as he might. On arriving at the Cordelier church, the church is silent, vacant. Lescuyer, all alone, lies there, swimming in his blood, at the foot of the high altar, pricked with scissors, trodden, massacred, gives one dumb sob, and gasps out his miserable life for evermore. Sight to stir the heart of any man, much more of many men, self-styled brigands of Avignon. The corpse of Lescuyer, stretched on a bier, the ghastly head girt with laurel, is borne through the streets, with many-voiced unmelodious ninia. Funeral wail, still deeper than it is loud. The copper face of Jourdan, of bereft patriotism, has grown black. Patriot municipality dispatches official narrative and tidings to Paris orders numerous or innumerable arrestments for inquest and perquisition. Aristocrats male and female are hailed to the castle, lie crowded in subterranean dungeons there, bemoaned by the hoarse rushing of the Rhone, cut out from help. So lie they, waiting inquest and perquisition, alas, with a Jourdan headsman for Generalissimo, with his copper face grown black, and armed brigand patriots chanting their nenia. The inquest is likely to be brief. On the next day, and the next, let municipality consent or not, a brigand court-martial establishes itself in the subterranean stories of the castle of Avignon. Brigand executioners, with naked sabre, waiting at the door for a brigand verdict. Short judgment, no appeal. There is brigand wrath and vengeance, not unrefreshed by brandy. Close by is the dungeon of the glacier or ice tower. There may be deeds done, for which language has no name. Darkness and the shadow of horrid cruelty envelops these castle dungeons, that glacier tower. Clear only that many have entered, that few have returned. Jourdan and the brigands supreme now over municipals, over all authorities, patriot or papal, reign in Avignon, waited on by terror and silence. The result of all which is that, on the 15th of November, 1791, we behold friend Don Martin, and subalterns beneath him, and General Choisy above him, with infantry and cavalry, and proper cannon carriages rattling in front, with spread banners to the sound of fife and drum, wend in a deliberate, formidable manner towards that sheer castle rock, towards those broad gates of Avignon, three new National Assembly commissioners following at safe distance in the rear. Avignon, summoned in the name of Assembly and Law, flings its gates wide open, Choisy with the rest, Don Martin and the Bons Enfants, good boys of Beauflamont, so they name these brave constitutional dragoons known to them of old, do enter amid shouts and scattered flowers, to the joy of all honest persons, to the terror only of Jourdan headsmen and the brigands. Nay, next we behold carbuncled, swollen Jourdan himself show copper face with sabre and four pistols, affecting to talk high engaging, meanwhile, to surrender the castle that instant. So the Choisy grenadiers enter with him there. They start and stop, passing that glacier, snuffing its horrible breath, with wild yell, with cries of, Cut the butcher down! And Jourdan has to whisk himself through secret passages and instantaneously vanish. Be the mystery of iniquity laid bare, then. A hundred and thirty corpses, of men, nay, of women and even children, for the trembling mother, hastily seized, could not leave her infant, lie heaped in that glacier, 
putrid, under putridities, the horror of the world. For three days there is mournful lifting out and recognition, amid the cries and movements of a passionate southern people, now kneeling in prayer, now storming in wild pity and rage. Lastly, there is solemn sepulture with muffled drums, religious requiem, and all the people's wail and tears. Their massacred rest now in holy ground, buried in one grave. And Jourdan Couptet, him also we behold again after a day or two, in flight through the most romantic Petrarchan hill country, vehemently spurring his nag, young Ligonet, a brisk youth of Avignon, with Choisy dragoons close in his rear. With such swollen mass of a rider, no nag can run to advantage. The tired nag, spur-driven, does take the river Sorg, but sticks in the middle of it, firm on that chiaro fondo di Sorga, and will proceed no further for spurring. Young Ligone dashes up, the copper face menaces and bellows, draws pistol, perhaps even snaps it is nevertheless seized by the collar, is tied firm, ankles under horse's belly, and driven back to Avignon, hardly to be saved from massacre on the streets there. Such is the combustion of Avignon and the south-west, when it becomes luminous. Long, loud debate is in the august legislative, in the mother society, as to what now shall be done with it. Amnesty, cry eloquent Vergniaud and all patriots. Let there be mutual pardon and repentance, restoration, pacification, and, if so might anyhow be, an end, which vote ultimately prevails. So the south-west smoulders and welters again in an amnesty, or non-remembrance, which, alas, cannot but remember, no lethe flowing above ground. Jourdan himself remains unchanged, gets loose again as one not yet gallows ripe, nay, as we transiently discern from the distance, is carried in triumph through the cities of the south. What things men carry! With which transient glimpse of a copper-faced portent faring in this manner through the cities of the south, we must quit these regions and let them smoulder. They want not their aristocrats, proud old nobles, not yet emigrated. Arles has its chiffon. So, in symbolic cant, they name that aristocrat secret association. Arles has its pavements piled up, by and by, into aristocrat barricades, against which Rebecchi, the hot clear patriot, must lead Marseille with cannon. The bar of iron has not yet risen to the top in the Bay of Marseilles, neither have these hot sons of the Phocians submitted to be slaves. By clear management and hot instance, Rebecchi dissipates that chiffon without bloodshed, restores the pavement of Arles. He sails in coast barks, this Rebecchi, scrutinizing suspicious martello towers, with the keen eye of patriotism marches overland with dispatch, singly or in force, to city after city, dim scouring far and wide, argues and, if it must be, fights, for there is much to do, jealous itself is looking suspicious, so that legislator Fauché, after debate on it, has to propose commissioners and a camp on the plain of Beaucaire, with or without result. Of all which, and much else, let us note only this small consequence, that young Barbaro, advocate, town clerk of Marseille, being charged to have these things remedied, arrived at Paris in the month of February 1792, the beautiful and brave, young Spartan, ripe in energy, not ripe in wisdom over whose black doom there shall flit nevertheless a certain ruddy fervour, streaks of bright southern tint, not wholly swallowed of death. Note also that the Roland of Lyon are again in Paris, for the second and final time. 
King's inspectorship is abrogated at Lyon as elsewhere. Roland has his retiring pension to claim, if attainable, has patriot friends to commune with, at lowest has a book to publish. That young Barbaro and the Rolands came together, that elderly Spartan Roland liked or even loved the young Spartan and was loved by him, one can fancy. And Madame? Breathe not, thou poison breath, evil speech. That soul is taintless, clear as the mirror sea. And yet if they too did look into each other's eyes, and each in silence, in tragical renunciance, did find that the other was all too lovely, Oniswa. She calls him beautiful as Antinous. He will speak elsewhere of that astonishing woman a Madame Doudon, or some such name, for Dumont does not recollect quite clearly, gives copious breakfast to the Brissotin deputies and us friends of freedom at her house in the Place Vendôme, with temporary celebrity, with graces and wreathed smiles, not without cost. There, amid wide babble and jingle, our plan of legislative debate is settled for the day, and much counselling held. Strict Roland is seen there, but does not go often. End of section 37。section 38 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.54 No Sugar Such are our inward troubles, seen in the cities of the South, extant, seen or unseen, in all cities and districts, North as well as South. For in all our aristocrats, more or less malignant, watched by patriotism, which again, being of various shades, from light fayettist Fuyon, down to deep sombre Jacobin, has to watch itself. Directories of departments, what we call county magistracies, being chosen by citizens of a too active class, are found to pull one way, municipalities, town magistracies, to pull the other way. In all places, too, are dissident priests, whom the legislative will have to deal with, contumacious individuals, working on that angriest of passions, plotting, enlisting for Koblenz, or suspected of plotting, fuel of a universal unconstitutional heat. What to do with them? They may be conscientious as well as contumacious. Gently they should be dealt with, and yet it must be speedily. In unilluminated La Vendée, the simple are like to be seduced by them. Many a simple peasant a Catalino, the wool dealer, wayfaring meditative with his wool packs in these hamlets, dubiously shakes his head. Two assembly commissioners went thither last autumn, considerate Jean Sonnet, not yet called to be a senator, Galois, an editorial man. These two, consulting with General de Maurier, spake and worked, softly, with judgment. They have hushed down the irritation and produced a soft report for the time. The general himself doubts not in the least, but he can keep peace there, being an able man. He passes these frosty months among the pleasant people of Niort, occupies tolerably handsome apartments in the castle of Niort, and tempers the minds of men. Why is there but one du Maurier? Elsewhere you find south or north, nothing but untempered, obscure jarring, which breaks forth ever and anon into open clamour of riot. Southern Perpignan has its toxin by torchlight, with rushing and onslaught. Northern Caen, not less, by daylight. With aristocrats ranged in arms at places of worship, departmental compromise proving impossible breaking into musketry and a plot discovered. Add hunger, too, 
for bread always dear is getting dearer not so much as sugar can be had for good reasons poor simono mayor of etampes in this northern region hanging out his red flag in some riot of grains is trampled to death by a hungry exasperated people what a trade this of mayor in these times mayor of saint denis hung at the lanterne by suspicion and dyspepsia as we saw long since mayor of vaison as we saw lately buried before dead and now this poor simono the tanner of etampes whose legal constitutionalism will not forget with factions suspicions want of bread and sugar it is verily what they call déchiré torn asunder this poor country france and all that is french for overseas too come bad news in black san domingo before that variegated glitter in the champs elysees was lit for an accepted constitution there had risen and was burning contemporary with it quite another variegated glitter and nocturnal fulgor had we known it of molasses and ardent spirits of sugar boileries plantations furniture cattle and men sky high the plain of cap francais one huge whirl of smoke and flame what a change here in these two years since that first box of tricolor cockades got through the custom house and atrabiliar creoles too rejoiced that there was a levelling of bastille levelling is comfortable as we often say levelling yet only down to oneself your pale white creoles have their grievances and your yellow quarteroons and your dark yellow mulattoes and your slaves suit black quarteroon auger friend of our parisian brissotin friends of the blacks felt for his share too that insurrection was the most sacred of duties so the tricolor cockades had fluttered and swashed only some three months on the creole hat when auger's signal conflagrations went aloft with the voice of rage and terror repressed doomed to die he took black powder or seed grains in the hollow of his hand this auger sprinkled a film of white ones on the top and said to his judges behold they are white then shook his hand and said where are the whites où sont les blancs so now in the autumn of seventeen ninety one looking from the sky windows of cap francais thick clouds of smoke girdle our horizon smoke in the day in the night fire preceded by fugitive shrieking white women by terror and rumour black demonized squadrons are massacring and harrying with nameless cruelty they fight and fire from behind thickets and coverts for the black man loves the bush they rush to the attack thousands strong with brandished cutlasses and fusils with caperings shoutings and vociferation which if the white volunteer company stands firm dwindle into staggerings into quick gabblement into panic flight at the first volley perhaps before it poor auger could be broken on the wheel this fire whirlwind too can be abated driven up into the mountains but san domingo is shaken as auger's seed grains were shaking writhing in long horrid death throes it is black without remedy and remains as african haiti a monition to the world oh my parisian friends is not this as well as regrators and fuyon plotters one cause of the astonishing dearth of sugar the grocer palpitant with drooping lip sees his sugar taxi weighed out by female patriotism in instant retail at the inadequate rate of twenty-five sous or thirteen pence a pound abstain from it yes ye patriot sections all ye jacobins abstain louvet and collot d'herbois so advise resolute to make the sacrifice though how shall literary men do without coffee 
abstain with an oath. That is the surest. Also, for like reason, must not breast and the shipping interest languish? Poor breast languishes, sorrowing, not without spleen. Denounces an aristocrat Bertrand Molville, traitorous aristocrat marine minister. Do not her ships and king's ships lie rotting piecemeal in harbour? Naval officers mostly fled, and on furlough too with pay. Little stirring there, if it be not the breast galleys, whip driven with their galley slaves. Alas, with some forty of her hapless Swiss soldiers of Chateau Vieux, among others. These forty Swiss, too mindful of Nancy, do now in their red wool caps tug sorrowfully at the oar, looking into the Atlantic brine, which reflects only their own sorrowful shaggy faces, and seem forgotten of hope. But on the whole, may we not say, in fugitive language, that the French constitution, which shall march, is very rheumatic, full of shooting internal pains, in joint and muscle, and will not march without difficulty. End of section 38section thirty nine of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point five five kings and emigrants extremely rheumatic constitutions have been known to march and keep on their feet though in a staggering sprawling manner for long periods in virtue of one thing only that the head were healthy. But this head of the French constitution, what King Louis is and cannot help being, readers already know. A king who cannot take the constitution, nor reject the constitution, nor do anything at all, but miserably ask, what shall I do? A king environed with endless confusions, in whose own mind is no germ of order haughty implacable remnants of noblesse struggling with humiliated repentant barnave lemets struggling in that obscure element of fetchers and carriers of half-pay braggarts from the cafe valois of chambermaids whisperers and subaltern officious persons fierce patriotism looking on all the while more and more suspicious from without what in such struggle can they do at best cancel one another and produce zero poor king barnave and your senatorial jocor speak earnestly into this ear bertrand molville and messengers from coblentz speak earnestly into that the poor royal head turns to the one side and to the other side can turn itself fixedly to no side let decency drop a veil over it sorrier misery was seldom enacted in the world this one small fact does it not throw the saddest light on much the queen is lamenting to madame compon what am i to do when they these bernaves get us advised to any step which the noblesse do not like then i am pouted at nobody comes to my card table the king's coucher is solitary in such a case of dubiety what is one to do go inevitably to the ground the king has accepted this constitution knowing beforehand that it will not serve he studies it and executes it in the hope mainly that it will be found inexecutable king's ships lie rotting in harbour their officers gone the armies disorganised robbers scour the highways which wear down unrepaired all public service lies slack and waste the executive makes no effort, or an effort only to throw the blame on the constitution, shamming death, faisant le mort. What constitution, use it in this manner, can march? Grow to disgust the nation, it will truly, unless you first grow to disgust the nation. It is Bertrand de Molville's plan, and his majesty's, the best they can form. Or if, after all, this best plan proved too slow, 
proved a failure. Provident of that, too, the queen, shrouded in deepest mystery, writes all day in cipher, day after day, to Koblenz. Engineer Gugula, he of the Knight of Spurs, whom the Lafayette amnesty has delivered from prison, rides and runs. Now and then, on fit occasion, a royal familiar visit can be paid to that salle de manege. An affecting, encouraging royal speech, sincere doubt it not for the moment, can be delivered there, and the senators all cheer and almost weep. At the same time, Malle Dupin has visibly ceased editing, and invisibly bears abroad a king's autograph, soliciting help from the foreign potentates. Unhappy Louis, do this thing, or else that other, if thou couldst. The thing which the king's government did do was to stagger distractedly from contradiction to contradiction, and wedding fire to water envelop itself in hissing and ashy steam. Danton and needy corruptible patriots are sopped with presents of cash. They accept the sop, they rise refreshed by it, and travel their own way. Nay, the king's government did likewise hire hand-clappers, or claqueurs, persons to applaud. Subterranean Rivarol has fifteen hundred men in king's pay, at the rate of some ten thousand pounds sterling per month, what he calls a staff of genius. Paragraph writers, placard journalists, two hundred and eighty applauders, at three shillings a day, one of the strangest staffs ever commanded by man, the muster rolls and account books of which still exist. Bertrand Molville himself, in a way he thinks very dexterous, contrives to pack the galleries of the legislative, gets sans culotte hired to go thither and applaud at a signal given, they fancying it was Petion that bid them, a device which was not detected for almost a week. Dexterous enough, as if a man finding the day fast decline should determine on altering the clock hands, that is a thing possible for him. Here too let us note an unexpected apparition of Philippe d'Orléans at court, his last at the levee of any king. D'Orléans, sometime in the winter month seemingly, has been appointed to that old first coveted rank of admiral, though only over ships rotting in port. The wished for comes too late. However, he waits on Bertrand Molville to give thanks, nay, to state that he would willingly thank his majesty in person, that in spite of all the horrible things men have said and sung, he is far from being his majesty's enemy. At bottom, how far? Bertrand delivers a message, brings about the royal interview, which does pass to the satisfaction of his majesty, d'Orléans seemingly clearly repentant, determined to turn over a new leaf. And yet next Sunday, what do we see? Next Sunday, says Bertrand, quote, he came to the king's levy, but the courtiers, ignorant of what had passed, the crowd of royalists who were accustomed to resort thither on that day specially to pay their court, gave him the most humiliating reception. They came pressing round him, managing, as if by mistake, to tread on his toes, to elbow him towards the door, and not let him enter again. He went downstairs to Her Majesty's apartments, where cover was laid. So soon as he showed face, sounds rose on all sides. Monsieur, take care of the dishes, as if he had carried poison in his pockets. The insults which his presence everywhere excited forced him to retire without having seen the royal family. The crowd followed him to the queen's staircase. In descending, he received a spitting, crasha, on the head, and some others on his clothes. Rage and spite were seen visibly painted on his face. End quote. As indeed, how could they miss to be? He imputes it all to the king and queen, who know nothing of it, who are even much grieved at it, and so descends to his chaos again. Bertrand was there at the chateau that day himself, and an eye-witness to these things. For the rest, non-durant priests, and the repression of them, 
will distract the king's conscience. Emigrant princes and noblesse will force him to double dealing. There must be veto on veto, amid the ever-waxing indignation of men. For patriotism, as we said, looks on from without, more and more suspicious. Waxing tempest, blast after blast, of patriot indignation from without, dim, inorganic whirl of intrigues, fatuities within. Inorganic, fatuitous, from which the eye turns away. Distael intrigues for her so gallant Narbonne to get him made war minister, and ceases not having got him made. The king shall fly to Rouen, shall there, with the gallant Narbonne, properly modify the constitution. This is the same brisk Narbonne who last year cut out from their entanglement by force of dragoons those poor fugitive royal ants. Men say he is at bottom their brother, or even more, so scandalous is scandal. He drives now with his distael rapidly to the armies, to the frontier towns, produces rose-coloured reports, not too credible, perorates, gesticulates, wavers poising himself on the top for a moment, seen of men, then tumbles, dismissed, washed away by the time flood. Also the fair Princess de Lombal intrigues, bosom friend of Her Majesty, to the angering of patriotism. Beautiful unfortunate, why did she ever return from England? Her small silver voice, what can it profit in that piping of the black world tornado? Which will whirl her, poor fragile bird of paradise, against grim rocks. Lombal and Distael intrigue visibly, apart or together, but who shall reckon how many others, and in what infinite ways, invisibly? Is there not what one may call an Austrian committee sitting invisible in the Tuileries, centre of an invisible anti-national spider-web, which, for we sleep among mysteries, stretches its threads to the ends of the earth. Journalist Carat has now the clearest certainty of it. To Brissotin patriotism, and France generally, it is growing more and more probable. O oh, reader, hast thou no pity for this constitution? Rheumatic shooting pains in its members, pressure of hydrocephaly and hysteric vapours on its brain, a constitution divided against itself, which will never march, hardly even stagger. Why were not Drouet and Procureur Sauce in their beds that unblessed Varenne night? Why did they not, in the name of heaven, let the Corf Berlin go whither it listed? Nameless incoherency, incompatibility, perhaps prodigies at which the world still shudders, had been spared. But now comes the third thing that bodes ill for the marching of this French constitution. Besides the French people and the French king, there is thirdly the assembled European world. It has become necessary now to look at that also. Fair France is so luminous, and round and round it is troublous Cimmerian night. Calonne, Breteuil, hover dim, far flown over-netting Europe with intrigues. From Turin to Vienna, to Berlin and utmost Petersburg in the frozen north. Great Burke has raised his great voice long ago, eloquently demonstrating that the end of an epoch is come, to all appearance the end of civilised time. Him many answer, Camille de Moulin, Clute's speaker of mankind, Payne, the rebellious needleman, and honourable Gallic vindicators in that country and in this. But the great Burke remains unanswerable. The age of chivalry is gone, and could not but go, having now produced the still more indomitable age of hunger. Alters enough of the dubois Rouen sort, changing to the Goebel and Tolleyron sort, are faring by rapid transmutation to, shall we say, the right proprietor of them. 
French game and French game preservers did alight on the cliffs of Dover with cries of distress. Who will say that the end of much is not come? A set of mortals has risen who believe that truth is not a printed speculation, but a practical fact, that freedom and brotherhood are possible in this earth, supposed always to be Belial's, which the supreme quack was to inherit. Who will say that church, state, throne, altar are not in danger, that the sacred strong box itself, last palladium of effete humanity, may not be blasphemously blown upon and its padlocks undone? The poorer constituent assembly might act with what delicacy and diplomacy it would, declare that it abjured meddling with its neighbours, foreign conquest, and so forth. But from the first this thing was to be predicted, that old Europe and new France could not subsist together. A glorious revolution oversetting state prisons and feudalism, publishing with outburst of federative canon in face of all the earth, that appearance is not reality, how shall it subsist amid governments which, if appearance is not reality, are one knows not what? In death feud and internecine wrestle and battle, it shall subsist with them, not otherwise. Rights of man, printed on cotton handkerchiefs in various dialects of human speech, pass over to the Frankfurt Fair. What say we, Frankfurt Fair? They have crossed Euphrates and the fabulous Hydaspis, wafted themselves beyond the Ural, Altai, Himalaya, struck off from wood stereotypes in angular picture writing. They are jabbered and jingled off in China and Japan. Where will it stop? Qianlong smells mischief. Not the remotest Dalai Lama shall now need his dough pills in peace hateful to us, as is the night. Bestir yourselves, ye defenders of order. They do bestir themselves, all kings and kinglets, with their spiritual temporal array, are astir, their brows clouded with menace. Diplomatic emissaries fly swift, conventions, privy conclaves assemble, and wise wigs wag, taking what counsel they can. Also, as we said, the pamphleteer draws pen on this side and that. Zealous fists beat the pulpit drum, not without issue. Did not iron Birmingham, shouting Church and King, itself knew not why, burst out last July into rage, drunkenness and fire? And your priestlies and the like, dining there on that Bastille day, get the maddest singeing scandalous to consider, in which same days, as we can remark, high potentates, Austrian and Prussian, with emigrants, were faring towards Pilnitz in Saxony. There, on the 27th of August, they, keeping to themselves what further secret treaty there might or might not be, did publish their hopes and their threatenings, their declaration that it was the common cause of kings. Where a will to quarrel is, there is a way. Our readers remember that Pentecost night, 4th of August, 1789, when feudalism fell in a few hours. The National Assembly, in abolishing feudalism, promised that compensation should be given, and did endeavour to give it. Nevertheless, the Austrian Kaiser answers that his German princes, for their part, cannot be unfeudalized that they have possessions in French Alsace and feudal rights secured to them, for which no conceivable compensation will suffice. So this of the possessioned princes, Prince Possessionné, is bandied from court to court, covers acres of diplomatic paper at this day, a weariness to the world. Kaunitz argues from Vienna. De Lessard responds from Paris though perhaps not sharply enough. The Kaiser and his possessioned princes will too evidently come and take compensation, 
so much as they can get. Nay, might one not partition France, as we have done Poland and are doing, and so pacify it with a vengeance? From south to north, for actually it is the common cause of kings. Swedish Gustav, sworn knight of the Queen of France, will lead coalized armies, had not Ankerstrom treasonously shot him, for indeed there were griefs nearer home. Austria and Prussia speak at Pilnitz, all men intensely listening. Imperial rescripts have gone out from Turin. There will be secret convention at Vienna. Catherine of Russia beckons approvingly, will help were she ready. Spanish bourbon stirs amid his pillows. From him too, even from him, shall there come help. Lean Pitt, the minister of preparatives, looks out from his watchtower in St. James's in a suspicious manner. Councillors plotting, calons, dim hovering. Alas, sergeants, rub-a-dubbing openly through all manner of German market towns, collecting ragged valour. Look where you will, immeasurable obscurantism is girdling this fair France, which again will not be girdled by it. Europe is in travail, pang after pang. What a shriek was that of Pilnitz. The birth will be war. Nay, the worst feature of the business is this last, still to be named. The emigrants at Koblenz, so many thousands ranking there, in bitter hate and menace, king's brothers, all princes of the blood, except wicked d'Orléans, your duelling de Kestri, your eloquent Casales, bull-headed Marseigne, a war-god Broglie, distaff seigneur, insulted officers, all that have ridden across the Rhine-stream, d'Artois welcoming Abbé Maury with a kiss, and clasping him publicly to his own royal heart. Emigration, flowing over the frontiers, now in drops, now in streams, in various humours of fear, of petulance, rage and hope, ever since those first Bastille days, when d'Artois went to shame the citizens of Paris, has swollen to the size of a phenomenon of the world. Koblenz is become a small extranational Versailles, a Versailles in partibus, breeding, intriguing, favouritism, strumpetocracy itself, they say, goes on there. All the old activities on a small scale, quickened by hungry revenge. Enthusiasm of loyalty, of hatred and hope, has risen to a high pitch, as in any Koblenz tavern you may hear in speech and in singing. Marie assists in the interior council. Much is decided on. For one thing, they keep lists of the dates of your emigrating. A month sooner or a month later determines your greater or your less right to the coming division of the spoil. Casales himself, because he had occasionally spoken with a constitutional tone, was looked on coldly at first. So pure are our principles. And arms are a hammering at Liège, three thousand horses ambling hitherward from the fairs of Germany, cavalry enrolling, likewise foot soldiers in blue coat, red waistcoat, and nankeen trousers. They have their secret domestic correspondences as their open foreign, with disaffected crypto-aristocrats, with contumacious priests with Austrian committee in the Tuileries. Deserters are spirited over by assiduous crimps. Royal Allemand is gone almost wholly. Their route of march towards France and the division of the spoil is marked out where the Kaiser wants ready. It is said they mean to poison the sources, but, adds patriotism, making report of it, they will not poison the source of liberty whereat on applaudi, we cannot but applaud. Also they have manufactories of false assignats, and men that circulate in the interior, distributing and dispersing the same. One of these we denounce now to legislative patriotism. 
a man Lebrun by name, about thirty years of age, with blonde hair and in quantity, has, only for the time being, surely, a black eye, oeil poché, goes in a whisky with a black horse, always keeping his gig. Unhappy emigrants, it was their lot and the lot of France. They are ignorant of much that they should know, of themselves, of what is around them. A political party that knows not when it is beaten may become one of the fatalist of things to itself and to all. Nothing will convince these men that they cannot scatter the French Revolution at the first blast of their war trumpet, that the French Revolution is other than a blustering effervescence of brawlers and spouters, which, at the flash of chivalrous broadswords, at the rustle of gallows ropes, will burrow itself in dens the deeper the welcomer, but alas, what man does know and measure himself and the things that are round him? Else, where were the need of physical fighting at all? Never, till they are cleft asunder, can these heads believe that a sonscolotic arm has any vigour in it. Cleft asunder, it will be too late to believe. One may say, without spleen against his poor erring brothers of any side, that, above all other mischiefs this of the emigrant nobles acted fatally on france could they have known could they have understood in the beginning of seventeen eighty nine a splendour and a terror still surrounded them the conflagration of their chateau kindled by months of obstinacy went out after the fourth of august and might have continued out had they at all known what to defend what to relinquish as indefensible. They were still a graduated hierarchy of authorities, or the accredited similitude of such. They sat there, uniting king with commonalty, transmitting and translating gradually, from degree to degree, the command of the one into the obedience of the other, rendering command and obedience still possible. Had they understood their place and what to do in it, this French Revolution, which went forth explosively in years and in months, might have spread itself over generations, and not a torture death, but a quiet euthanasia have been provided for many things. But they were proud and high, these men. They were not wise to consider. They spurned all from them. In disdainful hate, they drew the sword and flung away the scabbard. France has not only no hierarchy of authorities to translate command into obedience. Its hierarchy of authorities has fled to the enemies of France, calls loudly to the enemies of France to interfere armed, who want but a pretext to do that. Jealous kings and kaisers might have looked on long, meditating interference, yet afraid and ashamed to interfere. But now do not the king's brothers and all French nobles, dignitaries and authorities that are free to speak, which the king himself is not, passionately invite us in the name of right and of might? Ranked at Koblenz, from fifteen to twenty thousand, stand now brandishing their weapons with the cry, on on yes monsieur you shall on and divide the spoil according to your dates of emigrating of all which things a poor legislative assembly and patriot france is informed by denunciant friend by triumphant foe soulot's pamphlets of the rivarol staff of genius circulate heralding supreme hope de rosoise placards tapestry the walls champ du coq crow's day pecked at by tonions ami des citoyennes king's friend royal ami du roi can name in exact arithmetical ciphers the contingents of the various invading potentates in all four hundred and nineteen thousand foreign fighting men with fifteen thousand emigrants 
not to reckon these your daily and hourly desertions which an editor must daily record of whole companies and even regiments crying vive le roi vive la reine and marching over with banners spread lies all and wind yet to patriotism not wind nor alas one day to royaux patriotism therefore may brawl and babble yet a little while but its hours are numbered europe is coming with four hundred and nineteen thousand and the chivalry of france the gallows one may hope will get its own End of section thirty nine Section forty of the French Revolution, Volume two, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter two point five six Brigands and Jealous. We shall have war then, and on what terms? With an executive pretending, really with less and less deceptiveness now, to be dead casting even a wishful eye towards the enemy on such terms we shall have war public functionary in vigorous action there is none if it be not rivarol with his staff of genius and two hundred and eighty applauders the public service lies waste the very tax-gatherer has forgotten his cunning in this and the other provincial board of management Directoire du département, it is found advisable to retain what taxes you can gather to pay your own inevitable expenditures. Our revenue is assigné, emission on emission of paper money, and the army, our three grand armies of Rochambeau, of Leuchner, of Lafayette, lean disconsolate over these three grand armies watching the frontiers there, three flights of long-necked cranes in molting time, wretched, disobedient, disorganized, who never saw fire, the old generals and officers gone across the Rhine, War Minister Narbonne, he of the rose-coloured reports, solicits recruitments, equipments, money, always money, threatens, since he can get none, to take his sword, which belongs to himself, and go serve his country with that. The question of questions is, what shall be done? Shall we, with a desperate defiance, which fortune sometimes favours, draw the sword at once, in the face of this inrushing world of emigration and obscurantism? Or wait, and temporise, and diplomatise, till, if possible, our resources mature themselves a little. And yet again, are our resources growing towards maturity, or growing the other way? Dubious. The ablest patriots are divided. Brissot and his Brissotin, or Girondin, in the legislative, cry aloud for the former defiant plan. Robespierre, in the Jacobin, pleads as loud for the latter dilatory one with responses, even with mutual reprimands, distracting the mother of patriotism. Consider also what agitated breakfasts there may be at Madame Doudon's in the Place Vendôme. The alarm of all men is great. Help, ye patriots, and, oh, at least agree, for the hour presses. Frost was not yet gone when, in that tolerably handsome apartment of the castle of Niort, there arrived a letter. General de Mourier must to Paris. It is War Minister Narbonne that writes. The general shall give counsel about many things. In the month of February 1792, Brissotin friends welcome their de Mourier polymetis comparable really to an antique Ulysses in modern costume, quick, elastic, shifty, insuppressible, a many-counselled man. Let the reader fancy this fair France with a whole Sumerian Europe girdling her, rolling in on her, black, 
to burst in red thunder of war, fair France herself, hand shackled and foot shackled in the weltering complexities of this social clothing or constitution which they have made for her, a France that, in such constitution, cannot march. And hunger, too, and plotting aristocrats and excommunicating dissident priests, the man Le Brun by name, urging his black whisky visible to the eyes and still more terrible in his invisibility, engineer Gugola with Queen's cipher riding and running. The excommunicatory priests give new trouble in the Maine and Loire. La Vendée, nor Catalino, the wool dealer, has not ceased grumbling and rumbling. Nay, behold, Jalis itself once more. How often does that real imaginary camp of the fiend require to be extinguished? For near two years now it has waned faint and again waxed bright in the bewildered soul of patriotism. Actually, if patriotism knew it, one of the most surprising products of nature working with art. Royalist seigneurs, under this or the other pretext, assemble the simple people of these Cévennes mountains, men not unused to revolt, and with heart for fighting, could their poor heads be got persuaded. The royalist seigneur harangues, harping mainly on the religious string, True priests maltreated, false priests intruded, Protestants, once dragooned, now triumphing, things sacred given to the dogs, and so produces from the pious mountaineer throat rough growlings. Shall we not testify then, ye brave hearts of the Cévennes, march to the rescue? Holy religion, duty to God and King. Si fait, si fait. Just so, just so, answer the brave hearts always. Mais il y a de bien bonnes choses dans la révolution. But there are many good things in the revolution too. And so the matter, cajole as we may, will only turn on its axis, not stir from the spot, and remains theatrical merely. Nevertheless, deepen your cajolery. Harp quick and quicker, you royalist seigneur. With a deadlift effort, you may bring it to that. In the month of June next, this Camp of Jalis will step forth as a theatricality suddenly become real. Two thousand strong, and with the boast that it is seventy thousand. Most strange to see, with flags flying, bayonets fixed, with proclamation and d'Artois commission of civil war. Let some Rebecki, or other the like hot clear patriot, let some Lieutenant Colonel Aubry, if Rebecki is busy elsewhere, raise instantaneous national guards, and disperse and dissolve it, and blow the old castle asunder, that so, if possible, we hear of it no more. In the months of February and March, it is recorded, the terror, especially of rural France, had risen even to the transcendental pitch, not far from madness. In town and hamlet is rumour of war, massacre, that Austrians, aristocrats, above all that the brigands, are close by. Men quit their houses and huts, rush fugitive, shrieking, with wife and child, they know not whither. Such a terror, the eyewitnesses say, never fell in a nation, nor shall again fall, even in reigns of terror expressly so called. The countries of the Loire, all the central and southeast regions, start up distracted, simultaneously, as by an electric shock. For indeed, grain too gets scarcer and scarcer, the people barricade the entrances of towns, pile stones in the upper stories. The women prepare boiling water from moment to moment expecting the attack. In the country, the alarm bell rings incessant. Troops of peasant gathered by it scour the highways, seeking an imaginary enemy. They are armed mostly with scythes stuck in wood, 
and arriving in wild troops at the barricaded towns, are themselves sometimes taken for brigands. So rushes old France. Old France is rushing down. What the end will be is known to no mortal. That the end is near, all mortals may know. End of section 40、section、forty one of the French Revolution, Volume Two, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter Two Point Five Seven. Constitution will not march. To all which our poor legislative, tied up by an unmarching constitution, can oppose nothing by way of remedy. But mere bursts of parliamentary eloquence, they go on debating, denouncing, objurgating, loud weltering chaos which devours itself. But their two thousand and odd decrees, reader, these happily concern not thee nor me. Mere occasional decrees, foolish and not foolish, sufficient for that day was its own evil. Of the whole two thousand, there are not now half a score, and these mostly blighted in the bud by royal veto that will profit or disprofit us. On the seventeenth of January, the legislative, for one thing, got its high court, its haute cour, set up at Orleans. The theory had been given by the constituent in May last, but this is the reality. A court for the trial of political offences, a court which cannot want work. To this it was decreed that there needed no royal acceptance, therefore that there could be no veto. Also priests can now be married. Ever since last October, a patriotic, adventurous priest had made bold to marry himself. Then, and not thinking this enough, came to the bar with his new spouse. That the whole world might hold honeymoon with him, and a law be obtained. Less joyful are the laws against refractory priests, and yet no less needful. Decrees on priests and decrees on emigrants. These are the two brief series of decrees worked out with endless debate, and then cancelled by veto, which mainly concern us here. For an august national assembly must needs conquer these refractories, clerical or laic, and thumbscrew them into obedience. Yet behold, always as you turn your legislative thumbscrew and will press and even crush till refractories give way, king's veto steps in with magical paralysis, and your thumbscrew, hardly squeezing, much less crushing, does not act. Truly, a melancholy set of decrees, a pair of sets, paralysed by veto. First, under date the twenty eighth of October, seventeen ninety one, we have legislative proclamation issued by Herald and Bill Sticker, inviting Monsieur, the King's brother, to return within two months under penalties. To which invitation Monsieur replies nothing, or indeed replies by newspaper parody. Inviting the august legislative to return to common sense within two months under penalties, whereupon the legislative must take stronger measures. So on the ninth of November we declare all emigrants to be suspect of conspiracy, and in brief to be outlawed if they have not returned at New Year's Day. Will the king say veto? That triple impost shall be levied on these men's properties, or even their properties be put in sequestration, one can understand. But further, on New Year's Day itself, not an individual having returned, we declare, and with fresh emphasis, some fortnight later again declare that Monsieur is déchu, forfeited of his eventual heirship to the crown. Nay more. That Conde, Colon, and a considerable list of others are accused of high treason, and shall be judged by our High Court of Orleans.
veto. Then again as to non-jurant priests. It was decreed in November last that they should forfeit what pensions they had, be put under inspection, under surveillance, and, if need were, be banished. Veto. A still sharper turn is coming, but to this also the answer will be veto. Veto after veto. Your thumb screw paralysed. Gods and men may see that the legislative is in a false position, as, alas, who is in a true one? Voices already murmur for a national convention. This poor legislative, spurred and stung into action by a whole France and a whole Europe, cannot act, can only objurgate and perorate, with stormy motions and motion in which is no way with effervescence, with noise, and fuliginous fury. What scenes in that national hall, President jingling his inaudible bell, or, as utmost signal of distress, clapping on his hat, the tumult subsiding in twenty minutes, and this or the other indiscreet member sent to the abbey prison for three days. Suspected persons must be summoned and questioned. Old Monsieur de Sombray of the Invalide has to give account of himself and why he leaves his gates open. Unusual smoke rose from the Sevres pottery, indicating conspiracy. The potters explained that it was Necklace Lamotte's memoirs, bought up by Her Majesty, which they were endeavouring to suppress by fire, which nevertheless he that runs may still read. Again it would seem Duc de Brissac and the King's Constitutional Guard are making cartridges secretly in the cellars. A set of royalists, pure and impure, black cutthroats, many of them, picked out of gaming houses and sinks, in all six thousand instead of eighteen hundred, who evidently gloom on us every time we enter the chateau. Wherefore, with infinite debate, let Brissac and King's Guard be disbanded. Disbanded accordingly they are, after only two months of existence, for they did not get on foot till March of this same year. So ends briefly the King's new constitutional maison militaire. He must now be guarded by mere Swiss and blue nationals again. It seems the lot of constitutional things. New constitutional maison civile he would never even establish, much as Barnave urged it. Old resident duchesses sniffed at it and held aloof. On the whole, Her Majesty thought it not worth while. The noblesse would so soon be back triumphant. Or, looking still into this national hall and its scenes, behold Bishop Tornay, a constitutional prelate, not of severe morals, demanding that religious costumes and such caricatures be abolished. Bishop Tornay warms, catches fire, finishes by untying and indignantly flinging on the table, as if for gauge or bet, his own pontifical cross, which cross at any rate is instantly covered by the cross of Te Deum Fauché, then by other crosses and insignia, till all are stripped, this clerical senator clutching off his skull-cap, that other his frill-collar, lest fanaticism return on us. Quick is the movement here, and then so confused, unsubstantial, you might call it almost spectral, pallid, dim, inane, like the kingdoms of Dis. Unruly Liguet, shrunk to a kind of spectre for us, pleads here, some cause that he has, amid rumour and interruption, which excel human patience. He tears his papers and withdraws, the irascible, adust little man. Nay, honourable members will tear their papers, being effervescent. Merlin of Thionville tears his papers, crying, So the people cannot be saved by you. Nor are deputations wanting deputations of sections, 
generally with complaint and denouncement, always with patriot fervour of sentiment. Deputation of women, pleading that they also may be allowed to take pikes and exercise in the Champ de Mars. Why not, ye Amazons, if it be in you? Then occasionally, having done our message and got answer, we defile through the hall, singing, Saira, or rather roll and whirl through it, dancing our ronde patriotique the while, our new carmagnol, or pyrrhic war dance and liberty dance. Patriot Huguenin, ex-advocate, ex-carabineer, ex-clerk of the barriers, comes deputed with Saint-Antoine at his heels, denouncing anti-patriotism, famine, forestalment, and man-eaters. Asks an august legislative, Is there not a toxin in your hearts against these mangeurs d'hommes? But above all things, for this is a continual business, the legislative has to reprimand the king's ministers. Of his majesty's ministers we have said hitherto, and say, next to nothing. Still more spectral these. Sorrowful, of no permanency any of them, none at least since Montmorin vanished. The eldest of the king's council is occasionally not ten days old, Fillon constitutional, as your respectable Cahier de Gerville, as your respectable unfortunate de Lessard, or royalist constitutional, as Montmorin, last friend of Necker, or aristocrat, as Bertrand Molleville. They flit there, phantom-like, in the huge simmering confusion. Poor shadows, dashed in the racking winds, powerless, without meaning whom the human memory needs not charge itself with. But how often, we say, are these poor Majesty's ministers summoned over to be questioned, tutored, nay, threatened, almost bullied? They answer what, with adroitous simulation and casuistry, they can, of which a poor legislative knows not what to make. One thing only is clear that Cimmerian Europe is girdling us in, that France, not actually dead, surely, cannot march. Have a care, ye ministers. Sharp Gadet transfixes you with cross questions, with sudden advocate conclusions. The sleeping tempest that is in Vergniaud can be awakened. Restless Brissot brings up reports, accusations, endless thin logic. It is the man's high day even now. Condorcet redacts with his firm pen our address of the Legislative Assembly to the French nation. Fiery Max Isnach, who for the rest will carry not fire and sword on those Cimmerian enemies, but liberty, is for declaring that we hold ministers responsible and that by responsibility we mean death Nous entendons la mort. For verily it grows serious, the time presses, and traitors there are. Bertrand Molleville has a smooth tongue, the known aristocrat, gall in his heart. How his answers and explanations flow ready, Jesuitic, plausible to the ear. But perhaps the notablest is this, which befell once when Bertrand had done answering and was withdrawn. Scarcely had the august assembly begun considering what was to be done with him, when the hall fills with smoke, thick, sour smoke. No oratory, only wheezing and barking, irremediable, so that the august assembly has to adjourn. A miracle? Typical miracle? One knows not. Only this, one seems to know, that the keeper of the stoves was appointed by Bertrand, or by some underling of his. O oh, fuliginous, confused kingdom of Dis, with thy tantalous Ixion toils, with thy angry fire floods, and streams named of lamentation, why hast thou not thy leafy too, that so one might finish?
End of section 41. Section 42 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.5, 8. The Jacobin. Nevertheless, let not patriotism despair. Have we not, in Paris at least, a virtuous pétillon, a wholly patriotic municipality? Virtuous Pétion, ever since November, is mayor of Paris. In our municipality, the public, for the public is now admitted to, may behold an energetic Danton. Further, an epigrammatic, slow, sure Manuel. A resolute, unrepentant Bio Varenne, of Jesuit breeding. Talion, able editor. And nothing but patriots, better or worse. So ran the November elections, to the joy of most citizens. Nay, the very court supported Pétion rather than Lafayette. And so Bailly and his Fuyon, long waning like the moon, had to withdraw then, making some sorrowful obeisance, into extinction, or indeed into worse, into lurid half-light, grimmed by the shadow of that red flag of theirs, and bitter memory of the Champ de Mars. How swift is the progress of things and men! Not now does Lafayette, as on that Federation Day, when his noon was, press his sword firmly on the Fatherland's altar, and swear in sight of France. Ah, no, he, waning and setting ever since that hour, hangs now, disastrous, on the edge of the horizon, commanding one of those three molting crane flights of armies, in a most suspected, unfruitful, uncomfortable manner. But at most, cannot patriotism, so many thousands strong in this metropolis of the universe, help itself? Has it not right hands, pikes, hammering of pikes, which was not to be prohibited by Mayor Bailly, has been sanctioned by Mayor Pétion, sanctioned by Legislative Assembly? How not, when the king's so-called constitutional guard was making cartridges in secret? Changes are necessary for the National Guard itself. This whole Fouillon aristocrat staff of the guard must be disbanded. Likewise, citizens without uniform may surely rank in the guard, the pike beside the musket, in such a time. The active citizen and the passive who can fight for us, are they not both welcome? O oh, my patriot friends, indubitably, yes. Nay, the truth is, patriotism throughout, were it never so white-frilled, logical, respectable, must either lean itself heartily on sans the black, bottomless, or else vanish, in the frightfulest way, to limbo. Thus some, with upturned nose, will altogether sniff and disdain sans others will lean heartily on it. Nay, others again will lean what we call heartlessly on it. Three sorts, each sort with a destiny corresponding. In such point of view, however, have we not for the present a volunteer ally stronger than all the rest, namely hunger? Hunger and what rushing of panic terror this and the sum total of our other miseries may bring. For sansculottism grows by what all other things die off. Stupid Peter Bailly almost made an epigram, though unconsciously, and with the patriot world laughing not at it but at him, when he wrote, Tout va bien ici, le pain manque. All goes well here, victuals not to be had. Neither, if you knew it, is patriotism without her constitution that can march her not impotent parliament, or call it ecumenic council and general assembly of the Jean-Jacques churches, the mother society, namely. Mother society with her three hundred full-grown daughters, with what we can call little granddaughters trying to walk, in every village of France, numerable, as Burke thinks, by the hundred thousand. This is the true constitution, made not by twelve hundred august senators, but by nature herself, and has grown unconsciously 
out of the wants and the efforts of these twenty-five millions of men. They are lords of the articles, our Jacobins. They originate debates for the legislative, discuss peace and war, settle beforehand what the legislative is to do, greatly to the scandal of philosophical men and of most historians, who do in that judge naturally and yet not wisely. A governing power must exist. Your other powers here are simulacra. This power is it. Great is the mother society. She has had the honour to be denounced by Austrian Kaunitz and is all the dearer to patriotism. By fortune and valour, she has extinguished Fiontism itself, at least the Fion club. This latter, high as it once carried its head, she, on the 18th of February, has the satisfaction to see shut, extinct, patriots having gone thither with tumult to hiss it out of pain. The Mother Society has enlarged her locality, stretches now over the whole nave of the church. Let us glance in with the worthy Toulonjon, our old ex-constituent friend, who happily has eyes to see. Quote, the nave of the Jacobin church, says he, is changed into a vast circus, the seats of which mount up circularly like an amphitheatre to the very groin of the domed roof, a high pyramid of black marble built against one of the walls, which was formerly a funeral monument, has alone been left standing. It serves now as back to the office bearer's bureau. Here, on an elevated platform, sit president and secretaries, behind and above them the white busts of Mirabeau, of Franklin, and various others, nay, finally, of Marat. Facing this is the tribune, raised till it is midway between floor and groin of the dome, so that the speaker's voice may be in the centre. From that point thunder the voices which shake all Europe. Down below, in silence, are forging the thunderbolts and the firebrands. Penetrating into this huge circuit, where all is out of measure, gigantic, the mind cannot repress some movement of terror and wonder. The imagination recalls those dread temples which poetry of old had consecrated to the avenging deities. End quote. Scenes, too, are in this Jacobin amphitheatre, had history time for them. Flags of the three free peoples of the universe, trinal brotherly flags of England, America, France, have been waved here in concert by London deputation of Whigs or Way and their club on this hand, and by young French citizenesses on that, beautiful sweet-tongued female citizens who solemnly send over salutation and brotherhood, also tricolour stitched by their own needle, and finally ears of wheat, while the dome rebellows with Vive les trois peuples libres from all throats, a most dramatic scene. Demoiselle Terroin recites from that tribune in Midair her persecutions in Austria, comes leaning on the arm of Joseph Chenier, poet Chenier, to demand liberty for the hapless Swiss of Chateauvieux. Be of hope, ye forty Swiss, tugging there in the breast waters not forgotten. Deputy Brissot perorates from that tribune, de Molin, our wicked Camille, interjecting audibly from below, Coquin! Here, though, oftener in the Cordelier, reverberates the lion voice of Danton. Grim Billot Varenne is here. Collot d'Herbois, pleading for the forty Swiss, tearing a passion to rags. Apothematic Manuel winds up in this pithy way. A minister must perish. To which the amphitheatre responds, Dus, dus, all, all. But the chief priest and speaker of this place, as we said, is Robespierre, the long-winded, incorruptible man. What spirit of patriotism dwelt in men in those times, this one fact, it seems to us, will evince that fifteen hundred human creatures, not bound to it, sat quiet under the oratory of Robespierre. Nay, listened nightly, hour after hour, applausive, and gaped as for the word of life. 
more insupportable individual one would say seldom opened his mouth in any tribune acrid implacable impotent dull drawling barren as the harmattan wind he pleads in endless earnest shallow speech against immediate war against woollen caps or bonnet rouge against many things and is the trismegistus and dalai lama of patriot men whom nevertheless a shrill-voiced little man yet with fine eyes and a broad beautifully sloping brow rises respectfully to controvert he is say the newspaper reporters monsieur Louvet, author of the charming romance of faublas steady ye patriots pull not yet two ways with a france rushing panic-stricken in the rural districts and a cimmerian europe storming in on you End of section 42section forty three of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point five nine minister ronald about the vernal equinox however one unexpected gleam of hope does burst forth on patriotism the appointment of a thoroughly patriot ministry this also his majesty among his innumerable experiments of wedding fire to water will try quod bonum sit madame doudon's breakfasts have jingled with a new significance not even genevese dumont but had a word in it finally on the fifteenth and onwards to the twenty-third of march seventeen ninety two when all is negotiated this is the blessed issue this patriot ministry that we see general de Murier, with the foreign portfolio shall ply kaunitz and the kaiser in another style than did poor de Lessart, whom indeed we have sent to our high court of orleans for his sluggishness war minister narbonne is washed away by the time flood poor chevalier de grave chosen by the court is fast washing away then shall austere servant able engineer officer mount suddenly to the war department genevese clavier sees an old omen realized passing the finance hotel long years ago as a poor genevese exile it was borne wondrously on his mind that he was to be finance minister and now he is it and his poor wife given up by the doctors rises and walks not the victim of nerves but their vanquisher and above all our minister of the interior roland de la platriere he of lyons so have the brissotin public or private opinion and breakfasts in the place vendome decided it strict roland compared to a quaker on the manche or sunday quaker goes to kiss hands at the tuileries in round hat and sleek hair his shoes tied with mere ribbon or ferrat. The supreme usher twitches de Murier aside. Quoi, monsieur, no buckles to his shoes? Ah, monsieur, answers de Murier, glancing towards the ferrat. All is lost, tout est perdu. And so our fair Roland removes from her upper floor in the Rue Saint Jacques to the sumptuous saloons once occupied by Madame Necker nay still earlier it was calon that did all this gilding it was he who ground these lustres venetian mirrors who polished this inlaying this veneering or or moulou and made it by rubbing of the proper lamp an aladdin's palace and now behold he wanders dim flitting over europe half drowned in the rhine stream scarcely saving his papers vos non vobis the fair Roland, equal to either fortune, has her public dinner on Fridays, the ministers all there in a body. She withdraws to her desk, the cloth once removed, and seems busy writing, nevertheless loses no word. If, for example, Deputy Brissot and Minister Clavier get too hot in argument, 
she not without timidity yet with a cunning gracefulness will interpose deputy Priso's head they say is getting giddy in this sudden height as feeble heads do envious men insinuate that the wife roland is minister and not the husband it is happily the worst they have to charge her with for the rest let whose head soever be getting giddy it is not this brave woman's serene and queenly here as she was of old in her own hired garret of the ursuline convent she who has quietly shelled french beans for her dinner being led to that as a young maiden by quiet insight and computation and knowing what that was and what she was such a one will also look quietly on ormolu and veneering not ignorant of these either calon did the veneering he gave dinners here old bussenval diplomatically whispering to him and was great yet calon we saw at last walk with long strides necker next and where now is necker us also a swift change has brought hither a swift change will send us hence not a palace but a caravansera so wags and wavers this unrestful world day after day month after month the streets of paris and all cities roll daily their oscillatory flood of men which flood does nightly disappear and lie hidden horizontal in beds and truckle beds and awakes on the morrow to new perpendicularity and movement men go their roads foolish or wise engineer gogola to and fro bearing queen cipher a madame de stael is busy cannot clutch her narbonne from the time flood a princess de lamballe is busy cannot help her queen bernave seeing the feuillant dispersed and coblentz so brisk begs by way of final recompense to kiss her majesty's hand augurs not well of her new course and retires home to grenoble to wed an heiress there the café valois and mayo the restaurateurs here daily gasconade loud babble of half-pay royalists with or without poniards remnants of aristocrat saloons call the new ministry ministère sans culotte a levé of the romance faubla is busy in the jacobin a cosotte of the romance diable amoureux is busy elsewhere better wert thou quiet old cosotte it is a world this of magic become real all men are busy doing they only half guess what flinging seeds of tares mostly into the seed field of time this by and by will declare wholly what but social explosions have in them something dread and as it were mad and magical which indeed life always secretly has thus the dumb earth says fable if you pull her mandrake roots will give a demonic mad-making moan these explosions and revolts ripen break forth like dumb dread forces of nature and yet they are men's forces and yet we are part of them the demonic that is in man's life has burst out on us will sweep us too away one day here is like another and yet it is not like but different how much is growing silently resistless at all moments thoughts are growing forms of speech are growing and customs and even costumes still more visibly are actions and transactions growing and that doomed strife of france with herself and with the whole world the word liberty is never named now except in conjunction with another liberty and equality in like manner what in a reign of liberty and equality can these words sir obedient servant honour to be and such like signify tatters and fibres of old feudality which were it only in the grammatical province ought to be rooted out the mother society has long since had proposals to that effect these she could not entertain not at the moment 
Note too how the Jacobin brethren are mounting new symbolical headgear, the woollen cap or nightcap, bonnet de laine, better known as bonnet rouge, the colour being red. A thing one wears not only by way of Phrygian cap of liberty, but also for convenience sake, and then also in compliment to the lower class patriots and Bastille heroes. For the red nightcap combines all the three properties, nay, cockades themselves begin to be made of wool, of tricolour yarn, the ribboned cockade, as a symbol of Fouillon, upper class temper, is becoming suspicious. Signs of the times. Still more, note the travail throes of Europe, or rather, note the birth she brings. For the successive throes and shrieks of Austrian and Prussian alliance, of Kaunitz anti-Jacobin dispatch, of French ambassadors cast out, and so forth, were long to note. De Murier corresponds with Kaunitz, Metternich, or Kobenzell, in another style that Delessart did. Strict becomes stricter. Categorical answer, as to this Koblenz work and much else, shall be given. Failing which? Failing which, on the 20th day of April 1792, King and ministers step over to the Salle de Manege, promulgate how the matter stands. And poor Louis, with tears in his eyes, proposes that the Assembly do now decree war. After due eloquence, war is decreed that night. War indeed. Paris came all crowding, full of expectancy, to the morning and still more to the evening session. D'Orléans, with his two sons, is there, looks on wide-eyed from the opposite gallery. Thou canst look, O Philippe. It is a war big with issues, for thee and for all men. Cimmerian obscurantism and this thrice glorious revolution shall wrestle for it then, some four and twenty years, in immeasurable, briarious wrestle, trampling and tearing, before they can come to any, not agreement, but compromise, and approximate ascertainment each of what is in the other. Let our three generals on the frontiers look to it, therefore, and poor Chevalier de Grave, the war minister, consider what he will do. What is in the three generals and armies, we may guess. As for poor Chevalier de Grave, he, in this whirl of things, all coming to a press and pinch upon him, loses head, and merely whirls with them, in a totally distracted manner, signing himself at last de Grave, mayor of Paris, whereupon he demits returns over the channel to walk in Kensington Gardens, and austere Servant, the able engineer officer, is elevated in his stead. To the post of honour? To that of difficulty, at least. End of section 43「Of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.5.10 Pétion National Peak And yet how, on dark bottomless cataracts, there plays the foolishest, fantastic coloured spray and shadow, hiding the abyss under vapoury rainbows. Alongside of this discussion as to Austrian-Prussian war, there goes on no less but more vehemently a discussion whether the forty or two and forty Swiss of Chateauvieux shall be liberated from the Brest galleys, and then whether being liberated they shall have a public festival or only private ones. Terroin, as we saw, spoke, and Collot took up the tale, has not Bouillet's final display of himself, in that final night of spurs, stamped your so-called revolt of Nancy into a massacre of Nancy, for all patriot judgments? Hateful is that massacre, hateful the Lafayette Fouillon public thanks given for it, for indeed Jacobin patriotism and dispersed Fouillantism are now at death grips, and do fight with all weapons, even with scenic shows, 
the walls of paris accordingly are covered with placard and counter placard on the subject of forty swiss blockheads journal responds to journal player collot to poetaster rocher joseph chenier the jacobin squire of terroin to his brother andre the feuillant mayor petillon to dupont de demeure and for the space of two months there is nowhere peace for the thought of man till this thing be settled gloria in excelsis the forty swiss are at last got amnestied rejoice ye forty doff your greasy wool bonnets which shall become caps of liberty the breast daughter society welcomes you from on board with kisses on each cheek your iron handcuffs are disputed as relics of saints the breast society indeed can have one portion which it will beat into pikes a sort of sacred pikes but the other portion must belong to paris and be suspended from the dome there along with the flags of the three free peoples such a goose is man and cackles over plush velvet grand monarch and woollen galley slaves over everything and over nothing and will cackle with his whole soul merely if others cackle on the ninth morning of april these forty swiss blockheads arrive from versailles with vivats heaven high with the affluence of men and women to the town hall we conduct them nay to the legislative itself though not without difficulty they are harangued bedinnered begifted the very court not for conscience sake contributing something and their public festival shall be next sunday next sunday accordingly it is they are mounted into a triumphal car resembling a ship are carted over paris with the clang of cymbals and drums all mortals assisting applausive carted to the champ de mars and fatherland's altar and finally carted for time always brings deliverance into invisibility for evermore whereupon dispersed feuillantism or that party which loves liberty yet not more than monarchy will likewise have its festival festival of simono unfortunate mayor of etampes who died for the law most surely for the law though jacobinism disputes being trampled down with his red flag in the riots about grains at which festival the public again assists unapplausive not we on the whole festivals are not wanting beautiful rainbow spray when all is now rushing treble quick towards its niagara fall national repasts there are countenanced by mayor petillon saint antoine and the strong ones of the Halles defiling through jacobin club their felicity according to santerre not perfect otherwise singing many voiced their ça ira dancing their ronde patriotique among whom one is glad to discern saint rouge expressly in white hat the saint christopher of the carmagnole nay a certain tambour or national drummer having just been presented with a little daughter determines to have the new frenchwoman christened on fatherland's altar then and there repast once over he accordingly has her christened fauché the te deum bishop acting in chief turio and honourable persons standing gossips by the name petion national peak does this remarkable citizeness now past the meridian of life still walk the earth or did she die perhaps of teething universal history is not indifferent end of section 44「section 45 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry Chapter 2.5.11 The Hereditary Representative And yet it is not by Carmagnol dances and singing of Saïra that the work can be done, 
Duke Brunswick is not dancing Carmagnol, but has his drill sergeants busy. On the frontiers, our armies, be it treason or not, behave in the worst way, troops badly commanded, shall we say, or troops intrinsically bad, unappointed, undisciplined, mutinous, that in a thirty years' peace have never seen fire. In any case, Lafayette's and Rochambeau's little clutch, which they made at Austrian Flanders, has prospered as badly as clutch need do. Soldiers starting at their own shadow, suddenly shrieking, On nous trahi! and flying off in wild panic, at or before the first shot, managing only to hang some two or three prisoners they had picked up, and massacre their own commander, poor Theobald Dillon driven into a granary by them in the town of Lille. And poor Gouvion, he who sat shiftless in that insurrection of women, Gouvion quitted the legislative hall and parliamentary duties in disgust and despair when those galley slaves of Chateauvieux were admitted there. He said, quote, Between the Austrians and the Jacobins, there is nothing but a soldier's death for it. End quote. And so, in the dark, stormy night, he has flung himself into the throat of the Austrian cannon and perished in the skirmish at Maubeuge on the 9th of June, whom legislative patriotism shall mourn with black mortcloths and melody in the Champ de Mars. Many a patriot shiftier, truer none. Lafayette himself is looking altogether dubious, in place of beating the Austrians, is about writing to denounce the Jacobin. Rochambeau, all disconsolate, quits the service. There remains only Luckner, the babbling old Prussian grenadier. Without armies, without generals, and the Cimmerian knight has gathered itself, Brunswick preparing his proclamation, just about to march. Let a patriot ministry and legislative say what in these circumstances it will do. Suppress internal enemies, for one thing, answers the patriot legislative, and proposes on the 24th of May its decree for the banishment of priests. Collect also some nucleus of determined internal friends, adds war minister Servant, and proposes on the 7th of June his camp of 20,000. 20,000 national volunteers, five out of each canton, picked patriots, for Roland has charge of the interior. They shall assemble here in Paris, and be for a defence, cunningly devised, against foreign Austrians and domestic Austrian committee alike. So much can a patriot ministry and legislative do. Reasonable and cunningly devised as such camp may to servant and patriotism appear, it appears not so to feuillantism, to that feuillant aristocrat staff of the Paris Guard. A staff, one would say again, which will need to be dissolved. These men see, in this proposed camp of servants, an offence, and even, as they pretend to say, an insult. Petitions there come, in consequence, from blue fouillon in epaulettes, ill-received. Nay, in the end, there comes one petition, called of the 8,000 National Guards, so many names are on it, including women and children. Which famed petition of the 8,000 is indeed received, and the petitioners, all under arms, are admitted to the honours of the sitting, if honours, or even if sitting, there be. For the instant their bayonets appear at the one door, the assembly adjourns and begins to flow out at the other. Also in these same days, it is lamentable to see how national guards, escorting Fête Dieu, or Corpus Christi ceremonial, do collar and smite down any patriot that does not uncover as the hostie passes. They clap their bayonets to the breast of cattle butcher Le Gendre, a known patriot ever since the Bastille days, and threaten to butcher him, though he sat quite respectfully, he says, in his gig at a distance of fifty paces, waiting till the thing were by. Nay, orthodox females were shrieking to have down the long term on him. 
to such height has feontism gone in this corps for indeed are not their officers creatures of the chief feuillon lafayette the court too has very naturally been tampering with them caressing them ever since that dissolution of the so-called constitutional guard some battalions are altogether petri needed full of feuillantism mere aristocrats at bottom for instance the battalion of the fille saint thomas made up of your bankers stockbrokers and other fool purses of the rue vivienne our worthy old friend weber queen's foster brother weber carries a musket in that battalion one may judge with what degree of patriotic intention heedless of all which or rather heedful of all which the legislative backed by patriot france and the feeling of necessity decrees this camp of twenty thousand decisive though conditional banishment of malign priests it has already decreed it will now be seen therefore whether the hereditary representative is for us or against us whether or not to all our other woes this intolerablest one is to be added which renders us not a menaced nation in extreme jeopardy and need but a paralytic solecism of a nation sitting wrapped as in dead searments of a constitutional vesture that were no other than a winding sheet our right hand glued to our left to wait there writhing and wriggling unable to stir from the spot till in prussian rope we mount to the gallows let the hereditary representative consider it well the decree of priests the camp of twenty thousand by heaven he answers veto veto strict roland hands in his letter to the king or rather it was madame's letter who wrote it all at a sitting one of the plainest spoken letters ever handed in to any king this plain spoken letter king louis has the benefit of reading overnight he reads inwardly digests and next morning the whole patriot ministry finds itself turned out it is the thirteenth of june seventeen ninety two de Maurier, the many counselled he with one duranton called minister of justice does indeed linger for a day or two in rather suspicious circumstances speaks with the queen almost weeps with her but in the end he too sets off for the army leaving what unpatriot or semi-patriot ministry and ministries can now accept the helm to accept it name them not new quick-changing phantasms which shift like magic lantern figures more spectral than ever unhappy queen unhappy louis the two vetoes were so natural are not the priests martyrs also friends this camp of twenty thousand could it be other than of stormfulest sans culotte natural and yet to france unendurable priests that cooperate with coblentz must go elsewhither with their martyrdom stormful sans culotte these and no other kind of creatures will drive back the austrians if thou prefer the austrians then for the love of heaven go join them if not join frankly with what will oppose them to the death middle course is none or alas what extreme course was there left now for a man like louis underhand royalists ex-minister bertrand molville ex-constituent malloy and all manner of unhelpful individuals advise and advise with face of hope turned now on the legislative assembly and now on austria and coblentz and round generally on the chapter of chances an ancient kingship is reeling and spinning one knows not whitherward on the flood of things end of section forty five Section 46 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.5.12 Procession of the Black Breeches But is there a thinking man in France who, in these circumstances, can persuade himself that the Constitution will march? Brunswick is stirring. He, in few days now, will march. Shall France sit still, wrapped in dead searments and grave clothes, its right hand glued to its left, till the Brunswick St. Bartholomew arrive, till France be as Poland, and its right of man become a Prussian gibbet? Verily, it is a moment frightful for all men, national death, or else some preternatural convulsive outburst of national life that same demonic outburst. Patriots, whose audacity has limits, had in truth better retire like Barnave, court private felicity at Grenoble. Patriots, whose audacity has no limits, must sink down into the obscure, and daring and defying all things, seek salvation in stratagem, in plot of insurrection. Roland and young Barbaro have spread out the map of France before them. Barbaro says, with tears. They consider what rivers, what mountain ranges are in it. They will retire behind this Loire stream, defend these Auvergne stone labyrinths, save some little sacred territory of the free, die at least in their last ditch. Lafayette indicts his emphatic letter to the legislative against Jacobinism which emphatic letter will not heal the unhealable. Forward, ye patriots whose audacity has no limits. It is you now that must either do or die. The sections of Paris sit in deep council, send out deputation after deputation to the Salle de Manege, to petition and denounce. Great is their ire against tyrannous veto, Austrian committee, and the combined Cimmerian kings. What boots it? Legislative listens to the toxin in our hearts, grants us honours of the sitting, sees us defile with jingle and fanfaronade. But the camp of twenty thousand, the priest decree, be vetoed by majesty, are become impossible for legislative. Fiery Isna says, We will have equality, should we descend for it to the tomb. Vergnon utters hypothetically his stern Ezekiel visions of the fate of anti-national kings. But the question is, will hypothetic prophecies, will jingle and fanfaronade demolish the veto, or will the veto, secure in its Tuileries chateau, remain undemolishable by these? Barbaro, dashing away his tears, writes to the Marseille municipality that they must send him six hundred men who know how to die, qui savent mourir. No wet-eyed message this, but a fire-eyed one, which will be obeyed. Meanwhile, the 20th of June is nigh, anniversary of that world-famous oath of the tennis court, on which day it is said certain citizens have in view to plant a may, or tree of liberty, in the Tuileries Terrace of the Feuillants. Perhaps also to petition the legislative and hereditary representative about these vetoes, with such demonstration, jingle and evolution, as may seem profitable and practicable. Sections have gone singly, and jingled and evolved, but if they all went, or a great part of them, and there, planting their may, in these alarming circumstances, sounded the toxin in their hearts? Among king's friends there can be but one opinion as to such a step. Among nation's friends there may be two. On the one hand, might it not, by possibility, scare away these unblessed vetoes? Private patriots, and even legislative deputies, may have each his own opinion, or own no opinion. But the hardest task falls evidently on Mayor Petion and the municipals, at once patriots and guardians of the public tranquillity, hushing the matter down with the one hand, tickling it up with the other. Mayor Petion and municipality may lean this way, 
department directory with procureur syndic roderer having a feuillon tendency may lean that on the whole each man must act according to his one opinion or to his two opinions and all manner of influences official representations cross one another in the foolishest way perhaps after all the project desirable and yet not desirable will dissipate itself being run athwart by so many complexities and coming to nothing not so on the twentieth morning of june a large tree of liberty lombardy poplar by kind lies visibly tied on its car in the suburb antoine suburb saint marceau too in the uttermost south-east and all that remote oriental region pike men and pike women national guards and the unarmed curious are gathering with the peaceablest intentions in the world a tricolor municipal arrives speaks tush it is all peaceable we tell thee in the way of law are not petitions allowable and the patriotism of may the tricolor municipal returns without effect your sansculottic rills continue flowing combining into brooks towards noontide led by tall santerre in blue uniform by tall santo rouge in white hat it moves westward a respectable river or complication of still swelling rivers what processions have we not seen corpus christi and legendre waiting in gig bones of voltaire with bullock chariots and goatsmen in roman costume feasts of chateauvieux and simoneau gouvion funerals rousseau sham funerals and the baptism of petion national pike nevertheless this procession has a character of its own tricolor ribbons streaming aloft from pike heads iron-shod batons and emblems not a few among which see specially these two of the tragic and the untragic sort a bull's heart transfixed with iron bearing this epigraph coeur d'aristocrate aristocrat's heart and more striking still properly the standard of the host a pair of old black breeches silk they say extended on cross staff high overhead with these memorable words tremblez tyrant voilà les sans culottes tremble tyrants here are the sans indispensables also the procession trails two cannons scarfed tricolor municipals do now again meet it in the quai saint bernard and plead earnestly having called halt peaceable ye virtuous tricolor municipals peaceable are we as the sucking dove behold our tennis court may petition is legal and as for arms did not an august legislative receive the so-called eight thousand in arms fuyons though they were our pikes are they not of national iron law is our father and mother whom we will not dishonour but patriotism is our own soul peaceable ye virtuous municipals and on the whole limited as to time stop we cannot march ye with us the black breeches agitate themselves impatient the cannon wheels grumble the many-footed host tramps on how it reached the salle de manege like an ever waxing river got admittance after debate read its address and defiled dancing and sa ira ing led by tall sonorous santerre and tall sonorous saint rouge how it flowed not now a waxing river but a shut caspian lake round all precincts of the tuileries the front patriot squeezed by the rearward against barred iron gates like to have the life squeezed out of him and looking too into the dread throat of cannon for national battalions stand ranked within how tricolor municipals ran assiduous and royalists with tickets of entry and both majesties sat in the interior surrounded by men in black all this the human mind shall fancy for itself or read in old newspapers and syndic roderer's chronicle of fifty days our may is planted 
if not in the Fouillon Terrace, where there is no ingate, then in the garden of the Capuchins, as near as we could get. National Assembly has adjourned till the evening session. Perhaps this shut lake, finding no ingate, will retire to its sources again and disappear in peace. Alas, not yet. Rearward still presses on. Rearward knows little what pressure is in the front. One would wish, at all events, were it possible, to have a word with His Majesty first. The shadows fall longer eastward. It is four o'clock. Will His Majesty not come out? Hardly he. In that case, Commandant Santerre, Cattle Butcher Le Gendre, Patriot Huguenin, with the toxin in his heart, they and others of authority will enter in. Petition and request to wearied, uncertain National Guard. Louder and louder petition, backed by the rattle of our two cannons. The reluctant grate opens. Endless, sans-culottic multitudes flood the stairs. Knock at the wooden guardian of your privacy. Knocks in such case. Grow strokes. Grow smashings. The wooden guardian flies in shivers and now ensues a scene over which the world has long wailed, and not unjustly. For a sorrier spectacle of incongruity fronting incongruity, and, as it were, recognising themselves incongruous, and staring stupidly in each other's face, the world seldom saw. King Louis, his door being beaten on, opens it, stands with free bosom, asking, "'What do you want?' The sonsculotic flood recoils awestruck, returns, however, the rear pressing on the front, with cries of Veto, patriot ministers, remove Veto, which things Louis valiantly answers, this is not the time to do, nor this the way to ask him to do. Honour what virtue is in a man. Louis does not want courage. He has even the higher kind, called moral courage though only the passive half of that. His few national grenadiers shuffle back with him into the embrasure of a window. There he stands with unimpeachable passivity amid the shouldering and the braying, a spectacle to men. They hand him a red cap of liberty. He sets it quietly on his head, forgets it there. He complains of thirst. Half-drunk rascality offers him a bottle. He drinks of it. Sire, do not fear, says one of his grenadiers. Fear, answers Louis. Feel, then, putting the man's hand on his heart. So stands Majesty in red woollen cap, black sansculottism weltering round him, far and wide, aimless, with inarticulate dissonance, with cries of Vito, patriot ministers, for the space of three hours or more. The National Assembly is adjourned. Tricolor municipals avail almost nothing. Mayor Pétion tarries absent. Authority is none. The Queen, with her children and sister Elizabeth, in tears and terror not for themselves only, are sitting behind barricaded tables and grenadiers in an inner room. The men in black have all wisely disappeared. Blind lake of sansculottism welters stagnant through the king's chateau for the space of three hours. Nevertheless, all things do end. Vergniaud arrives with legislative deputation, the evening session having now opened. Mayor Pétion has arrived, is haranguing, lifted on the shoulders of two grenadiers. In this uneasy attitude, and in others, at various places without and within, Mayor Pétion harangues. Many men harangue. Finally, Commandant Santerre defiles, passes out with his sansculottism by the opposite side of the chateau. Passing through the room where the Queen, with an air of dignity and sorrowful resignation, sat among the tables and grenadiers, a woman offers her too a red cap. She holds it in her hand, even puts it on the little Prince Royal. Madame, said Santerre, this people loves you more than you think. About eight o'clock, 
the royal family fall into each other's arms amid torrents of tears. Unhappy family! Who would not weep for it, were there not a whole world to be wept for? Thus has the age of chivalry gone, and that of hunger come. Thus does all needing sans culottism look in the face of its roi, regulator, king, or ableman, and find that he has nothing to give it. Thus do the two parties, brought face to face after long centuries, stare stupidly at one another. This, verily, am I, but, good heaven, is that thou? And depart, not knowing what to make of it. And yet, incongruities having recognised themselves to be incongruous, something must be made of it, the fates know what. This is the world-famous 20th of June, more worthy to be called the Procession of the Black Breeches, with which what we had to say of this first French biennial parliament and its products and activities may perhaps fitly enough terminate. End of section 46《セクション47 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Book 2.6 The Marseillaise. Chapter 2.61 Executive That Does Not Act. How could your paralytic national executive be put in action, in any measure, by such a 20th of June as this. Quite contrariwise, a large sympathy for majesty so insulted arises everywhere, expresses itself in addresses, petitions, petition of the 20,000 inhabitants of Paris, and such like, among all constitutional persons, a decided rallying round the throne, of which rallying it was thought King Louis might have made something. However, he does make nothing of it or attempt to make, for indeed his views are lifted beyond domestic sympathy and rallying over to Coblentz mainly. Neither in itself is the same sympathy worth much. It is sympathy of men who believe still that the constitution can march, wherefore the old discord and ferment of Fouillon's sympathy for royalty and Jacobin's sympathy for fatherland acting against each other from within with terror of Coblentz and Brunswick acting from without. This discord and ferment must hold on its course till a catastrophe do ripen and come. One would think, especially as Brunswick is near marching, such catastrophe cannot now be distant. Busy, ye twenty-five French millions, ye foreign potentates, military emigrants, German drill sergeants, each do what his hand findeth. Thou, O reader, at such safe distance, wilt see what they make of it among them. Consider, therefore, this pitiable 20th of June as a futility, no catastrophe, rather a catastasis, or heightening. Do not its black breeches wave there, in the historical imagination, like a melancholy flag of distress, soliciting help, which no mortal can give, soliciting pity, which thou wert hard-hearted not to give freely to one and all. Other such flags, or what are called occurrences, and black or bright symbolic phenomena, will flit through the historical imagination. These, one after one, let us note, with extreme brevity. The first phenomenon is that of Lafayette at the bar of the assembly, after a week and day. Promptly, on hearing of this scandalous 20th of June, Lafayette has quitted his command on the north frontier, in better or worse order, and got hither on the 28th to repress the Jacobin, not by letter now, but by oral petition and weight of character face to face. The august assembly finds the step questionable, invites him meanwhile to the honours of the sitting, other honour or advantage there unhappily came almost none the galleries all growling fiery isna glooming sharp gade not wanting in sarcasms 
and out of doors, when the sitting is over, Sieur Ressant, keeper of the Patriot Café in these regions, hears in the street a hurly-burly, steps forth to look, he and his Patriot customers. It is Lafayette's carriage with a tumultuous escort of blue grenadiers, cannoneers, even officers of the line, hurrying and capering round it. They make a pause opposite Sieur Ressant's door, wag their plumes at him, nay, shake their fists, bellowing, A bas les Jacobins! but happily pass on without onslaught. They pass on to plant a mais before the general's door, and bully considerably, all which the Sieur Ressant cannot but report with sorrow that night in the Mother Society. But what no Sieur Ressant nor Mother Society can do more than guess is this, that a council of rank Fouillon, your unabolished staff of the guard, and who else has status and weight, is in these very moments privily deliberating at the generals. Can we not put down the Jacobin by force? Next day a review shall be held in the Tuileries Garden, of such as will turn out and try. Alas, says Toulonjean, hardly a hundred turned out. Put it off till tomorrow, then, to give better warning. On the morrow, which is Saturday, there turn out some thirty, and depart shrugging their shoulders. Lafayette promptly takes carriage again, returns musing on many things. The dust of Paris is hardly off his wheels, the summer Sunday is still young, when Cordelier, in deputation, pluck up that may of his. Before sunset, patriots have burnt him in effigy. Louder doubt and louder rises in section in National Assembly as to the legality of such unbidden anti-Jacobin visit on the part of a general. Doubt swelling and spreading all over France for six weeks or so, with endless talk about usurping soldiers, about English monk, nay, about Cromwell. O thou poor Grandison Cromwell, what boots it? King Louis himself looked coldly on the enterprise, colossal hero of two worlds, having weighed himself in the balance, finds that he is become a gossamer colossus, only some thirty turning out. In a like sense, and with a like issue, works our department directory here at Paris, who, on the 6th of July, take upon them to suspend Mayor Pétion and Procureur Manuel from all civic functions for their conduct replete, as is alleged, with omissions and commissions on that delicate 20th of June. Virtuous Pétion sees himself a kind of martyr, or pseudo-martyr, threatened with several things, draws out due heroical lamentation, to which Patriot Paris and Patriot Legislative duly respond. King Louis and Mayor Pétion have already had an interview on that business of the 20th an interview and dialogue, distinguished by frankness on both sides, ending on King Louis's side with the words, Taisez-vous, hold your peace. For the rest, this of suspending our mayor does seem a mistimed measure. By ill chance, it came out precisely on the day of that famous baiser de la Morette, or miraculous reconciliatory Delilah kiss, which we spoke of long ago which Delilah Kiss was thereby quite hindered of effect, for now His Majesty has to write, almost that same night, asking a reconciled assembly for advice. The reconciled assembly will not advise, will not interfere. The king confirms the suspension. Then, perhaps, but not till then, will the assembly interfere, the noise of Patriot Paris getting loud. Whereby your Delilah Kiss such was the destiny of Parliament first, becomes a Philistine battle. Nay, there goes a word that as many as thirty of our chief patriot senators are to be clapped in prison by mitimus and indictment of Fouillon justices, juge de paix, who here in Paris were well capable of such a thing. It was but in May last that juge de paix, la rivière, on complaint of Bertrand Molleville, touching that Austrian committee, made bold to launch his mitimus against three heads of the mountain, deputies Bazir, Chabot, Merlin, the Cordelier trio, 
summoning them to appear before him and show where that Austrian committee was, or else suffer the consequences, which Mittimus, the trio on their side, made bold to fling in the fire, and valiantly pleaded privilege of Parliament, so that, for his zeal without knowledge, poor Justice La Riviere now sits in the prison of Orléans, waiting trial from the haute cour there, whose example may it not deter other rash justices, and so this word of the thirty arrestments continue a word merely. But on the whole, though Lafayette weighed so light, and has had his may plucked up, official feuillantism falters not a whit, but carries its head high, strong in the letter of the law. Feuillants, all of these men, a feuillant directory, founding on high character and such like, with Duc de la Rochefoucauld for president a thing which may prove dangerous for him. Dim now is the once bright Anglomania of these admired noblemen. Duke de Lioncourt offers out of Normandy, where he is Lord Lieutenant, not only to receive his majesty, thinking of flight thither, but to lend him money to enormous amounts. Sire, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution, and truly no rosewater one. Worthier noblemen were not in France, nor in Europe, than those two. But the time is crooked, quick-shifting, perverse. What straightest course will lead to any goal in it? Another phasis which we note in these early July days is that of certain thin streaks of federal national volunteers wending from various points towards Paris to hold a new Federation Festival, or Feast of Pikes on the 14th there. So has the National Assembly wished it, so has the nation willed it. In this way, perhaps, may we still have our patriot camp, in spite of veto. For cannot these fédérés, having celebrated their Feast of Pikes, march on to Soissons, and there, being drilled and regimented, rush to the frontiers, or whither we like? Thus were the one veto cunningly eluded as indeed the other veto about priests is also like to be eluded, and without much cunning. For provincial assemblies, in Calvados as one instance, are proceeding on their own strength to judge and banish anti-national priests, or still worse, without provincial assembly, a desperate people, as at Bordeaux, can hang two of them on the lanterne on the way towards judgment. Pity for the spoken veto, when it cannot become an acted one. It is true, some ghost of a war minister, or home minister for the time being, ghost whom we do not name, does write to municipalities and king's commanders that they shall, by all conceivable methods, obstruct this federation, and even turn back the fédéré by force of arms, a message which scatters mere doubt, paralysis and confusion, irritates the poor legislature, reduces the fédéré, as we see, to thin streaks. But being questioned, this ghost and the other ghosts, what is it then that they propose to do for saving the country? They answer that they cannot tell, that indeed they for their part have this morning resigned in a body, and do now merely respectfully take leave of the helm altogether, with which words they rapidly walk out of the hall, sort brusquement de la salle, the galleries cheering loudly, the poor legislature sitting for a good while in silence. Thus do cabinet ministers themselves, in extreme cases, strike work, one of the strangest omens. Other complete cabinet ministry there will not be, only fragments, and these changeful, which never get completed, Spectral apparitions that cannot so much as appear. King Louis writes that he now views this federation feast with approval and will himself have the pleasure to take part in the same. And so these thin streaks of fédéré wend Parisward through a paralytic France. Thin, grim streaks, not thick, joyful ranks, as of old to the first Feast of Pikes. No, these poor federates march now towards Austria and Austrian committee, 
towards jeopardy and forlorn hope, men of hard fortune and temper, not rich in the world's goods. Municipalities, paralysed by war ministers, are shy of affording cash. It may be your poor federates cannot arm themselves, cannot march, till the daughter society of the place open her pocket and subscribe. There will not have arrived, at the set day, three thousand of them in all. And yet, thin and feeble as these streaks of federates seem, they are the only thing one discerns moving with any clearness of aim in this strange scene. Angry buzz and simmer, uneasy tossing and moaning of a huge France, all enchanted, spellbound, by unmarching constitution, into frightful, conscious and unconscious, magnetic sleep which frightful magnetic sleep must now issue soon in one of two things, death or madness. The Fédéré carry mostly in their pocket some earnest cry and petition to have the national executive put in action, or as a step towards that, to have the king's déchéance, king's forfeiture, or at least his suspension pronounced. They shall be welcome to the legislative, to the mother of patriotism, and Paris will provide for their lodging. Déchéance, indeed, and what next? A France spell-free, a revolution saved, and anything and all things next. So answer grimly Danton and the unlimited patriots, down deep in their subterranean region of plot, whither they have now dived. Déchéance, answers Brissot, with the limited, and if next the little prince royal were crowned, and some regency of Girondin and recalled patriot ministry set over him? Alas, poor Brissot, looking as indeed poor man does always on the nearest morrow as his peaceable promised land, deciding what much reach to the world's end, yet with an insight that reaches not beyond his own nose. Wiser are the unlimited subterranean patriots, who, with light for the hour itself, leave the rest to the gods. Or were it not, as we now stand, the probablest issue of all, that Brunswick, in Koblenz, just gathering his huge limbs towards him to rise, might arrive first, and stop both déchéance and theorising on it. Brunswick is on the eve of marching, with eighty thousand, they say. Fell Prussians, Hessians, feller emigrants a general of the great Frederick, with such an army. And our armies? And our generals? As for Lafayette, on whose late visit a committee is sitting and all France is jarring and censuring, he seems readier to fight us than fight Brunswick. Luckner and Lafayette pretend to be interchanging corps and are making movements, which patriotism cannot understand. This only is very clear, that their corps go marching and shuttling in the interior of the country, much nearer Paris than formerly. Luckner has ordered de Maurier down to him, down from Molde and the fortified camp there, which order the many counselled de Maurier, with the Austrians hanging close on him, he busy meanwhile training a few thousands to stand fire and be soldiers, declares that, come of it what will, he cannot obey. Will a poor legislative therefore sanction de Maurier, who applies to it not knowing whether there is any war ministry, or sanction Luckner and these Lafayette movements? The poor legislative knows not what to do. It decrees, however, that the staff of the Paris Guard, and indeed all such staffs, for they are fouillants mostly, shall be broken and replaced. It decrees earnestly, in what manner one can declare, that the country is in danger. And finally, on the 11th of July, the morrow of that day when the ministry struck work, it decrees that the country be, with all dispatch, declared in danger. Whereupon, let the king sanction, let the municipality take measures. If such declaration will do service, it need not fail. In danger truly, if ever country was. Arise, O country, or be trodden down to ignominious ruin. Nay, are not the chances a hundred to one that no rising of the country will save it? 
Brunswick, the emigrants, and feudal Europe drawing nigh. End of section 47「Section 48 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.62. Let us march. But to our minds, the notablest of all these moving phenomena is that of Barbaro's 600 Marseillais, who know how to die. Prompt to the request of Barbaro, the Marseille municipality has got these men together. On the fifth morning of July, the town hall says, Marchez, abattez les tyrans. March, strike down the tyrant. And they, with grim appropriate marchons, are marching. Long journey, doubtful errand. Enfant de la patrie, may a good genius guide you. Their own wild heart, and what faith it has, will guide them, and is not that the monition of some genius, better or worse? Five hundred and seventeen able men, with captains of fifties and tens, well armed all, musket on shoulder, sabre on thigh. Nay, they drive three pieces of cannon, for who knows what obstacles may occur? Municipalities there are, paralysed by war minister, Commandant, with orders to stop even Federation volunteers. Good, when sound arguments will not open a town gate, if you have a pétard to shiver it. They have left their sunny Phocian city and sea haven, with its bustle and its bloom. The thronging course, with high frondent avenues, pitchy dockyards, almond and olive groves, orange trees on housetops, and white glittering bastide that crown the hills are all behind them they wend on their wild way from the extremity of french land through unknown cities toward an unknown destiny with a purpose that they know much wondering at this phenomenon and how in a peaceable trading city so many householders or hearthholders do severally fling down their crafts and industrial tools gird themselves with weapons of war, and set out on a journey of six hundred miles to strike down the tyrant. You search in all historical books, pamphlets, and newspapers for some light on it, unhappily without effect. Rumour and terror precede this march, which still echo on you, the march itself an unknown thing. Weber, in the back stairs of the Tuileries, has understood that they were forçats, galley slaves, and mere scoundrels, these Marseillais, that as they marched through Lyon, the people shut their shops, also that the number of them was some four thousand. Equally vague is Blangilly, who likewise murmurs about forçats and danger of plunder. Forçats they were not, neither was there plunder or danger of it. Men of regular life, or of the best-filled purse, they could hardly be. The one thing needful in them was that they knew how to die. Friend Don Martin saw them with his own eyes march gradually through his quarters at Villefranche in the Beaujolais, but saw in the vaguest manner, being indeed preoccupied, and himself minded for marching just then across the Rhine. Deep was his astonishment to think of such a march without appointment or arrangement, station or ration. For the rest, it was the same men he had seen formerly in the troubles of the South, perfectly civil, though his soldiers could not be kept from talking a little with them. So vague are all these. Moniteur, histoire parlementaire, are as good as silent, Garrulous history, as is too usual, will say nothing where you most wish her to speak. If enlightened curiosity ever gets sight of the Marseille council books, will it not perhaps explore this strangest of municipal procedures and feel called to fish up what of the biographies, creditable or discreditable, of these 517 the stream of time has not yet irrevocably swallowed? As it is, 
these Marseillaise, remain inarticulate, undistinguishable in feature, a black-browed mass, full of grim fire, who wend there in the hot sultry weather, very singular to contemplate. They wend, amid the infinitude of doubt and dim peril, they not doubtful. Fate and feudal Europe having decided, come girdling in from without, they having also decided, do march within. Dusty of face, with frugal refreshment, they plod onwards, unweariable, not to be turned aside. Such march will become famous. The thought which works voiceless in this black-browed mass, an inspired Tertian colonel, Rouget de Lille, whom the earth still holds, has translated into grim melody and rhythm, into his hymn or march of the Marseillaise, luckiest musical composition ever promulgated, the sound of which will make the blood tingle in men's veins, and whole armies and assemblages will sing it, with eyes weeping and burning, with hearts defiant of death, despot, and devil. One sees well, these Marseillaise will be too late for the Federation feast. In fact, it is not Jean de Mars' oaths that they have in view. They have quite another feat to do, a paralytic national executive to set in action. They must strike down whatsoever tyrant or martyr feignant there may be who paralyzes it, strike and be struck, and on the whole prosper and know how to die. End of section 48 Section 49 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.63 Some Consolation to Mankind Of the Federation feast itself, we shall say almost nothing. There are tents pitched in the Champ de Mars, tent for National Assembly, tent for hereditary representative, who indeed is there too early, and has to wait long in it. There are eighty-three symbolical departmental trees of liberty, trees and may, enough. Beautifulest of all these is one huge may, hung round with effete scutcheons, emblazonries and genealogy books, nay better still, with lawyer's bags, sac de procédure, which shall be burnt. The thirty seat rows of that famed slope are again full. We have a bright sun, and all is marching, streamering, and blaring. But what avails it? Virtuous Mayor Petion, whom Fouillantism has suspended, was reinstated only last night by decree of the Assembly. Men's humour is of the sourest. Men's hats have on them written in chalk, Vive Petion, and even... Pétion or death, pétion ou la mort. Poor Louis, who has waited till five o'clock before the assembly would arrive, swears the national oath this time, with a quilted cuirass under his waistcoat, which will turn pistol bullets. Madame de Stael, from that royal tent, stretches out the neck in a kind of agony, lest the waving multitudes which receive him may not render him back alive. No cry of Vive le roi salutes the ear, cries only of Vive Pétion, Pétion au la mort. The national solemnity is as it were huddled by, each cowering off, almost before the evolutions are gone through. The very May, with its scutcheons and lawyers' bags, is forgotten, stands unburnt, till certain patriot deputies, called by the people, set a torch to it, by way of voluntary afterpiece. Sadder feast of pikes no man ever saw. Mayor Petion, named on hats, is at his zenith in this federation. Lafayette again is close upon his nadir. Why does the storm bell of Saint Roche speak out next Saturday? Why do the citizens shut their shops? It is sections defiling. It is fear of effervescence. Legislative Committee, long deliberating on Lafayette and that anti-Jacobin visit of his, reports this day that there is not ground for accusation. Peace, ye patriots, nevertheless, 
and let that toxin cease. The debate is not finished, nor the report accepted, but Brissot, Isnard, and the mountain will sift it, and re-sift it, perhaps for some three weeks longer. So many bells, storm-bells, and noises do ring, scarcely audible, one drowning the other. For example, in this same Lafayette toxin of Saturday, was there not withal some faint Bob Minor and deputation of legislative bringing the Chevalier Paul Jones to his long rest, toxin or dirge now all one to him? Not ten days hence, Patriot Brissot, beshouted this day by the Patriot galleries, shall find himself begroaned by them on account of his limited patriotism nay, pelted at, while perorating, and hit with two prunes. It is a distracted, empty-sounding world, of Bob Miners and Bob Majors, of triumph and terror, of rise and fall. The more touching is this other solemnity, which happens on the morrow of the Lafayette toxin, proclamation that the country is in danger. Not till the present Sunday could such solemnity be, the legislative decreed it almost a fortnight ago, but royalty and the ghost of a ministry held back as they could. Now, however, on this Sunday, 22nd day of July, 1792, it will hold back no longer, and the solemnity in very deed is. Touching to behold, municipality and mayor have on their scarfs. Canon Salvo booms alarm from the Pont Neuf, and single gun at intervals all day. Guards are mounted, scarfed nobilities, halberdiers, and a cavalcade, with streamers, emblematic flags, especially with one huge flag, flapping mournfully. Citoyen, la patrie est en danger! They roll through the streets, with stern-sounding music, and slow rattle of hoofs, pausing at set stations, and with doleful blast of trumpets, singing out through herald's throat what the flag says to the eye. Citizens, the country is in danger. Is there a man's heart that hears it without a thrill? The many-voiced responsive hum or bellow of these multitudes is not of triumph, and yet it is a sound deeper than triumph. But when the long cavalcade and proclamation ended and our huge flag was fixed on the Pont Neuf, another like it on the Hôtel de Ville, to wave there till better days, and each municipal sat in the centre of his section, in a tent raised in some open square, tent surmounted with flags of patrie en danger, and topmost of all, a pike and bonnet rouge. And on two drums in front of him there lay a plank table, and on this an open book, and a clerk sat, like recording angel, ready to write the lists, or, as we say, to enlist, Oh, then it seems the very gods might have looked down on it. Young patriotism, colotic and sans colotic, rushes forward, emulous. That is my name. Name, blood and life is all my country's. Why have I nothing more? Youths of short stature weep that they are below size. Old men come forward, a son in each hand. Mothers themselves will grant the son of their travail. Send him, though with tears. And the multitude bellows, Vive la patrie! Far reverberating. And fire flashes in the eyes of men. And at eventide, your municipal returns to the town hall, followed by his long train of volunteer valour, hands in his list, says proudly, looking round, This is my day's harvest. They will march on the morrow to Soissons, small bundle holding all their chattels. So with Vive la Patrie, Vive la Liberté, Stone Paris reverberates like Ocean in his caves, day after day. Municipals enlisting in tricolor tent, the flag flapping on Pont Neuf and Town Hall. Citoyen, la Patrie est en danger. Some ten thousand fighters, without discipline but full of heart, are on march in few days. The like is doing in every town of France. Consider, therefore, whether the country will want defenders, had we but a national executive. Let the sections and primary assemblies, at any rate, become permanent, and sit continually in Paris, and over France, 
by legislative decree dated Wednesday the 25th. Mark contrariwise how, in these very hours, dated the 25th, Brunswick shakes himself, Sebron in Koblenz, and takes the road, shakes himself indeed. One spoken word becomes such a shaking. Successive, simultaneous, dural, of 30,000 muskets shouldered, prance and jingle of 10,000 horsemen, fanfaronading emigrants in the van, drum, kettle drum, noise of weeping, swearing, and the immeasurable lumbering clank of baggage wagons and camp kettles that groan into motion. All this is Brunswick shaking himself. Not without all this does the one-man march, covering a space of forty miles, still less without his manifesto, dated, as we say, the 25th, a state paper worthy of attention. By this document, it would seem great things are in store for France. The universal French people shall now have permission to rally round Brunswick and his emigrant seigneur. Tyranny of a Jacobin faction shall oppress them no more, but they shall return and find favour with their own good king, who, by royal declaration, three years ago, of the 23rd of June, said that he would himself make them happy. As for National Assembly and other bodies of men invested with some temporary shadow of authority, they are charged to maintain the king's cities and strong places intact till Brunswick arrive to take delivery of them. Indeed, quick submission may extenuate many things, but to this end it must be quick. Any National Guard or other unmilitary person found resisting in arms shall be treated as a traitor, that is to say, hanged with promptitude. For the rest, if Paris, before Brunswick gets thither, offer any insult to the king, or, for example, suffer a faction to carry the king away elsewhere, in that case Paris shall be blasted asunder with cannon shot and military execution. Likewise, all other cities, which may witness and not resist to the uttermost such forced march of his majesty, shall be blasted asunder, and Paris and every city of them, starting place, course, and goal, of said sacrilegious forced march, shall, as rubbish and smoking ruin, lie there for a sign. Such vengeance were indeed signal, an insigne vengeance. O Brunswick, what words thou writest and blusterest! In this Paris, as in old Nineveh, are so many score thousands that know not the right hand from the left, and also much cattle. Shall the very milk cows, hard-living cadgers, asses, and poor little canary birds die? Nor is royal and imperial Prussian-Austrian declaration wanting, setting forth in the amplest manner their sans souci Schönbrunn version of this whole French revolution, since the first beginning of it, and with what grief these high heads have seen such things done under the sun. However, as some small consolation to mankind, they do now dispatch Brunswick, regardless of expense, as one might say, of sacrifices on their own part, for is it not the first duty to console men? Serene Highnesses, who sit there protocoling and manifestoing, and consoling mankind, how were it if, for once in the thousand years, your parchments, formularies, and reasons of state were blown to the four winds, and reality, sans indispensables, stared you, even you, in the face, and mankind said for itself what the thing was that would console it. End of section 49section fifty of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point six four subterranean but judge if there was comfort in this to the sections all sitting permanent deliberating how a national executive could be put in action high rises the response not of cackling terror, 
but of crowing counter-defiance and vive la nation young valour streaming towards the frontiers patrie en danger mutely beckoning on the pont neuf sections are busy in their permanent deep and down lower still works unlimited patriotism seeking salvation in plot insurrection you would say becomes once more the sacredest of duties committee self-chosen is sitting at the sign of the golden sun journalist cara camille de moulin alsatian westerman friend of danton american fournier of martinique a committee not unknown to mayor petion who as an official person must sleep with one eye open not unknown to procureur manuel least of all to procureur substitute danton he wrapped in darkness being also official bears it on his giant shoulder cloudy invisible atlas of the whole much is invisible the very jacobins have their reticences insurrection is to be but when this only we can discern that such fédérés as are not yet gone to soissons as indeed are not inclined to go yet for reasons says the jacobin president which it may be interesting not to state have got a central committee sitting close by under the roof of the mother society herself also what in such ferment and danger of effervescence is surely proper the forty-eight sections have got their central committee intended for prompt communication to which central committee the municipality anxious to have it at hand could not refuse an apartment in the hotel de ville singular city for overhead of all this there is the customary baking and brewing labour hammers and grinds frilled promenaders saunter under the trees white muslin promenaderess in green parasol leaning on your arm dogs dance and shoeblacks polish on that pont neuf itself where fatherland is in danger so much goes its course and yet the course of all things is nigh altering and ending look at that tuileries and tuileries garden silent all as sahara none entering save by ticket they shut their gates after the day of the black breeches a thing they had the liberty to do however the national assembly grumbled something about terrace of the feuillants how said terrace lay contiguous to the back entrance to their salle and was partly national property and so now national justice has stretched a tricolor ribband athwart by way of boundary line respected with splenetic strictness by all patriots it hangs there that tricolor boundary line carries satirical inscriptions on cards generally in verse and all beyond this is called coblentz and remains vacant silent as a fateful golgotha sunshine and umbrage alternating on it in vain fateful circuit what hope can dwell in it mysterious tickets of entry introduce themselves speak of insurrection very imminent rivarol's staff of genius had better purchase blunderbusses grenadier bonnets red swiss uniforms may be useful insurrection will come but likewise will it not be met staved off one may hope till brunswick arrive but consider withal if the burnstones and portable chairs remain silent if the herald's college of bill-stickers sleep louvet's sentinelle warns gratis on all walls soulot is busy people's friend marat and king's friend royal croak and counter croak for the man marat though long hidden since that champ de mars massacre is still alive he has lain who knows in what cellars perhaps in le gendre's fed by a stake of le gendre's killing but since april the bullfrog voice of him sounds again hoarsest of earthly cries for the present black terror haunts him o oh, brave barbaro wilt thou not smuggle me to marseilles disguised as a jockey in palais royal and all public places as we read there is sharp activity private individuals haranguing that valour may enlist 
haranguing that the executive may be put in action. Royalist journals ought to be solemnly burnt. Argument thereupon. Debates which generally end in single stick coup de can. Or think of this, the hour midnight, place salle de manege, august assembly just adjourning. Citizens of both sexes enter in a rush, exclaiming, Vengeance! They are poisoning our brothers! Baking braid glass among their bread at Soissons. Vergniaud has to speak soothing words, how commissioners are already sent to investigate this braid glass and do what is needful therein till the rush of citizens makes profound silence and goes home to its bed. Such is Paris, the heart of a France like to it, preternatural suspicion, doubt, disquietude, nameless anticipation, from shore to shore. And those black-browed Marseillaise, marching, dusty, unwearied, through the midst of it, not doubtful they, Marching to the grim music of their hearts, they consume continually the long road, these three weeks and more, heralded by terror and rumour. The Brest Fédéré arrive on the 26th through harrying streets. Determined men are these also, bearing or not bearing the sacred pikes of Chateauvieux, and on the whole decidedly disinclined for Soissons as yet. Surely the Marseillaise brethren do draw nigher all days. End of section 50。section 51 of The French Revolution, volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.65 at dinner. It was a bright day for Charenton, that twenty-ninth of the month, when the Marseillaise brethren actually came in sight. Barbaro, Santerre, and Patriots have gone out to meet the grim wayfarers. Patriot clasps dusty Patriot to his bosom. There is foot-washing and refection. Dinner of twelve hundred covers at the Blue Dial, Cadran Bleu and deep interior consultation that one wots not of. Consultation, indeed, which comes to little, for Santerre, with an open purse, with a loud voice, has almost no head. Here, however, we repose this night. On the morrow is public entry into Paris. On which public entry the day historians, dionalistes, or journalists, as they call themselves, have preserved record enough how St. Antoine, male and female, and Paris generally, gave brotherly welcome, with bravo and hand-clapping, in crowded streets, and all passed in peaceablest manner. Except it might be our Marseillaise pointed out here and there a ribboned cockade, and beckoned that it should be snatched away, and exchanged for a wool one, which was done. How the mother society in a body has come as far as the Bastille ground to embrace you, how you then wend onwards triumphant to the town hall to be embraced by Mère Pétion, to put down your muskets in the barracks of Nouvelle France, not far off, then towards the appointed tavern in the Champs-Élysées to enjoy a frugal patriot repast, of all which the indignant Tuileries may, by its tickets of entry, have warning. Red Swiss look doubly sharp to their Chateau Grat though surely there is no danger. Blue grenadiers of the Fille saint Thomas section are on duty there this day. Men of Agio, as we have seen, with stuffed purses, riband cockades, among whom serves Weber. A party of these latter, with captains, with sundry Fouillon notabilities, Moreau de Saint-Marie, of the three thousand orders, and others, have been dining, much more respectably, in a tavern hard by. They have dined and are now drinking loyal patriotic toasts, while the Marseillaise, national patriotic merely, are about sitting down to their frugal covers of Delph. How it happened remains to this day undemonstrable, but the external fact is 
Certain of these Fee Saint Thomas grenadiers do issue from their tavern, perhaps touched, surely not yet muddled with any liquor they have had, issue in the professed intention of testifying to the Marseillaise or to the multitude of Paris patriots who stroll in these spaces that they, the Fee Saint Thomas men, if well seen into, are not a whit less patriotic than any other class of men whatever. It was a rash errand. For how can the strolling multitudes credit such a thing, or do other indeed than hoot at it, provoking and provoked, till grenadier sabres stir in the scabbard, and a sharp shriek rises, A nous Marseillais, help Marseillaise! Quick as lightning, for the frugal repast is not yet served, that Marseillaise tavern flings itself open. By door, by window, running, bounding, vault forth the five hundred and seventeen undined patriots, and, sabre flashing from thigh, are on the scene of controversy. Will ye parley, ye grenadier captains and official persons, with faces grown suddenly pale, the deponents say? Advisabler were instant, moderately swift retreat. The Fee Saint Thomas retreat, back foremost, then, alas, face foremost, at treble quick time. The Marseillaise, according to a deponent, clearing the fences and ditches after them like lions. Monsieur, it was an imposing spectacle. Thus they retreat, the Marseillaise following, swift and swifter, towards the Tuileries, where the drawbridge receives the bulk of the fugitives, and then, suddenly drawn up, saves them, or else the green mud of the ditch does it. The bulk of them, not all. Ah, uh, no. Moreau de Saint-Méry, for example, being too fat, could not fly fast. He got a stroke, flat stroke only, over the shoulder blades, and fell prone, and disappears there from the history of the revolution. Cuts also there were, pricks in the posterior fleshy parts, much rending off skirts and other discrepant waste. But poor sub-lieutenant du Hamel, innocent change-broker, what a lot for him! He turned on his pursuer, or pursuers, with a pistol. He fired and missed, drew a second pistol, and again fired and missed, then ran, unhappily, in vain. In the Rue saint Florentin, they clutched him, thrust him through, in red rage. That was the end of the new era, and of all eras, to poor de Hamel. Pacific readers can fancy what sort of grace before meat this was to frugal patriotism. Also how the battalion of the Fils Saint Thomas drew out in arms, luckily without further result. How there was accusation at the bar of the assembly, and counter-accusation and defence, Marseillaise challenging the sentence of free jury court, which never got to a decision. We ask rather what the upshot of all these distracted, wildly accumulating things may, by probability, be. Some upshot, and the time draws nigh. Busy are central committees of Federé at the Jacobin Church, of sections at the Town Hall, Reunion of Cara, Camille, and Company at the Golden Sun. Busy, like submarine deities, or call them mud gods, working there in the deep murk of waters till the thing be ready. And how your National Assembly, like a ship waterlogged, helmless, lies tumbling. The galleries of shrill women of Federé with sabres bellowing down on it, not unfrightful and waits where the waves of chance may please to strand it, suspicious, nay, on the left side, conscious, what submarine explosion is meanwhile a-charging. Petition for King's forfeiture rises often there, petition from Paris section, from provincial patriot towns, from Alençon, Briançon, and the traders at the fair of Beaucaire. Or what of these? On the 3rd of August, Mayor Petion and the municipality come petitioning for forfeiture, they openly, in their tricolour municipal scarfs. 
Forfeiture is what all patriots now want and expect. All Brissotins want forfeiture, with the little Prince Royal for king, and us for protector over him. Emphatic Federé ask the legislature, can you save us or not? Forty-seven sections have agreed to forfeiture, only that of the Fille Saint-Thomas pretending to disagree. Nay, section Moconse declares forfeiture to be, properly speaking, come. Moconse, for one, does from this day, the last of July, cease allegiance to Louis, and take minute of the same before all men. A thing blamed aloud, but which will be praised aloud, and the name Moconse, of ill counsel, be thenceforth changed to bon conseil of good counsel. President Danton, in the Cordelier section, does another thing, invites all passive citizens to take place among the active in section business, one peril threatening all. Thus he, though an official person, cloudy atlas of the whole, Likewise, he manages to have that black-browed battalion of Marseillaise shifted to new barracks in his own region of the remote southeast. Sleek Chaumette, Cruel Billot, Deputy Chabot the Disfrocked, Huguenin, with the toxin in his heart, will welcome them there. Wherefore, again and again, O oh, legislators, can you save us or not? Poor legislators, with their legislature waterlogged, volcanic explosion charging under it. Forfeiture shall be debated on the ninth day of August, that miserable business of Lafayette may be expected to terminate on the eighth. Or will the humane reader glance into the levy day of Sunday the fifth, the last levy, not for a long time, never, says Bertrand Molville, had a levy been so brilliant, at least so crowded. A sad presaging interest sat on every face. Bertrand's own eyes were filled with tears. For indeed, outside of that tricolor ribbon on the Fuyon's terrace, legislature is debating, sections are defiling, all Paris is astir this very Sunday, demanding déchéance. Here, however, within the ribbon, a grand proposal is on foot, for the hundredth time, of carrying His Majesty to Rouen and the castle of Gaillon. Swiss at Courbevoie are in readiness. Much is ready. Majesty himself seems almost ready. Nevertheless, for the hundredth time, Majesty, when near the point of action, draws back, writes after one has waited, palpitating an endless summer day, that he has reason to believe the insurrection is not so ripe as you suppose, whereat Bertrand Monville breaks forth into extremity at one of spleen and despair, d'humeur et de désespoir. End of section 51section 52 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.66 The Steeples at Midnight For, in truth, the insurrection is just about ripe. Thursday is the ninth of the month, August. If forfeiture be not pronounced by the legislature that day, we must pronounce it ourselves. Legislature? a poor waterlogged legislature, can pronounce nothing. On Wednesday the 8th, after endless oratory once again, they cannot even pronounce accusation against Lafayette, but absolve him, hear it, patriotism, by a majority of two to one. Patriotism hears it. Patriotism, hounded on by Prussian terror, by preternatural suspicion, roars, tumultuous, round the salle de manege, all day, insults many leading deputies of the absolvent right side, nay chases them, collars them with loud menace. Deputy Vaublanc and others of the like are glad to take refuge in guard-houses and escape by the back window. 
And so, next day, there is infinite complaint. Letter after letter from insulted deputy. Mere complaint, debate, and self-cancelling jargon. The sun of Thursday sets, like the others, and no forfeiture pronounced. Wherefore, in fine, to your tents, O Israel. The Mother Society ceases speaking, groups cease haranguing. Patriots with closed lips now take one another's arm, walk off in rows two and two at a brisk business pace, and vanish afar in the obscure places of the East. Santerre is ready, or we will make him ready. Forty-seven of the forty-eight sections are ready. Nay, Fille Saint-Thomas itself turns up the Jacobin side of it, turns down the Fouillon side of it, and is ready too. Let the unlimited patriot look to his weapon, be it pike, be it firelock, and the breast brethren above all, the black-browed Marseillaise, prepare themselves for the extreme hour. Sandique Rudeleur knows, and laments, or not, as the issue may turn, that five thousand ball cartridges within these few days have been distributed to Federé at the Hôtel de Ville. And ye likewise, gallant gentlemen, defenders of royalty, crowd ye on your side to the Tuileries, not to a levée, no, to a coucher, where much will be put to bed. Your tickets of entry are needful, needfuler your blunderbusses. They come and crowd like gallant men who also know how to die. Old Maillet, the camp marshal, has come, his eyes gleaming once again, though dimmed by the room of almost fourscore years. Courage, brothers, we have a thousand red Swiss, men staunch of heart, steadfast as the granite of their Alps. National grenadiers are at least friends of order. Commandant Monda breathes loyal ardour, will answer for it on his head. Monda will, and his staff. For the staff, though there stands a doom and decree to that effect, is happily never yet dissolved. Commandant Monda has corresponded with Mayor Petion, carries a written order from him these three days, to repel force by force. A squadron on the Pont Neuf, with cannon, shall turn back these Marseillaise coming across the river. A squadron at the town hall shall cut Saint-Antoine in two, as it issues from the Arcade Saint-Jean. Drive one half back to the obscure east, drive the other half forward through the wickets of the Louvre. Squadrons not a few, and mounted squadrons, squadrons in the Palais Royal, in the Place Vendôme. All these shall charge at the right moment, sweep this street, and then sweep that. Some new 20th of June we shall have, only still more ineffectual. Or, probably, the insurrection will not dare to rise at all. Monda's squadrons, horse gendarmerie, and blue guards march, clattering, tramping. Monda's cannoneers rumble. Under cloud of night, to the sound of his general, which begins drumming when men should go to bed. It is the ninth night of August, 1792. On the other hand, the 48 sections correspond by swift messengers, are choosing each their three delegates with full power. Sandique Rodereur, Mayor Petion, are sent for to the Tuileries. Courageous legislators, when the drum beats danger, should repair to their salle. Demoiselle Terroin has on her grenadier bonnet, short-skirted riding habit. Two pistols garnish her small waist, and sabre hangs in baldric by her side. Such a game is playing in this Paris pandemonium, or city of all the devils. And yet the night, as Mayor Petion walks here in the Tuileries garden, is beautiful and calm. Orion and the Pleiades glitter down quite serene. Petion has come forth, the heat inside was so oppressive. Indeed, His Majesty's reception of him was of the roughest, as it well might be. And now there is no outgate. Monda's blue squadrons turn you back at every gate. Nay, the Fille Saint-Thomas grenadiers give themselves liberties of tongue, 
how a virtuous mare shall pay for it if there be mischief and the like though others again are full of civility surely if any man in france is in straits this night it is mayor petion bound under pain of death one may say to smile dexterously with the one side of his face and weep with the other death if he do it not dexterously enough not till four in the morning does a national assembly hearing of his plight summon him over to give account of paris of which he knows nothing whereby however he shall get home to bed and only his gilt coach be left scarcely less delicate is syndic roderer's task who must wait whether he will lament or not till he see the issue janus Bifron, or mr facing both ways as vernacular bunyan has it they walk there in the meanwhile these two januses with others of the like double conformation and talk of indifferent matters roderer from time to time steps in to listen to speak to send for the department directory itself he their procureur syndic not seeing how to act the apartments are all crowded some seven hundred gentlemen in black elbowing bustling red swiss standing like rocks ghost or partial ghost of a ministry with roderer and advisers hovering round their majesties old marshal maillet kneeling at the king's feet to say he and these gallant gentlemen are come to die for him list through the placid midnight clang of the distant storm bell so in very sooth steeple after steeple takes up the wondrous tale black courtier listen at the windows opened for air discriminate the steeple bells this is the tocsin of saint roche that again is it not saint jacques named de la boucherie yes monsieur or even saint germain l'auxerrois hear ye it not the same metal that rang storm two hundred and twenty years ago but by a majesty's order then on saint bartholomew's eve so go the steeple bells which courtier can discriminate nay meseems there is the town hall itself we know it by its sound yes friends that is the town hall discoursing so to the night miraculously by miraculous metal tongue and man's arm marat himself if you knew it is pulling at the rope there marat is pulling robespierre lies deep invisible for the next forty hours and some men have heart and some have as good as none and not even frenzy will give them any what struggling confusion as the issue slowly draws on and the doubtful hour with pain and blind struggle brings forth its certainty never to be abolished the full power delegates three from each section a hundred and forty-four in all got gathered at the town hall about midnight monda's squadron stationed there did not hinder their entering are they not the central committee of the sections who sit here usually though in greater number to-night they are there presided by confusion irresolution and the clack of tongues swift scouts fly rumour buzzes of black courtier red swiss of manda and his squadrons that shall charge better put off the insurrection yes put it off ha ah, hark st antoine booming out eloquent tocsin of its own accord friends no ye cannot put off the insurrection but must put it on and live with it or die with it swift now therefore let these actual old municipals on sight of the full powers and mandate of the sovereign elective people lay down their functions and this new hundred and forty-four take them up will ye nil ye worthy old municipals go ye must nay is it not a happiness for many a municipal that he can wash his hands of such a business and sit there paralysed unaccountable till the hour do bring forth or even go home to his night's rest two only of the old or at most three we retain mayor petion for the present walking in the tuileries procureur manuel procureur substitute danton invisible atlas of the whole 
and so with our hundred and forty-four, among whom are a toxin Huguenin, a Bilo, a Chomet, and editor Tanion, and Fabre de Glantine, sergeants, Panisse, and in brief, either emergent or else emerged and full-blown, the entire flower of unlimited patriotism. Have we not, as by magic, made a new municipality, ready to act in the unlimited manner, and declare itself roundly in a state of insurrection? First of all, then, be Commandant Mondat sent for, with that mayor's order of his. Also let the new municipals visit those squadrons that were to charge, and let the storm-bell ring its loudest. And on the whole, forward, ye hundred and forty-four, retreat is now none for you. Reader, fancy not, in thy languid way, that insurrection is easy. Insurrection is difficult, each individual uncertain even of his next neighbour, totally uncertain of his distant neighbours. What strength is with him? What strength is against him? Certain only that, in case of failure, his individual portion is the gallows. Eight hundred thousand heads, and in each of them a separate estimate of these uncertainties, a separate theorem of action conformable to that. Out of so many uncertainties does the certainty and inevitable net result, never to be abolished, go on at all moments, bodying itself forth, leading thee also towards civic crowns or an ignominious noose. Could the reader take an asmodeus flight, and waving open all roofs and privacies, look down from the tower of Notre Dame, what a Paris were it, of treble voice whimperings or vehemence, of bass voice growlings, dubitations, courage screwing itself to desperate defiance, cowardice trembling silent within barred doors, and all round dullness, calmly snoring, for much dullness, flung on its mattresses, always sleeps. Oh, between the clangour of these high-storming toxins and that snore of dullness, what a gamut! Of trepidation, excitation, desperation, and above it mere doubt, danger, atropos, and knocks. Fighters of this section draw out, hear that the next section does not, and thereupon draw in. Saint Antoine, on this side of the river, is uncertain of Saint Marceau on that. Steady only is the snore of dullness, are the six hundred Marseillese that know how to die. Monda, twice summoned to the town hall, has not come. Scouts fly incessant in distracted haste, and the many whispering voices of rumour. Terroin and unofficial patriots flit, dim visible, exploratory, far and wide, like night-birds on the wing. Of nationals, some three thousand have followed Monda and his general. The rest follow each his own theorem of the uncertainties, theorem that one should march rather with Saint Antoine, innumerable theorems that in such a case the wholesomest were sleep. And so the drums beat, in made fits, and the storm-bells peal, Saint Antoine itself does but draw out and draw in. Commandant Saint Terre over there cannot believe that the Marseillese and Saint Marceau will march. Thou laggard sonorous beer vat with a loud voice and timber head, is it time now to palter? Alsatian Westerman clutches him by the throat with drawn sabre, whereupon the timber headed believes. In this manner wanes the slow night amid fret, uncertainty, and toxin, all men's humour rising to the hysterical pitch, and nothing done. However, Monda, on the third summons, does come, come unguarded, astonished to find the municipality new. They question him straightly on that mayor's order to resist force by force, on that strategic scheme of cutting Saint Antoine in two halves. He answers what he can. They think it were right to send this strategic national commandant to the abbey prison and let a court of law decide on him. Alas, a court of law, not book law, but primeval club law. Crowds and jostles out of doors, 
all fretted to the hysterical pitch, cruel as fear, blind as the night. Such court of law and no other clutches poor Monda from his constables, beats him down, massacres him on the steps of the town hall. Look to it, ye new municipals, ye people in a state of insurrection. Blood is shed, blood must be answered for. Alas, in such hysterical humour, more blood will flow, for it is as with the tiger in that he has only to begin. Seventeen individuals have been seized in the Champs-Élysées by exploratory patriotism. They flitting dim visible, by it flitting dim visible. Ye have pistols, rapiers, ye seventeen, one of those accursed false patrols that go marauding with anti-national intent seeking what they can spy, what they can spill. The seventeen are carried to the nearest guardhouse. Eleven of them escape by back passages. How is this? Demoiselle Terroin appears at the front entrance with sabre, pistols and a train, denounces treasonous connivance, demands, seizes the remaining six, that the justice of the people be not trifled with of which six two more escape in the whirl and debate of the club law court the last unhappy four are massacred as munda was two ex-bodyguards one dissipated abbe one royalist pamphleteer Sulo, known to us by name able editor and wit of all work poor Sulo, his acts of the apostles and brisk placard journals for he was an able man come to fini in this manner and questionable jesting issues suddenly in horrid earnest such doings usher in the dawn of the tenth of august seventeen ninety two or think what a night the poor national assembly has had sitting there in great paucity attempting to debate quivering and shivering pointing towards all the thirty-two azimuths at once as the magnet needle does when thunderstorm is in the air if the insurrection come, if it come and fail? Alas, in that case, may not black courtier with blunderbusses, red Swiss with bayonets, rush over, flushed with victory, and ask us, thou undefinable, waterlogged, self-distractive, self-destructive, legislative, what dost thou here unsunk? Or figure the poor national guards bivouacking in temporary tents there, or standing ranked, shifting from leg to leg, all through the weary night, new trickler municipals ordering one thing, old Monda captains ordering another. Procureur Manuel has ordered the cannons to be withdrawn from the Pont Neuf. None ventured to disobey him. It seemed certain, then, the old staff, so long doomed, has finally been dissolved in these hours. And Monda is not our commandant now, but Santerre? Yes, friends, Santerre henceforth, surely Monda no more. The squadrons that were to charge see nothing certain, except that they are cold, hungry, worn down with watching, that it were sad to slay French brothers, sadder to be slain by them. Without the Tuileries circuit, and within it, sour uncertain humour sways these men, only the red Swiss stand steadfast. Them their officers refresh now with a slight wetting of brandy, wherein the nationals, too far gone for brandy, refuse to participate. King Louis, meanwhile, had laid him down for a little sleep. His wig, when he reappeared, had lost the powder on one side. Old Marshal Maillet and the gentleman in black rise always in spirits, as the insurrection does not rise. There goes a witty saying now, the toxin ne rend pas. The toxin, like a dry milk cow, does not yield. For the rest, could one not proclaim martial law? Not easily, for now it seems Mayor Petion is gone. On the other hand, our interim commandant, poor Monda being off to the Hôtel de Ville, complains that so many courtiers in black encumber the service are an eye-sorrow to the National Guards, to which Her Majesty answers with emphasis that they will obey all, will suffer all, that they are sure men these. 
and so the yellow lamplight dies out in the grey of morning in the king's palace over such a scene scene of jostling elbowing of confusion and indeed conclusion for the thing is about to end Rodeler and special ministers jostle in the press consult in side cabinets with one or with both majesties sister elizabeth takes the queen to the window sister see what a beautiful sunrise right over the jacobin church at that quarter how happy if the tocsin did not yield but monda returns not petion is gone much hangs wavering in the invisible balance about five o'clock there rises from the garden a kind of sound as of a shout to which had become a howl and instead of vive le roi were ending in vive la nation mon dieu ejaculates a spectral minister what is he doing down there for it is his majesty gone down with old marshal maillet to review the troops and the nearest companies of them answer so her majesty bursts into a stream of tears yet on stepping from the cabinet her eyes are dry and calm her look is even cheerful the Austrian lip and the aquiline nose, fuller than usual, gave to her countenance, says Peltier, something of majesty, which they that did not see her in these moments cannot well have an idea of. O oh, thou Teresa's daughter! King Louis enters, much blown with the fatigue, yet for the rest with his old air of indifference. Of all hopes now, surely the joyfulest were, that the toxin did not yield. End of section fifty two. Section fifty three of the French Revolution, Volume Two, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter two point six seven. The Swiss unhappy friends the tocsin does yield has yielded lo ye how with the first sun rays its ocean tide of pikes and fusils flows glittering from the far east immeasurable born of the night they march there the grim host saint antoine on this side of the river saint marceau on that the black-browed marseillaise in the van with hum and grim murmur far heard like the ocean tide as we say drawn up as if by luna and influences from the great deep of waters they roll gleaming on no king canute or louis can bid them roll back wide eddying side currents of onlookers roll hither and thither unarmed not voiceless they the steel host roll on new commandant santerre indeed has taken seat at the town hall rests there in his halfway house alsatian westerman with flashing sabre does not rest nor the sections nor the marseillaise nor demoiselle terroin but roll continually on and now where are monda's squadrons that were to charge not a squadron of them stirs or they stir in the wrong direction out of the way their officers glad that they will even do that it is to this hour uncertain whether the squadron on the Pont Neuf made the shadow of resistance, or did not make the shadow. Enough, the black-browed Marseillaise and Saint-Marceau following them do cross without let, do cross in sure hope now of Saint-Antoine and the rest, do billow on towards the Tuileries where their errand is. The Tuileries, at sound of them, rustles responsive, the red swiss look to their priming courtier in black draw their blunderbusses rapiers poniards some have even fire shovels every man his weapon of war judge if in these circumstances syndic rodeleur felt easy will the kind heavens open no middle course of refuge for a poor syndic who halts between two if indeed his majesty would consent to go over to the assembly his majesty above all her majesty cannot agree to that did her majesty answer the proposal with a 
Fi donc. Did she say even she would be nailed to the walls sooner? Apparently not. It is written also that she offered the king a pistol, saying, Now or else never was the time to show himself. Close eyewitnesses did not see it, nor do we. That saw only that she was queen-like, quiet, that she argued not, upbraided not, with the inexorable, but like Caesar in the capital, wrapped her mantle, as it beseems queens and sons of Adam to do. But thou, O Louis, of what stuff art thou at all? Is there no stroke in thee then for life and crown? The silliest hunted deer dies not so. Art thou the languidest of all mortals, or the mildest minded? Thou art the worst starred. The tide advances, Sandic, Rodeleur, and all men's straits grow straighter and straighter. Promescent clangour comes from the armed nationals in the court. Far and wide is the infinite hubbub of tongues. What counsel? And the tide is now nigh. Messengers, forerunners, speak hastily through the outer gratte, hold parley, sitting astride the walls. Sandic, Rodeleur, goes out and comes in. Cannoneers ask him, Are we to fire against the people? King's ministers ask him, Shall the king's house be forced? Sandic, Rodeleur, has a hard game to play. He speaks to the cannoneers with eloquence, with fervour, such fervour as a man can, who has to blow hot and cold in one breath. Hot and cold, O oh, Rodeleur! We for our part cannot live and die. The cannoneers, by way of answer, fling down their linstocks. Think of this answer, O King Louis and King's ministers, and take a poor Sandique's safe middle course towards the Salle de Manege. King Louis sits, his hands leant on knees, body bent forward, gazes for a space fixedly on Sandique Rodeleur, then answers, looking over his shoulder to the Queen, Marchand. They march, King Louis, Queen, Sister Elizabeth, the two royal children and governess. These with Sandic Rodeleur and officials of the department amid a double rank of national guards. The men with blunderbusses, the steady red Swiss gaze mournfully, reproachfully, but hear only these words from Sandic Rodeleur. The king is going to the assembly, make way. It has struck eight on all clocks some minutes ago. The king has left the Tuileries forever. O oh, ye staunch Swiss, ye gallant gentlemen in black, for what a cause are ye to spend and be spent? Look out from the western windows, ye may see King Louis placidly hold on his way. The poor little Prince Royal sportfully kicking the fallen leaves. Promescent multitude on the terrace of the Fuyon whirls parallel to him. One man in it, very noisy, with a long pole. Will they not obstruct the outer staircase and back entrance of the salle when it comes to that? King's guards can go no further than the bottom step there. Lo, deputation of legislators comes out. He of the long pole is stilled by oratory. Assembly's guards join themselves to King's guards and all may mount in this case of necessity. The outer staircase is free or passable. See, royalty ascends. A blue grenadier lifts the poor little Prince Royal from the press. Royalty has entered in. Royalty has vanished forever from your eyes. And ye, left standing there amid the yawning abysses and earthquake of insurrection, without course, without command, if ye perish, it must be as more than martyrs, as martyrs who are now without a cause. The black courtier disappear mostly, through such issues as they can. The poor Swiss know not how to act. One duty only is clear to them, that of standing by their post, and they will perform that. But the glittering steel tide has arrived, it beats now against the chateau barriers and eastern courts, irresistible, loud surging far and wide, breaks in, fills the court of the carousel, black-browed Marseillaise in the van. 
King Louis gone, say you, over to the assembly. Well and good. But till the assembly pronounce forfeiture of him, what boots it? Our post is in that chateau or stronghold of his. There, till then, must we continue. Think, ye staunch Swiss, whether it were good that grim murder began, and brothers blasted one another in pieces for a stone edifice. Poor Swiss, they know not how to act. From the southern windows some fling cartridges, in sign of brotherhood, on the eastern outer staircase, and within, through long stairs and corridors, they stand firm-ranked, peaceable, and yet refusing to stir. Westerman speaks to them in Alsatian German. Marseillese plead in hot Provençal speech and pantomime. Stunning hubbub pleads and threatens, infinite, around. The Swiss stand fast, peaceable and yet immovable, red granite pier in that waste-flashing sea of steel. Who can help the inevitable issue? Marseillese and all France on this side, granite Swiss on that. The pantomime grows hotter and hotter, Marseillese sabres flourishing by way of action, the Swiss brow also clouding itself, the Swiss thumb bringing its firelock to the cock, and hark, high thundering above all the din, three Marseillese cannon from the carousel, pointed by a gunner of bad aim, come rattling over the roofs. Ye Swiss, therefore, fire! The Swiss fire, by volley, by platoon, in rolling fire. Marseillese men, not a few, and a tall man that was louder than any, lie silent, smashed upon the pavement. Not a few Marseillese, after the long dusty march, have made halt here. The carousel is void, the black tide recoiling, fugitives rushing as far as Saint-Antoine before they stop. The cannoneers, without the linstock, have squatted invisible and left their cannon, which the Swiss seize. Think what a volley, reverberating doomful to the four corners of Paris and through all hearts, like the clang of Bellona's thongs. The black-browed Marseillese, rallying on the instant, have become black demons that know how to die. Nor is Brest behind hand, nor Alsatian Westernman. Demoiselle Terroin is Sybil Terroin. Vengeance, victoire ou la mort. From all patriot artillery, great and small, from Fuyon's terrace, and all terraces and places of the widespread insurrectionary sea, there rose responsive a red whirlwind. Blue nationals, ranked in the garden, cannot help their muskets going off against foreign murderers. For there is a sympathy in muskets, in heaped masses of men. Nay, are not mankind in whole like tuned strings, and a cunning infinite concordance and unity. You smite one string, and all strings will begin sounding, in soft sphere melody, in deafening screech of madness. Mounted gendarmerie gallop distracted, are fired on merely as a thing running, galloping over the Pont Royal, or one knows not whither. The brain of Paris, brain fevered in the centre of it here, has gone mad, what you call taken fire. Behold, the fire slackens not, nor does the Swiss rolling fire slacken from within. Nay, they clutched cannon, as we saw, and now from the other side they clutch three pieces more, alas, cannon without linstock. Nor will the steel and flint answer, though they try it. Had it chanced to answer, patriot onlookers have their misgivings. One strangest patriot onlooker thinks that the Swiss, had they a commander, would beat. He is a man not unqualified to judge. The name of him is Napoleon Bonaparte. And onlookers and women stand gazing, and the witty Dr. Moore of Glasgow among them, on the other side of the river. Cannon rush rumbling past them, pause on the Pont Royal, belt out their iron entrails there against the Tuileries and at every new belch the women and onlookers shout and clap hands. City of all the devils. In remote streets men are drinking breakfast coffee, following their affairs. 
with a start now and then as some dull echo reverberates a note louder and here marseillaise fall wounded but barbaro has surgeons barbaro is close by managing though underhand and under cover marseillaise fall death-struck bequeath their firelock specify in which pocket are the cartridges and die murmuring revenge me revenge thy country brest federé officers galloping in red coats are shot as swiss lo you the carousel has burst into flame paris pandemonium nay the poor city as we said is in fever fit and convulsion such crisis has lasted for the space of some half hour but what is this that with legislative insignia ventures through the hubbub and death hail from the back entrance of the manege towards the tuileries and swiss written order from his majesty to cease firing o oh, ye hapless swiss why was there no order not to begin it gladly would the swiss cease firing but who will bid mad insurrection cease firing to insurrection you cannot speak neither can it hydra-headed hear the dead and dying by the hundred lie all around are borne bleeding through the streets towards help the sight of them like a torch of the furies kindling madness patriot paris roars as the bear bereaved of her whelps on ye patriots vengeance victory or death there are men seen who rush on armed only with walking sticks terror and fury rule the hour the swiss pressed on from without paralyzed from within have ceased to shoot but not to be shot what shall they do desperate is the moment shelter or instant death yet how where one party flies out by the rue de l'echelle is destroyed utterly on entier a second by the other side throws itself into the garden hurrying across a keen fusillade rushes suppliant into the national assembly finds pity and refuge in the back benches there the third and largest darts out in column three hundred strong towards the champs elysees ah could we but reach courbevoie where other swiss are woe see in such fusillade the column soon breaks itself by diversity of opinion into distracted segments this way and that to escape in holes to die fighting from street to street the firing and murdering will not cease not yet for long the red porters of hotels are shot at be they swiss by nature or swiss only in name the very firemen who pump and labour on that smoking carousel are shot at why should the carousel not burn some swiss take refuge in private houses find that mercy too does still dwell in the heart of man the brave marseillaise are merciful late so wroth and labour to save journalist gorsa pleads hard with infuriated groups Clemence, the wine merchant, stumbles forward to the bar of the assembly, a rescued Swiss in his hand, tells passionately how he rescued him with pain and peril, how he will henceforth support him, being childless himself, and falls a swoon round the poor Swiss's neck amid plaudits. But the most are butchered and even mangled. Fifty, some say fourscore, were marched as prisoners by national guards to the hotel de ville the ferocious people bursts through on them in the place de greve massacres them to the last man o peuple envy of the universe peuple in mad gallic effervescence surely few things in the history of carnage are painfuler what ineffaceable red streak flickering so sad in the memory is that of this poor column of red swiss breaking itself in the confusion of opinions dispersing into blackness and death honour to you brave men honourable pity through long times not martyrs were ye and yet almost more he was no king of yours this louis and he forsook you 
like a king of shreds and patches. Ye were but sold to him for some poor sixpence a day. Yet would ye work for your wages, keep your plighted word. The work now was to die, and ye did it. Honour to you, O kinsman, and may the old Deutsch, Biederkeit and Tapferkeit, and valour which is worth and truth, be they Swiss, be they Saxon, fail in no age. Not bastards, true-born were these men, sons of the men of Sempach, of Myrton, who knelt but not to thee, O Burgundy. Let the traveller as he passes through Lucerne turn aside to look a little at their monumental lion, not for Torvalden's sake alone. Hewn out of living rock, the figure sits there by the still lake waters, in lullaby of distant tinkling Lons de Vache, the granite mountains dumbly keeping watch all round, and, though inanimate, speaks. End of section 53《セクション54 of The French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.68 Constitution Burst in Pieces. Thus is the 10th of August won and lost. Patriotism reckons it slain by thousand on thousand. So deadly was the Swiss fire from these windows but will finally reduce them to some twelve hundred. No child's play was it, nor is it. Till two in the afternoon the massacring, the breaking and the burning has not ended, nor the loose bedlam shut itself again. How deluges of frantic sonscolotism roared through all passages of this Tuileries, ruthless in vengeance. How the valleys were butchered, hewn down, and Dame Compon saw the Marseillaise sabre flash over her head, but the black-browed said, Va-t'en, get thee gone, and flung her from him unstruck. How in the cellars wine-bottles were broken, wine-butts were staved in and drunk, and upwards to the very garrets all windows tumbled out their precious royal furnitures, and with gold mirrors, velvet curtains, down of ripped feather beds, and dead bodies of men. The Tuileries was like no garden of the earth. All this let him who has a taste for it see amply in Mercier, in Acrid Montgaillard, or Beaulieu of the Deux Amis. A hundred and eighty bodies of Swiss lie piled there, naked, unremoved till the second day. Patriotism has torn their red coats into snips, and marches with them at the pike's point. The ghastly bare corpses lie there under the sun and under the stars, the curious of both sexes crowding to look, which let not us do. Above a hundred carts heaped with dead fare towards the cemetery of St. Madeleine, bewailed, bewept, for all had kindred, all had mothers, if not here, then there. It is one of those carnage fields, such as you read of by the name Glorious Victory, brought home in this case to one's own door. But the black-browed Marseillaise have struck down the tyrant of the chateau. He is struck down, low, and hardly to rise. What a moment for an august legislative was that, when the hereditary representative entered under such circumstances, and the grenadier, carrying the little Prince Royal out of the press, set him down on the assembly table, a moment which one had to smooth off with oratory, waiting what the next would bring. Louis said few words. He was come hither to prevent a great crime. He believed himself safer nowhere than here. President Vergniaud answered briefly, in vague oratory, as we say, about defence of constituted authorities, about dying at our post. And so King Louis sat him down, first here, then there, for a difficulty arose, the constitution not permitting us to debate while the king is present. Finally, he settles himself with his family in the loge of the logograph, in the reporter's box of a journalist, 
which is beyond the enchanted constitutional circuit, separated from it by a rail. To such lodge of the logograph, measuring some ten feet square, with a small closet at the entrance of it behind, is the king of broad France now limited. Here can he and his sit pent under the eyes of the world, or retire into their closet at intervals for the space of sixteen hours. Such quiet, peculiar moment has a legislative lived to see. But also what a moment was that other few minutes later, when the three Marseillaise cannon went off, and the Swiss rolling fire and universal thunder, like the crack of doom, began to rattle. Honourable members start to their feet, stray bullets singing epicidium, even here, shivering in with window glass and jingle. No, this is our post, let us die here. They sit, therefore, like stone legislators. But may not the lodge of the logograph be forced from behind? Tear down the railing that divides it from the enchanted constitutional circuit. Ushers tear and tug, his majesty himself aiding from within. The railing gives way. Majesty and legislative are united in place, unknown destiny hovering over both. Rattle and again rattle went the thunder, one breathless wide-eyed messenger rushing in after another. King's orders to the Swiss went out. It was a fearful thunder, but, as we know, it ended. Breathless messengers, fugitive Swiss, denunciatory patriots, trepidation, finally tripudiation. Before four o'clock much has come and gone. The new municipals have come and gone, with three flags, Liberté, Égalité, Patrie, and the clang of vivats. Vergniaud, he who as president few hours ago talked of dying for constituted authorities, has moved, as committee reporter, that the hereditary representative be suspended, that a national convention do forthwith assemble, to say what further? An able report, which the president must have had ready in his pocket. A president in such cases must have much ready, and yet not ready, and Janus-like, look before and after. King Louis listens to all, retires about midnight to three little rooms on the upper floor, till the Luxembourg be prepared for him, and the safeguard of the nation. Safer if Brunswick were once here, or alas, not so safe? Ye hapless, discrowned heads! Crowds came next morning to catch a glimpse of them in their three upper rooms. Montgaillard says the august captives wore an air of cheerfulness, even of gaiety, that the Queen and Princess Lombard, who had joined her overnight, looked out of the open window, shook powder from their hair on the people below, and laughed. He is an acrid, distorted man. For the rest, one may guess that the legislative, above all that the new municipality, continues busy. Messengers, municipal or legislative, and swift dispatches rush off to all corners of France, full of triumph, blended with indignant wail, for twelve hundred have fallen. France sends up its blended shout responsive, the 10th of August shall be as the 14th of July, only bloodier and greater. The court has conspired? Poor court, the court has been vanquished, and will have both the scath to bear and the scorn. How the statutes of kings do now all fall. Bronze Henri himself, though he wore a cockade once, jingles down from the Pont Neuf, where Patrie floats in danger. Much more does Louis XIV from the Place Vendôme jingle down, and even breaks in falling. The curious can remark, written on his horse's shoe, 12 août 1692, a century and a day. The 10th of August was Friday, the week is not done, when our old patriot ministry is recalled, what of it can be got. Strict Roland, Genevese Clavier, add heavy Monge the mathematician, once a stone-hewer, and for Minister of Justice, Danton, 
led hither, as himself says, in one of his gigantic figures, through the breach of Patriot Cannon. These, under legislative committees, must rule the wreck as they can, confusedly enough, with an old legislative waterlogged, with a new municipality so brisk. But national convention will get itself together, and then... Without delay, however, let a new jury court and criminal tribunal be set up in Paris to try the crimes and conspiracies of the Tenth. High Court of Orléans is distant, slow. The blood of the twelve hundred patriots, whatever become of other blood, shall be inquired after. Tremble, ye criminals and conspirators, the Minister of Justice is Danton. Robespierre, too, after the victory, sits in the new municipality, insurrectionary improvised municipality, which calls itself Council General of the Commune. For three days now, Louis and his family have heard the legislative debates in the lodge of the Logograph, and retired nightly to their small upper rooms. The Luxembourg, and safeguard of the nation, could not be got ready. Nay, it seems the Luxembourg has too many cellars and issues. No municipality can undertake to watch it. The compact prison of the temple, not so elegant indeed, were much safer. To the temple, therefore. On Monday, 13th day of August, 1792, in Mayor Petion's carriage, Louis and his sad, suspended household fare thither, all Paris out to look at them. As they pass through the Place Vendôme, Louis XIV's statue lies broken on the ground. Pétion is afraid the Queen's looks may be thought scornful and produce provocation. She casts down her eyes and does not look at all. The press is prodigious, but quiet. Here and there it shouts, Vive la nation! But for most part gazes in silence. French royalty vanishes within the gates of the temple, these old peaked towers, like peaked extinguisher, or bonsoir, do cover it up. From which same towers, poor Jacques Molay and his Templars were burnt out by French royalty five centuries since. Such are the turns of fate below. Foreign ambassadors, English Lord Gower, have all demanded passports, are driving indignantly towards their respective homes. So then, the Constitution is over, for ever and a day. Gone is that wonder of the universe, first by ennial Parliament, waterlogged. Waits only till the Convention come, and will then sink to endless depths. One can guess the silent rage of old constituents, Constitution builders, extinct fouillants, men who thought the Constitution would march. Lafayette rises to the altitude of the situation at the head of his army. Legislative commissioners are posting towards him and it on the northern frontier to congratulate and perorate. He orders the municipality of Sedan to arrest these commissioners and keep them strictly in ward as rebels till he say further. The Sedan municipals obey. The Sedan municipals obey, but the soldiers of the Lafayette army? The soldiers of the Lafayette army have, as all soldiers have, a kind of dim feeling that they themselves are sans culotte in buff belts, that the victory of the 10th of August is also a victory for them. They will not rise and follow Lafayette to Paris. They will rise and send him thither. On the 18th, which is but next Saturday, Lafayette, with some two or three indignant staff officers, one of whom is old constituent Alexandre de la Mette, having first put his lines in what order he could, rides swiftly over the marches towards Holland, rides, alas, swiftly into the claws of Austrians. He, long wavering, trembling on the verge of the horizon, has set in Olmut's dungeons, this history knows him no more. Adieu, thou hero of two worlds, thinnest but compact honour-worthy man. Through long rough night of captivity, through other tumults, triumphs and changes, thou wilt swing well, fast anchored to the Washington formula. 
and be the hero and perfect character were it only of one idea the sedan municipals repent and protest the soldiers shout vive la nation du murier polymetus from his camp at mould sees himself made commander-in-chief and o brunswick what sort of military execution will paris merit now forward ye well-drilled exterminatory men with your artillery wagons and camp kettles jingling forward tall chivalrous king of prussia fanfaronading emigrants and war-god broglie for some consolation to mankind which verily is not without need of some end of section fifty four end of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle